The Audio Boy Project. A decentralized anti-authoritarian based initiative focused on creating a library of audiobooks for truth seekers and free speech advocates. All content on this channel is free to download, share, and repost. Your support is much appreciated. Truth, audiobooks, for the people. Secret Societies and Subversive Movements by Nesta H. Webster Read by Graham Dunlop Edited by Darren Grimes There is in Italy a power which we seldom mention in this house. I mean the secret societies. It is useless to deny, because it is impossible to conceal, that a great part of Europe, the whole of Italy and France and a portion of Germany, to say nothing of other countries, is covered with a network of these secret societies, just as the superficies of the earth are now being covered with railroads. And what are their objects? They do not attempt to conceal them. They do not want constitutional government. They do not want ameliorated institutions. They want to change the tenure of land, to drive out the present owners of the soil, and to put an end to ecclesiastical establishments. Some of them may go further. Disraeli and the House of Commons, July 14, 1856. Preface It is a matter of some regret to me that I have been unable so far to continue the series of studies on the French Revolution, of which the Chevalier de Boufla and the French Revolution, a study in democracy, formed the first two volumes. But the state of the world at the end of the Great War seemed to demand an inquiry into the present phase of the revolutionary movement, hence my attempt to follow its course up to modern times in world revolution. And now, before returning to that first cataclysm, I have felt impelled to devote one more book to the revolution as a whole, by going this time further back into the past and attempting to trace its origins from the first century of the Christian era. For it is only by taking a general survey of the movement that it is possible to understand the causes of any particular phase of its existence. The French Revolution did not arise merely out of the conditions or ideas peculiar to the 18th century, nor the Bolshevik Revolution out of political and social conditions in Russia or the teaching of Karl Marx. Both these explosions were produced by forces which, making use of popular suffering and discontent, had long been gathering strength for an onslaught not only on Christianity but on all social and moral order. It is of immense significance to notice with what resentment this point of view is met in certain quarters. When I first began to write on revolution, a well-known London publisher said to me, Remember that if you take an anti-revolutionary line, you will have the whole literary world against you. This appeared to me extraordinary. Why should the literary world sympathize with a movement which, from the French Revolution onwards, has always been directed against literature, art, and science, and has openly proclaimed its aim to exalt the manual workers over the intelligentsia? Writers must be proscribed as the most dangerous enemies of the people, said Robespierre. His colleague Dumas said all clever men should be guillotined. The system of persecution against men of talents was organized. They cried out in the sections of Paris, Beware of that man, for he has written a book. Precisely the same policy has been followed in Russia. Under moderate socialism, in Germany the professors, not the people, are starving in garrets. Yet the whole press of our country is permeated with subversive influences, not merely in partisan works, but in manuals of history or literature for use in schools. Burke is reproached for warning us against the French Revolution and Carlyle's panegyric is applauded. And whilst every slip on the part of an anti-revolutionary writer is seized upon by the critics and held up as an example of the whole, the most glaring errors, not only of conclusions, but of facts, pass unchallenged, if they happen to be committed by a partisan of the movement. The principle laid down by Colette de Herbois still holds good. Tout est pour me pour cuisson agitants les sens de la révolution. All this was unknown to me when I first embarked on my work. 
I knew that French writers of the past had distorted facts to suit their own political views. That a conspiracy of history is still directed by certain influences in the Masonic lodges and the Sorbonne. I did not know that this conspiracy was being carried on in this country. Therefore, the publisher's warning did not daunt me. If I was wrong, either in my conclusions or facts, I was prepared to be challenged. Should not years of laborious historical research meet either with recognition or with reasoned and scholarly refutation? But although my book received a great many generous and appreciative reviews in the press, criticisms which were hostile took a form which I had never anticipated. Not a single honest attempt was made to refute either my French Revolution or World Revolution by the usual methods of controversy. Statements founded on documentary evidence were met with flat contradiction, unsupported by a shred of counter-evidence. In general, the plan adopted was not to disprove, but to discredit by means of flagrant misquotations, by attributing to me views I had never expressed, or even by means of offensive personalities. It will surely be admitted that this method of attack is unparalleled in any other sphere of literary controversy. It is interesting to notice that precisely the same line was adopted a hundred years ago with regard to Professor Robeson and the Abbe Barouel, whose works on the secret causes of the French Revolution created an immense sensation in their day. The legitimate criticisms that might have been made on their work find no place in the diatribes leveled against them. Their enemies content themselves merely with calumnies and abuse. A contemporary American writer, Seth Payson, thus describes the methods employed to discredit them. The testimony of Professor Robeson and Abby Barwell would doubtless have been considered as ample in any case which did not interest the prejudices and passions of men against them. The scurrility and odium with which they have been loaded is perfectly natural, and with the nature of their testimony would have led one to expect. Men will endeavor to invalidate that evidence which tends to unveil their dark designs, and it cannot be expected that those who believe that the end sanctifies the means will be very scrupulous as to their measures. Certainly, he was not who invented the following character and arbitrarily applied it to Dr. Robison, which might have been applied with as much propriety to any other person in Europe or America. The character here referred to is taken from the American Mercury, printed at Hartford, September 26, 1799, by E. Babcock. In this paper, on the pretended authority of Professor Ebling, we are told that Robison had lived too fast for his income and to supply deficiencies had undertaken to alter a bank bill, that he was detected and fled to France, that having been expelled the Lodge of Edinburgh, he applied in France for the second grade but was refused, that he made the same attempt in Germany and afterwards in Russia but never succeeded and from this entertained the bitterest hatred to masonry, and after wandering about Europe for two years by writing to Secretary Dundas and presenting a copy of his book, which, it was judged, would answer certain purposes of the ministry, the prosecution against him was stopped. The professor returned in triumph to his country and now lives upon a handsome pension, instead of suffering the fate of his predecessor, Dodd. Payson goes on to quote a writer in the National Intelligencer of January 1801 who styles himself a friend to truth and speaks of Professor Robeson as a man distinguished by abject dependence on a party, by the base crimes of forgery and adultery, and by frequent paroxysms of insanity. Monnier goes still further and in his pamphlet De l'influence, a tribute aux philosophie, Frank Macon, etc., Illumines, etc., inspired by the Illuminatus Bode, quotes a story that Robeson suffered from a form of insanity, which consisted in his believing that the posterior portion of his body was made of glass. In support of all this farrago of nonsense, there is, of course, no foundation of truth. Robeson was a well known savant who lived sane and respected to the end of his days. On his death, Watt wrote of him. He was a man of the clearest head and the most science of anybody I have ever known. John Playfair, in a paper read before the Royal Society of Edinburgh in 1815, whilst criticizing his proofs of a conspiracy, though at the same time admitting he himself never had access to the documents Robeson had consulted, paid the following tribute to his character and erudition. 
His range in science was most extensive. He was familiar with the whole circle of the accurate sciences. Nothing can add to the esteem which they, i.e., those who were personally acquainted with him, felt for his talents and worth or to the respect in which they now hold his memory. Nevertheless, the lies circulated against both Robeson and Baruel were not without effect. Thirteen years later, we find another American, this time a Freemason, confessing with shame and grief and indignation that he had been carried away by the flood of vituperation poured upon Beruel and Robeson during the last thirty years, that the title pages of their works were fearful to him, and that although wishing calmly and candidly to investigate the character of Freemasonry, he refused for months to open their books. Yet, when in 1827 he read them for the first time, he was astonished to find what they showed, a manifest tendency towards Freemasonry. Both Beruel and Robeson, he now realized, were learned men, candid men, lovers of their country, who had a reverence for truth and religion. They give the reasons for their opinions. They quote their authorities, naming the author and page like honest people. They both had a wish to rescue British masonry from the condemnation and fellowship of continental masonry, and appeared to be sincerely actuated by the desire of doing good by giving their labors to the public. That the author was right here in his description of Beruel's attitude to Freemasonry is shown by Beruel's own words on the subject. England, above all, is full of those upright men, excellent citizens, men of every kind and in every condition of life, who count it an honor to be Masons, and who are distinguished from other men only by ties which seem to strengthen those of benevolence and fraternal charity. It is not the fear of offending a nation amongst which I have found a refuge which prompts me to make this exception. Gratitude would prevail with me over all such terrors, and I should say, in the midst of London, England is lost. She will not escape the French Revolution if the Masonic lodges resemble those I have to unveil. I would even say more. Government and all Christianity would long ago have been lost in England if one could suppose its Freemasons to be initiated into the last mysteries of the sect. In another passage, Beruel observes that masonry in England is a society composed of good citizens in general, whose chief object is to help each other by principles of equality, which for them is nothing else but universal fraternity. And again, let us admire it, the wisdom of England, for having known how to make a real source of benefit to the state, out of those same mysteries which elsewhere conceal a profound conspiracy against the state and religion. The only criticism British Freemasons may make on this verdict is that Beruel regards Masonry as a system which originally contained an element of danger that has been eliminated in England, whilst they regard it as a system originally innocuous into which a dangerous element was inserted on the continent. Thus, according to the former conception, Freemasonry might be compared to one of the brass shell cases brought back from the battlefields of France and converted into a flower pot holder whilst according to the latter, it resembles an innocent brass flower pot holder, which has been used as a receptacle for explosives. The fact is that, as I shall endeavor to show in the course of this book, Freemasonry being a composite system, there is some justification for both these theories. In either case, it will be seen that continental masonry alone stands condemned. The plan of representing Robeson and Barrowell as the enemies of British masonry can therefore only be regarded as a method for discrediting them in the eyes of the British Freemasons, and consequently for bringing the latter over to the side of their antagonists. Exactly the same method of attack has been directed against those of us who during the last few years have attempted to warn the world of the secret forces working to destroy civilization. In my own case, even the plan of accusing me of having attacked British Masonry has been adopted without the shadow of a foundation. From the beginning, I've always differentiated between British and Grand Orient Masonry, and have numbered high British Masons amongst my friends. But what is the main charge brought against us? Like Robeson and Beruel, we are accused of raising a false alarm, of creating a bogey, or of being the victims of an obsession. Up to a point, this is comprehensible. Whilst on the continent, the importance of a secret societies is taken as a matter of course, and the libraries of foreign capitals teem with books on the question. 
People in this country really imagine that secret societies are things of the past. Articles to this effect appeared quite recently in two leading London newspapers. Whilst practically nothing of any value has been written about them in our language during the last hundred years. Hence, ideas that are commonplace on the continent here appear sensational and extravagant. The mind of the Englishman does not readily accept anything he cannot see, or even sometimes anything he can see, which is unprecedented in his experience. So that like the West American farmer, confronted for the first time by the sight of a giraffe, his impulse is to cry out angrily, I don't believe it. But whilst making all allowance for honest ignorance and incredulity, it is impossible not to recognize a certain method in the manner in which the cry of obsession or bogey is raised. For it will be noticed that people who specialize on other subjects are not described as obsessed. We did not hear, for example, that the late Professor Einstein had relativity on the brain, because he wrote and lectured exclusively on this question. Nor do we hear it suggested that Mr. Howard Carter is obsessed with the idea of Tutankhamun, and that it would be well if he were to set out for the South Pole by way of a change. Again, all those who warn the world concerning eventualities they conceive to be a danger are not accused of creating bogeys. Thus, although Lord Roberts was denounced as a scaremonger for urging the country to prepare for defense against a design openly avowed by Germany, both in speech and print, and in 1921 the Duke of Northumberland was declared the victim of a delusion for believing in the existence of a plot against the British Empire, which had been proclaimed in a thousand revolutionary harangues and pamphlets. People who, without bothering to produce a shred of documentary evidence, had sounded the alarm on the menace of French imperialism, and asserted that our former allies were engaged in building a vast fleet of aeroplanes in order to attack our coasts. They were not held to be either scaremongers or insane. On the contrary, although some of these same people were proved by events to have been completely wrong in their prognostications at the beginning of the Great War, they are still regarded as oracles and sometimes even described as thinking for half Europe. Another instance of this kind may be cited in the case of Mr. John Spargo, author of a small book entitled The Jew and American Ideals. On page 37 of this work, Mr. Spargo, in refuting the accusations brought against the Jews, observes, Belief in widespread conspiracies directed against individuals or the state is probably the commonest form assumed by the human mind when it loses its balance and its sense of proportion. Yet, on page 6, Mr. Spargo declares that when visiting this country in September and October 1920, I found in England great nationwide organizations, obviously well-financed, devoted to the sinister purpose of creating anti-Jewish feeling and sentiment. I found special articles in influential newspapers devoted to the same evil purpose. I found at least one journal, obviously well-financed, exclusively devoted to the fostering of suspicion, fear, and hatred against the Jew. And in the bookstores, I discovered a whole library of books devoted to the same end. It will be seen, then, that a belief in widespread conspiracies is not always to be regarded as a sign of loss of mental balance, even when these conspiracies remain completely invisible to the general public. For those of us who were in London during the period of Mr. Spargo's visit saw nothing of the things he describes here. Where, we ask, were these great nationwide organizations striving to create anti-Jewish sentiments? What were their names? By whom were they led? It is true, however, that there were nationwide organizations in existence here at this date instituted for the purpose of combating Bolshevism. Is anti-Bolshevism then synonymous with anti-Semitism? This is the conclusion to which one is inevitably led. For it will be noticed that anyone who attempts to expose the secret forces behind the revolutionary movement, whether he mentions Jews in this connection or even if he goes out of his way to exonerate them, will incur the hostility of the Jews and their friends and will still be described as anti-Semite. The realization of this fact has led me particularly to include the Jews in the study of secret societies. The object of the present book is therefore to carry further the inquiry I began in World Revolution by tracing the course of revolutionary ideas through secret societies from the earliest times. 
indicating the role of the Jews only where it is to be clearly detected, but not seeking to implicate them where good evidence is not forthcoming. For this reason, I shall not base assertions on merely anti-Semite works, but principally on the writings of the Jews themselves. In the same way, with regard to secret societies, I shall rely, as far as possible, on the documents and admissions of their members, on which point I have been able to collect a great deal of fresh data, entirely corroborating my former thesis. It should be understood that I do not propose to give a complete history of secret societies, but only of secret societies in their relation to the revolutionary movement. I shall therefore not attempt to describe the theories of occultism, nor to inquire into the secrets of Freemasonry, but simply to relate the history of these systems in order to show the manner in which they have been utilized for a subversive purpose. If I then fail to convince the incredulous that secret forces of revolution exist, it will not be for want of evidence. Nesta H. Webster Part 1. The Past Chapter 1. The Ancient Secret Tradition The East is the cradle of secret societies. For whatever end they may have been employed, the inspiration and methods of most of those mysterious associations which have played so important a part behind the scenes of the world's history, will be found to have emanated from the lands where the first recorded acts of the great human drama were played out. Egypt, Babylon, Syria, and Persia. On the one hand, Eastern mysticism. On the other, Oriental love of intrigue. Framed the systems later on to be transported to the West, with results so tremendous and far-reaching. In the study of secret societies, we have then a double line to follow. The course of associations enveloping themselves in secrecy for the pursuit of esoteric knowledge, and those using mystery and secrecy for an ulterior and usually a political purpose. But esotericism again presents a dual aspect. Here, as in every phase of earthly life, there is the reveres de la medelle, white and black, light and darkness, the heaven and hell of the human mind. The quest for hidden knowledge may end with initiation into divine truths or into dark and abominable cults. Who knows with what forces he may be brought in contact beyond the veil. Initiation, which leads to making use of spiritual forces, whether good or evil, is therefore capable of raising man to greater heights or of degrading him to lower depths than he could have ever reached by remaining on the purely physical plane. And when men thus unite themselves in associations, a collective force is generated, which may exercise immense influence over the world around. Hence the importance of secret societies. Let it be said once and for all, secret societies have not always been formed for evil purposes. On the contrary, many have arisen from the highest aspirations of the human mind, the desire for knowledge of eternal verities, the evil arising from such systems has usually consisted in the perversion of principles that once were pure and holy. If I do not insist further on this point, it is because a vast literature has already been devoted to the subject, so that it need only to be touched on briefly here. Now from the earliest times, groups of initiates or wise men have existed, claiming to be in possession of esoteric doctrines known as the mysteries incapable of apprehension by the vulgar, and relating to the origin and end of man, the life of the soul after death, and the nature of God or the gods. It is this exclusive attitude which constitutes the essential difference between the initiates of the ancient world and the great teachers of religion with whom modern occultists seek to confound them. For whilst religious teachers such as Buddha and Muhammad sought for divine knowledge in order that they might impart it to the world, the initiates believed that sacred mysteries should not be revealed to the profane, but should remain exclusively in their own keeping. Although the desire for initiation might spring from the highest aspiration, the gratification, whether real or imaginary, of this desire often led to spiritual arrogance and abominable tyranny, resulting in the fearful trials, the tortures, physical and mental ending even at times in death, to which the neophyte was subjected by his superiors. The Mysteries 
According to a theory current in occult and Masonic circles, certain ideas were common to all the more important mysteries, thus forming a continuous tradition handed down through succeeding groups of initiates of different ages and countries. Amongst these ideas is said to have been the conception of the unity of God. Whilst to the multitude it was deemed advisable to preach polytheism, since only in this manner could the plural aspects of the divine be apprehended by the multitude, the initiates themselves believed in the existence of one supreme being, the creator of the universe, pervading and governing all things. Le plongeon, whose object is to show an affinity between the sacred mysteries of the Mayas and of the Egyptians, Chaldeans, and Greeks, asserts that the idea of a sole and omnipotent deity who created all things seems to have been the universal belief in early ages amongst all the nations that had reached a high degree of civilization. This was the doctrine of the Egyptian priests. The same writer goes on to say that the doctrine of a supreme deity composed of three parts distinct from each other yet forming one was universally prevalent among the civilized nations of America, Asia, and the Egyptians. And that the priests and learned men of Egypt, Chaldea, India, or China kept it a profound secret and imparted it only to a few select among those initiated in the sacred mysteries. This view has been expressed by many other writers, yet lacks historical proof. That monotheism existed in Egypt before the days of Moses is, however, certain. Adolf Ehrman asserts that even in the early times, the educated class believed all the deities of the Egyptian religion to be identical, and that the priests did not shut their eyes to this doctrine, but strove to grasp the idea of the one God divided into different persons by poesy and myth. The priesthood, however, has not the courage to take the final step, to do away with those distinctions which they declared to be immaterial, and to adore the one God under the one name. It was left to Amenhotep the Fourth, later known as Iknaten, to proclaim this doctrine openly to the people. Professor Breasted has described the hymns of praise to the sun god, which Iknaten himself wrote on the walls of the Amarna tomb chapels. They show us the simplicity and beauty of the young king's faith in the sole god. He had gained the belief that one god created not only all the lower creatures, but also all races of men, both Egyptians and foreigners. Moreover, the king saw in his god a kindly father, who maintained all his creatures by his goodness. In all the progress of men which had followed through thousands of years, no one had ever before caught such a vision of the great father of all. May not the reason why Ichamnaten was later described as a heretic be that he violated the code of the priestly hierarchy by revealing this secret doctrine to the profane? Hence, too, perhaps the necessity in which the king found himself of suppressing the priesthood, which by persisting in its exclusive attitude kept what he perceived to be the truth from the minds of the people. The earliest European center of the mysteries appears to have been Greece, where the Eleusinian mysteries existed at a very early date. Pythagoras, who was born in Samos about 582 BC, spent some years in Egypt, where he was initiated into the mysteries of Isis. After his return to Greece, Pythagoras is said to have been initiated into the Eleusinian mysteries and attempted to found a secret society in Samos. But this proving unsuccessful, he journeyed on to Crotona in Italy, where he collected around him a great number of disciples and finally established his sect. This was divided into two classes of initiates. The first admitted only into the exoteric doctrines of the master, with whom they were not allowed to speak until after a period of five years probation. The second consisting of the real initiates, to whom all the mysteries of the esoteric doctrines of Pythagoras were unfolded. This course of instruction, given after the manner of the Egyptians by means of images and symbols, began with geometrical science, in which Pythagoras, during his stay in Egypt, had become an adept, and led up finally to abstruse speculations concerning the transmigration of the soul and the nature of God, who was represented under the conception of a universal mind diffused through all things. It is, however, as the precursor of secret societies formed later in the west of Europe, that the sect of Pythagoras enters into the scope of this book. Early Masonic tradition traces Freemasonry partly to Pythagoras, 
who was said to have traveled in England, and there is certainly some reason to believe that his geometrical ideas entered into the system of the operative guilds of Masons. The Jewish Kabbalah According to Fabre d'Olive, Moses, who was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, drew from the Egyptian mysteries a part of the oral tradition, which was handed down through the leaders of the Israelites. That such an oral tradition, distinct from the written word embodied in the Pentateuch, did descend from Moses, and that it was later committed to the writing in the Talmud and the Kabbalah, is the opinion of many Jewish writers. The first form of the Talmud, called the Mishnah, appeared in about the 2nd or 3rd century AD. A little later, a commentary was added under the name of the Gemara. These two works composed the Jerusalem Talmud, which was revised in the 3rd to the 5th century. This later edition was named the Babylonian Talmud and is the one now in use. The Talmud relates mainly to the affairs of everyday life, the laws of buying and selling, of making contracts, also to external religious observances, on all of which the most meticulous details are given. As a Jewish writer has expressed it, the oddest rabbinical conceits are elaborated through many volumes with the finest dialectic, and the most absurd questions are discussed with the highest efforts of intellectual power. For example, how many white hairs may a red cow have, and yet remain a red cow? What sorts of scabs require this or that purification? Whether a louse or a flea may be killed on the Sabbath, the first being allowed while the second is a deadly sin? whether the slaughter of an animal ought to be executed at the neck or the tail, whether the high priest put on his shirt or his hose first, whether the jabam, that is, the brother of a man who died childless, being required by law to marry the widow, is relieved from his obligation if he falls off a roof and sticks in the mire. But it is in the Kabbalah, a Hebrew word signifying reception, that is to say, a doctrine orally received, that the speculative and philosophical, or rather the theosophical doctrines of Israel are to be found. These are contained in two books, the Sefer Yetzirah and the Zohar. The Sefer Yetzirah, or Book of the Creation, is described by Idersheim as a monologue on the part of Abraham, in which by the contemplation of all that is around him, he ultimately arrives at the conclusion of the unity of God. But since this process is accomplished by an arrangement of the divine emanations under the name of the ten sephiroths, and in the permutation of numerals and of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, it would certainly convey no such idea, nor probably indeed any idea at all, to the mind uninitiated into Kabbalistic systems. The Sefer Yetzirah is in fact admittedly a work of extraordinary obscurity and almost certainly of extreme antiquity. Monsieur Paul Vouliod, and his exhaustive work on the Kabbalah, recently published, says that its date has been placed as early as the 6th century before Christ, and as late as the 10th century AD. But that it at any rate is older than the Talmud is shown by the fact that in the Talmud the rabbis are described as studying it for magical purposes. The Sefer Yetzirah is also said to be the work referred to in the Quran under the name of the Book of Abraham. The immense compilation known as the Sefer Hazohar, or Book of Light, is however of greater importance to the study of Kabbalistic philosophy. According to the Zohar itself, the mysteries of wisdom were imparted to Adam by God whilst he was still in the Garden of Eden, in the form of a book delivered by the angel Raziel. From Adam the book passed on to Seth, then to Enoch, to Noah, to Abraham, and later to Moses, one of its principal exponents. Other Jewish writers declare, however, that Moses received it for the first time on Mount Sinai and communicated it to the 70 elders, by whom it was handed down to David and Solomon, then to Ezra and Nehemiah, and finally to the rabbis of the early Christian era. Until this date, the Zohar had remained a purely oral tradition, but now for the first time it is said to have been written down by the disciples of Simon ben Yohai. The Talmud relates that for twelve years the rabbi Simon and his son Eliezer concealed themselves in a cavern where, sitting in the sand up to their necks, they meditated on the sacred law and were frequently visited by the prophet Elias. In this way, Jewish legend adds, 
The great book of the Zohar was composed and committed to writing by the rabbi's son, Eliezer, and his secretary, the rabbi Abba. The first date at which the Zohar is definitely known to have appeared is the end of the 13th century, when it was committed to writing by a Spanish Jew, Moses de Leon, who, according to Dr. Ginsburg, said he had discovered and reproduced the original document of Simon ben Yohai. His wife and daughter, however, declared that he had composed it all himself, which is the truth. Jewish opinion is strongly divided on this question, one body maintaining that the Zohar is the comparatively modern work of Moses de Leon, the other declaring it to be of extreme antiquity. M. Vouliod, who has collated all these views in the course of some 50 pages, shows that although the name Zohar might have originated with Moses de Leon, the ideas it embodied were far older than the 13th century. How, he asks pertinently, would it have been possible for the rabbis of the Middle Ages to have been deceived into accepting as an ancient document a work that was of completely modern origin? Obviously, the Zohar was not the composition of Moses de Leon, but a compilation made by him from various documents dating from the very early times. Moreover, as M. Villiod goes on to explain, those who deny its antiquity are the anti kabbalists headed by Gratz, whose object is to prove the Kabbalah to be at variance with Orthodox Judaism. Theodore Reinach goes so far as to declare the Kabbalah to be a subtle poison which enters into the veins of Judaism and wholly infests it. Solomon Reinach calls it one of the worst aberrations of the human mind. This view, many a student of the Kabbalah will hardly dispute, but to say that it is foreign to Judaism is another matter. The fact is that the main ideas of the Zohar find confirmation in the Talmud. As the Jewish Encyclopedia observes, the Kabbalah is not really in opposition to the Talmud, and many Talmudic Jews have supported and contributed to it. Adolf Frank does not hesitate to describe it as the heart and life of Judaism. The greater number of the most eminent rabbis of the 17th and 18th centuries believed firmly in the sacredness of the Zohar and the infallibility of its teaching. The question of the antiquity of the Kabbalah is therefore in reality largely a matter of names. That a mystical tradition existed amongst the Jews from remote antiquity will hardly be denied by anyone. It is therefore as M. Vouliod observes only a matter of knowing at what moment Jewish mysticism took the name of Kabbalah. Edersheim asserts that it is undeniable that already at the time of Jesus Christ there existed an assemblage of doctrines and speculations that were carefully concealed from the multitude. They were not even revealed to ordinary scholars for fear of leading them towards heretical ideas. This kind bore the name of Kabbalah, and as the term of Kabbalah to receive, transmit, indicates, it represented the spiritual traditions transmitted from the earliest ages, although mingled in the course of time with impure or foreign elements. Is the Kabbalah then, as Gougenot de Mousseau asserts, older than the Jewish race, a legacy handed down from the first patriarchs of the world? We must admit this hypothesis to be incapable of proof, yet it is one that has found so much favor with students of occult traditions that it cannot be ignored. The Jewish Kabbalah itself supports it by tracing its descent from the patriarchs, Adam, Noah, Enoch, and Abraham, who lived before the Jews as a separate race came into existence. Eliphas Levi accepts this genealogy and relates that the Holy Kabbalah was the tradition of the children of Seth carried out of Chaldea by Abraham, who was the inheritor of the secrets of Enoch and his father of initiation in Israel. According to this theory, which we find again propounded by the American Freemason Dr. Mackey, there was, besides the divine Kabbalah of the children of Seth, the magical Kabbalah of the children of Cain, which descended to the Sabbaths or star worshippers of Chaldea adepts in astronomy and necromancy. Sorcery, as we know, has been practiced by the Canaanites before the occupation of Palestine by the Israelites. Egypt, India, and Greece also had their soothsayers and diviners. In spite of the imprecations against sorcery contained in the Law of Moses, 
The Jews, disregarding these warnings, caught the contagion and mingled the sacred tradition they had inherited with magical ideas, partly borrowed from other races and partly of their own devising. At the same time, the speculative side of the Jewish Kabbalah borrowed from the philosophy of the Persian Magi, of the Neoplatonists, and of the Neopythagoreans. There is, then, some justification for the anti-Kabbalist contention that what we know today as the Kabbalah is not of purely Jewish origin. Gujano de Mousseau, who had made a profound study of occultism, asserts that there were therefore two Kabbalahs, the ancient sacred tradition handed down from the first patriarchs of the human race, and the evil Kabbalah, wherein this sacred tradition was mingled by the rabbis with barbaric superstitions, combined with their own imagings and henceforth marked with their seal. This view also finds expression in the remarkable work of the converted Jew Drock, who refers to the ancient and true Kabbalah, which we distinguish from the modern Kabbalah, false, condemnable, and condemned by the Holy See, the work of the rabbis who have also falsified and perverted the Talmudic tradition. The doctors of the synagogue trace it back to Moses, whilst at the same time admitting that the principal truths it contains were those known by revelation to the first patriarchs of the world. Further on, Drock quotes the statement of Sixtus of Siena, another converted Jew and a Dominican, protected by Pius V, since by the decree of the Holy Roman Inquisition all books appertaining to the Kabbalah have lately been condemned, one must know that the Kabbalah is double, that one is true, the other false. The true and pious one is that which elucidates the secret mysteries of the Holy Law according to the principle of an agogy. This Kabbalah, therefore, the Church has never condemned. The false and impious Kabbalah is certain mendacious kind of Jewish tradition, full of innumerable vanities and falsehoods differing but little from necromancy. This kind of superstition, therefore, improperly called Kabbalah, the Church, within the last few years, has deservedly condemned. The modern Jewish Kabbalah presents a dual aspect, theoretical and practical, the former concerned with theosophical speculations, the latter with magical practices. It would be impossible here to give an idea of the Kabbalistic theosophy with its extraordinary imaginings on the Sephiroths, the attributes and functions of good and bad angels, dissertations on the nature of demons, and minute details on the appearance of God under the name of the Ancient of Ancients, from whose head 400,000 words received the light. The length of this face from the top of his head is 370 times 10,000 worlds. It is called the Long Face, for such is the name of the Ancient of Ancients. The description of the hair and beard alone belonging to this gigantic countenance occupies a large place in the Zoharic treatise, Idra, Rabba. According to the Kabbalah, every letter in the scriptures contains a mystery, only to be solved by the initiated. By means of this system of interpretation, passages of the Old Testament are shown to bear meanings totally unapparent to the ordinary reader. Thus, the Zohar explains that Noah was lamed for life by the bite of a lion whilst he was in the ark. The adventures of Jonah inside the whale are related with an extraordinary wealth of imagination, whilst the beautiful story of Elisha and the Shunammite woman is travestied in the most grotesque manner. In the practical Kabbalah, this method of decoding is reduced to a theurgic or magical system in which the healing of diseases plays an important part and is affected by means of the mystical arrangement of numbers and letters, by the pronunciation of the ineffable name, by the use of amulets and talismans, or by compounds supposed to contain certain occult properties. All these ideas derived from very ancient cults even the art of working miracles by the use of the divine name, which after the appropriation of the Kabbalah by the Jews became the particular practice of Jewish miracle workers, appears to have originated in Chaldea. Nor can the insistence on the chosen people theory, which forms the basis of all Talmudic and Kabbalistic writings, be regarded as a purely Jewish origin. The ancient Egyptians likewise believed themselves to be the peculiar people specially loved by the gods. But in the hands of the Jews, this belief became a pretension to the exclusive enjoyment of divine favor. According to the Zohar, 
all Israelites will have a part in the future world, and on arrival there, will not be handed over like the Goyim, or non-Jewish races, to the hands of the angel Duma and sent down to hell. Indeed, the Goyim are even denied human attributes. Thus, the Zohar again explains that the words of the scripture, Jehovah Elohim made man, mean that he made Israel. 17th century rabbinical treatise Emek Hamelech observes, Our rabbis of blessed memory have said, Ye choose our men because of the soul ye have from the supreme man, i.e. God. But the nations of the world are not styled men because they have not, from the holy and supreme man, the neshema, or glorious soul, but they have the nepesh, soul, from Adam Belial. That is the malicious and unnecessary man called Samael, the supreme devil. In conformity with this exclusive attitude towards the rest of the human race, the messianic idea which forms the dominating theme of the Kabbalah, is made to serve purely Jewish interests. Yet, in its origin, this idea was possibly not Jewish. It is said by believers in an ancient secret tradition common to other races besides the Jews, that a part of this tradition related to a past golden age when man was free from care and evil non-existent. To the subsequent fall of man and the loss of this primitive felicity, and finally to a revelation received from heaven, foretelling the separation of this loss and the coming of the Redeemer, who should save the world and restore the Golden Age. According to Drock, the tradition of a man-god who should present himself as the teacher and liberator of the fallen human race was constantly taught amongst all the enlightened nations of the globe. Vitus e Constans Opinio, as Suetonius says, it is of all times and of all places. And Drock goes on to quote the evidence of Volney, who had traveled in the East and declared that the sacred and mythological traditions of earlier times have spread throughout all Asia, the belief in a great mediator who was to come, of a future savior, king, god, conqueror, and legislator who would bring back the golden age to earth and deliver man from the empire of evil. All that can be said with any degree of certainty with regard to this belief is that it did exist amongst the Zoroastrians of Persia, as well as amongst the Jews. The Herbalo, quoting Abu Faraj, shows that 500 years before Christ, Zertasht, the leader of the Zoroastrians, predicted the coming of the Messiah, at whose birth a star would appear. He also told his disciples that the Messiah would be born of a virgin that they would be the first to hear of him, and that they should bring him gifts. Drock believes that this tradition was taught in the ancient synagogue, thus explaining the words of St. Paul that unto the Jews were committed the oracles of God. This oral doctrine, which is the Kabbalah, had for its object the most sublime truths of the faith which it brought back incessantly to the promised Redeemer, the foundation of the whole system of the ancient tradition. Drock further asserts that the doctrine of the Trinity formed a part of this tradition. Whoever has familiarized himself with that which was taught by the ancient doctors of the synagogue, particularly those who lived before the coming of the Savior, knows that the Trinity in one God was a truth admitted amongst them from the earliest times. M. Vuliod points out that Gratz admits the existence of this idea in the Zohar. It even taught certain doctrines which appeared favorable to the Christian dogma of the Trinity. And again, it is incontestable that the Zohar makes allusions to the beliefs in the Trinity and the Incarnation. M. Vuliad adds, The idea of the Trinity must therefore play an important part in the Kabbalah, since it has been possible to infirm that the characteristic of the Zohar in its particular conception is its attachment to the principle of the Trinity. And further quotes, Edersheim as saying that a great part of the explanation given in the writings of the Kabbalists resembles in a surprising manner the highest truths of Christianity. It would appear then that the certain remnants of the ancient secret tradition lingered on in the Kabbalah. The Jewish encyclopedia, perhaps unintentionally, endorses this opinion, since in deriding the 16th century Christian Kabbalists for asserting that the Kabbalah contained traces of Christianity, it goes on to say that what appears to be Christian in the Kabbalah is only ancient esoteric doctrine. 
Here, then, we have it on the authority of modern Jewish scholars that the ancient secret tradition was in harmony with Christian teaching. But in the teaching of the later synagogue, the philosophy of the earlier sages was narrowed down to suit the exclusive system of the Jewish hierarchy. And the ancient hope of a Redeemer, who should restore man to the state of felicity, he had lost at the fall, was transformed into the idea of salvation for the Jews alone under the aegis of a triumphant and even an avenging Messiah. It is this messianic dream perpetuated in the modern Kabbalah which 1900 years ago the advent of Christ on earth came to disturb. The Coming of the Redeemer the fact that many Christian doctrines, such as the conception of a trinity, the miraculous birth, and murder of a deity, had found a place in earlier religions has frequently been used as an argument to show that the story of Christ was merely a new version of various ancient legends, those of Attis, Adonis, or of Osiris, and that consequently the Christian religion is founded on a myth. The answer to this is that the existence of Christ on earth is an historic fact which no serious authority has ever denied. The attempts of such writers as Druze and J. M. Robertson to establish the theory of the Christ myth, which finds an echo in the utterances of socialist orators, have been met with so much able criticism as to need no further refutation. Sir James Fraser, who will certainly not be accused of bigoted orthodoxy, observes in this connection the doubts which have been cast on the historical reality of Jesus are, in my judgment, unworthy of serious attention. To dissolve the founder of Christianity into a myth, as some would do, is hardly less absurd than it would be to do the same for Muhammad, Luther, and Calvin. May not the fact that certain circumstances in the life of Christ were foreshadowed by earlier religions indicate, as Eliphas Levi observes, that the ancients had an intuition of Christian mysteries? To those, therefore, who had adhered to the ancient tradition, Christ appeared as the fulfillment of a prophecy as old as the world. Thus the wise men came from afar to worship the babe of Bethlehem, and when they saw his star in the east, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. In Christ they hailed not only him who was born king of the Jews, but the savior of the whole human race. In the light of this great hope, that wondrous night in Bethlehem is seen in all its sublimity. Throughout the ages, the seers had looked for the coming of the Redeemer, and lo, he was here. But it was not to the mighty in Israel, to the high priests and the scribes, that his birth was announced, but to the humble shepherds watching their flocks by night. And these men of simple faith, hearing from the angels the good tidings of great joy, that a Savior, Christ the Lord, was born, went with haste to see the babe lying in the manger, and returned glorifying and praising God so also to the devout in Israel, to Simeon and to Anna the prophetess, the great event appeared in its universal significance. And Simeon, departing in peace, knew that his eyes had seen the salvation that was to be, a light to lighten the Gentiles, as well as the glory of the people of Israel. But to the Jews, in whose hands the ancient tradition had been turned to the exclusive advantage of the Jewish race, to the rabbis, who had, moreover, constituted themselves to the sole guardians within this nation of the said tradition, the manner of its fulfillment was necessarily abhorrent. Instead of a resplendent Messiah who should be presented by them to the people, a Savior was born amongst the people themselves and brought to Jerusalem to be presented to the Lord. A Savior, moreover, who, as time went on, imparted his divine message to the poor and humble and declared that his kingdom was not of this world. This was clearly what Mary meant when she said that God had scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts, that he had put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of the low degree. Christ was therefore doubly hateful to the Jewish hierarchy in that he attacked the privilege of the race to which they belong by throwing open the door to all mankind and the privilege of the caste to which they belonged by revealing sacred doctrines to the profane and destroying their claim to exclusive knowledge. Unless viewed from this aspect, neither the antagonism displayed by the scribes and Pharisees towards our Lord, nor the denunciations he uttered against them can be properly understood. Woe unto you lawyers! 
For ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and in them they were entering, and ye hindered. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. What did Christ mean by the key of knowledge? Clearly the sacred tradition, which as Drach explains, foreshadowed the doctrines of Christianity. It was the rabbis who perverted that tradition, and thus the guilt of these perfidious doctors consisted in their concealing from the people the traditional explanation of the sacred books, by means of which they would have been able to recognize the Messiah in the person of Jesus Christ. Many of the people, however, did recognize him. Indeed, the multitude acclaimed him, spreading their garments before him and crying, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord! Writers who have cited the choice of Barabbas in the place of Christ as an instance of misguided popular judgment overlook the fact that this choice was not spontaneous. It was the chief priests who delivered Christ from envy and who moved the people that Pilate should rather release unto them Barabbas. Then the people obediently cried out, Crucify him. So also it was the rabbis who, after hiding from the people the meaning of the sacred tradition at the moment of its fulfillment, afterwards poisoned that same stream for future generations. Abominable calumnies of Christ and Christianity occur not only in the Kabbalah, but in the earlier editions of the Talmud. In these days, says Barclay, our Lord and Savior is that one, such a one, a fool, the leper, the deceiver of Israel, etc. Efforts are made to prove that he is the son of Joseph Pandira, before his marriage with Mary. His miracles are attributed to sorcery, the secret of which he brought in a slit in his own flesh out of Egypt. He is said to have been the first stoned and then hanged on to the eve of the Passover. His disciples are called heretics and opprobrious names. They are accused of immoral practices, and the New Testament is called a sinful book. The references to these subjects manifest the most bitter aversion and hatred. One might look in vain for passages such as these in English or French translations of the Talmud for the reason that no complete translation exists in these languages. The fact is of great significance. Whilst the sacred books of every other important religion have been rendered into our own tongue and are open to everyone to study, the book that forms the foundation of modern Judaism is closed to the general public. We can read English translations of the Quran, of the Dhammapada, of the Sutta Nipata, of the Zendavesta, of the Shu King, of the laws of Manu, of the Bhagavad Gita, but we cannot read the Talmud. In the long series of sacred books of the East, the Talmud finds no place. All that is accessible to the ordinary reader consists on one hand in expurgated versions or judicious selections by Jewish and pro-Jewish compilers, and on the other hand in anti-Semitic publications on which it would be dangerous to place reliance. The principal English translation by Rodkinson is very incomplete, and the folios are nowhere indicated, so that it is impossible to look up a passage. The French translation by Jean de Pauli professes to present the entire text of the Venetian Talmud of 1520, but it does nothing of the kind. The translator in the preface, in fact, admits that he has left out sterile discussions and has throughout attempted to tone down the brutality of certain expressions which offend our ears. This, of course, affords him infinite latitude, so that all passages likely to prove displeasing to the Hebraisants, to whom his work is particularly dedicated, are discreetly expunged. Jean de Pauli's translation of the Kabbalah appears, however, to be complete, but a fair and honest rendering of the whole Talmud into English or French still remains to be made. Moreover, even the Hebrew scholar is obliged to exercise some discrimination if he desires to consult the Talmud in its original form. For, by the 16th century, when the study of Hebrew became general amongst Christians, the anti-social and anti-Christian tendencies of the Talmud attracted the attention of the censor, and in the Baal Talmud of 1581, the most obnoxious passages in the entire treatise, Abodah Zarah, were suppressed. 
In the Krakow edition of 1604 that followed, these passages were restored by the Jews, a proceeding which aroused so much indignation amongst Christian students of Hebrew that the Jews became alarmed. Accordingly, a Jewish synod assembled in Poland in 1631 ordered the offending passages to be expunged again, but according to Drock, to be replaced by circles which the rabbis were to fill in orally when giving instruction to young Jews. After that date, the Talmud was for a time carefully boulderized, so that in order to discover its original form, it is advisable to go back to the Venetian Talmud of 1520 before any omissions were made or to consult a modern edition. For now that the Jews no longer fear the Christians, these passages are all said to have been replaced and no attempt is made, as in the Middle Ages, to prove that they do not refer to the founder of Christianity. Thus, the Jewish Encyclopedia admits that Jewish legends concerning Jesus are found in the Talmud and Midrash and in the life of Jesus, Toldot Yeshu, that originated in the Middle Ages. It is the tendency of all these sources to belittle the person of Jesus by ascribing to him a legitimate birth, magic, and a shameful death. The last work mentioned, the Toldot Yeshu, or the Sefer Toldos Yeshu, described here as originating in the Middle Ages, probably belongs in reality to a much earlier period. Eliphas Levi asserts that the Sefer Toldos, to which the Jews attribute a great antiquity and which they hid from the Christians with such precautions that this book was for a long while unfindable, is quoted for the first time by Raymond Martin of the Order of the Preaching Brothers towards the end of the 13th century. This book was evidently written by a rabbi initiated into the mysteries of the Kabbalah. Whether then the Toldot Yeshu had existed for many centuries before it was first brought to light, or whether it was a collection of Jewish traditions woven into a coherent narrative by a 13th century rabbi, the ideas it contained can be traced back at least as far as the 2nd century of the Christian era. Origen, who in the middle of the 3rd century wrote his reply to the attack of Celsus on Christianity, refers to a scandalous story closely resembling the Toldot Yeshu which Celsus, who lived towards the end of the 2nd century, had quoted on the authority of a Jew. It is evident, therefore, that the legend it contains had long been current in Jewish circles, but the book itself did not come into the hands of Christians until it was translated into Latin by Raymond Martin. Later on, Luther summarized it in German under the name of Skem Hamperosh. Wegenseel in 1681 and Huldrych in 1705 published Latin translations. It is also to be found in French in Gustave's Brunei's Evangelis Apocryphes. However repugnant it is to transcribe any portion of this blasphemous work, its main outline must be given here in order to trace the subsequent course of the anti-Christian secret tradition, and which, as we shall see, it has been perpetuated up into our day. Briefly, then, the Toldot Yeshu relates with the most indecent details that Miriam, a hairdresser of Bethlehem, affianced to a young man named Yochanan, was seduced by a libertine, Joseph Panther of Pindara, and gave birth to a son whom she named Joshua or Jeshu. According to the Talmudic authors of the Sota and the Sahedrim, Jeshu was taken during his boyhood to Egypt where he was initiated into the secret doctrines of the priests, and on his return to Palestine gave himself up to the practice of magic. The Toldot Yeshu, however, goes on to say that, on reaching manhood, Yeshu learned the secret of his illegitimacy, on account of which he was driven out of the synagogue and took refuge for a time in Galilee. Now there was in the temple a stone on which was engraved the Tetragrammaton, or Shem Hamparosh, that is to say, the ineffable name of God, this stone had been found by King David when the foundations of the temple were being prepared and was deposited by him in the Holy of Holies. Jeshu, knowing this, came from Galilee and, penetrating into the Holy of Holies, read the ineffable name, which he transcribed onto a piece of parchment and concealed in an incision under his skin. By this means he was able to work miracles and to persuade the people that he was the Son of God foretold by Isaiah. With the aid of Judas, the sages of the synagogue succeeded in capturing Jeshu, 
who was then led before the great and little Sahidrim, by whom he was condemned to be stoned to death and finally hanged. Such is the story of Christ according to the Jewish Kabbalists, which should be compared not only with the Christian tradition but with that of the Muslims. It is perhaps not sufficiently known that the Quran, whilst denying the divinity of Christ and also the fact of his crucifixion, nevertheless indignantly denounces the infamous legends concerning him perpetuated by the Jews, and confirms in beautiful language the story of the Annunciation and the doctrine of the miraculous conception. Remember when the angels said, O Mary, verily hath God chosen thee and purified thee, and chosen thee above the women of the worlds. Remember when the angel said, O Mary, verily God announceth to thee the word from him. His name shall be Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, illustrious in this world and in the next, and one of those who have near access to God. The mother of Jesus is shown to have been pure and to have kept her maidenhood. It was the Jews who spoke against Mary, a grievous calumny. Jesus himself is described as strengthened with the Holy Spirit and the Jews are reproached for rejecting the Apostle of God, to whom was given the Evangel with its guidance and light confirmatory of the preceding law. Thus, during the centuries that saw the birth of Christianity, although the other non-Christian forces arrayed themselves against the new faith, it was left to the Jews to inaugurate a campaign of vilification against the person of its founder, when Muslims to this day revere as one of the great teachers of the world. The Essenes A subtler device for discrediting Christianity and undermining belief in the divine character of our Lord has been adopted by modern writers, principally Jewish, who set out to prove that he belonged to the sect of the Essenes, a community of ascetics holding all goods in common, which had existed in Palestine before the birth of Christ. Thus, the Jewish historian Gretz declares that Jesus simply appropriated to himself the essential features of Essenism, and that primitive Christianity was nothing but an offshoot of Essenism. The Christian Jew, Dr. Ginsberg, partially endorses this view in a small pamphlet containing most of the evidence that has been brought forward on the subject, and himself expresses the opinion that it will hardly be doubted that our Savior himself belonged to this holy brotherhood. So after representing Christ as a magician in the Toldot Yeshu and the Talmud, Jewish tradition seeks to explain his miraculous works as those of a mere healer, an idea that we shall find descending right through the secret societies to this day. Of course, if this were true, if the miracles of Christ were simply due to a knowledge of natural laws and his doctrines were the outcome of a sect, the whole theory of his divine power and mission falls to the ground. This is why it is essential to expose the fallacies and even the bad faith on which the attempt to identify him with the Essenes is based. Now, we have only to study the Gospels carefully in order to realize that the teachings of Christ were totally different from those peculiar to the Essenes. Christ did not live in a fraternity, but, as Dr. Ginsburg himself points out, associated with publicans and sinners. The Essenes disapproved of wine and marriage, whilst Christ sanctioned marriage by his presence at the wedding of Cana in Galilee, and there turned water into wine. A further point, the most conclusive of all, Dr. Ginsburg ignores, namely, that one of the principal traits of the Essenes, which distinguished them from the other Jewish sects of their day, was their disapproval of ointment, which they regarded as defiling, whilst Christ not only commended the woman who brought the precious jar of ointment, but reproached Simon for the omission. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. It is obvious that if Christ had been in a scene, but had departed from his usual custom on this occasion, out of deference to the woman's feelings, he would have understood why Simon had not offered him the same attention, and at any rate Simon would have excused himself on these grounds. Further, if his disciples had been a scene's, would they not have protested against this violation of their principles, instead of merely objecting that the ointment was of too costly a kind? But it is in attributing to Christ the communistic doctrines of the Essenes that Dr. Ginsburg's conclusions are the most misleading, a point of particular importance in view of the fact that it is on this false hypothesis that 
so-called Christian socialism has been built up. The Essenes, he writes, had all things in common and appointed one of the brethren as steward to manage the common bag, so the primitive Christians. It is perfectly true that, as the first reference to the Acts testifies, some of the primitive Christians after death of Christ formed themselves into a body having all things in common. But there is not the slightest evidence that Christ and his disciples followed this principle. The solitary passages in the Gospel of St. John, which are all that Dr. Ginsburg can quote in support of this contention, may have referred to an alms bag or a fund for certain expenses, not to a common pool of all monetary wealth. Still less is there any evidence that Christ advocated communism to the world in general. When the young man, having great possessions, asked what he should do to inherit eternal life, Christ told him to follow the commandments, but on the young man asking what more he could do, answered, If thou wilt be perfect, and go sell that thou hast, and give to the poor. Renunciation, but not the pooling of all wealth, was thus a counsel of perfection for the few who desired to devote their lives to God as monks and nuns have always done, and bore no relation to the communistic system of the Essenes. Dr. Ginsburg goes on to say, Essenism put all its members on the same level, forbidding the exercise of authority, of one over the other, and enjoining mutual service, so Christ. Essenism commanded its disciples to call no man master upon the earth, so Christ. As a matter of fact, Christ strongly upheld the exercise of authority, not only in the oft-quoted passage, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but in his approval of the centurion's speech. I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. Everywhere Christ commends the faithful servant and enjoins obedience to masters. If we look up at the reference to the Gospel of St. Matthew, where Dr. Ginsburg says that Christ commanded his disciples to call no man master on earth, we shall find that he has not only perverted the sense of the passage, but reversed the orders of the words. Which, following on a denunciation of the Jewish rabbis, runs thus, But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. Neither be called ye masters, for one is your master even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. The apostles were therefore never ordered to call no man master, but not to be called master themselves. Moreover, if we refer to the Greek text, we shall see that this was meant in a spiritual and not a social sense. The word for master here, given is in the first verse, i.e. teaching in the second, literally guide, and the word is servant. When masters and servants in the social sense are referred to in the Gospels, the word employed for master and for servant. Dr. Ginsburg should have been aware of this distinction and that the passage in question has therefore no bearing on his argument. As a matter of fact, it would appear that some of the apostles kept servants, since Christ commends them for exacting strict attention to duty. Which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet. And will not rather say unto him, Make ready whereth I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me till I have eaten and drunken, and afterwards thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank the servant, because he did the things that were commanded to him? I throw not. This passage would alone suffice to show that Christ and his apostles did not inhabit communities where all were equal, but followed the usual practices of the social system under which they lived, though adopting certain rules, such as taking only one garment and carrying no money when they went on journeys. Those resemblances between the teachings of the Essenes and the Sermon on the Mount, which Dr. Ginsburg indicates, refer not to the customs of a sect, but to general precepts for human conduct humility, meekness, charity, and so forth. At the same time, it is clear that if the Essenes in general conformed to some of the principles laid down by Christ, certain of their doctrines were completely at variance with those of Christ and of primitive Christians, in particular their custom of praying to the rising sun and their disbelief in the resurrection of the body. St. Paul denounces asceticism, the cardinal doctrine of the Essenes, in unmeasured terms, warning the brethren that 
In the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to the seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them, which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. This would suggest that certain Essenian ideas had crept into Christian communities, and were regarded by those who remembered Christ's true teaching as a dangerous perversion. The Essenes were therefore not Christians but a secret society, practicing four degrees of initiation and bound by terrible oaths not to divulge the sacred mysteries confided to them. And what were those mysteries but those of the Jewish secret tradition, which we now know as the Kabbalah? Dr. Ginsburg throws an important light on Essenism when, in the passage alone, he refers to the obligation of the Essenes not to divulge the secret doctrines to anyone carefully to preserve the books belonging to their sect and the names of the angels or the mysteries connected with the Tetragrammaton and the other names of God and the angels, comprised in the Theosophy as well as the Cosmogony, which also played so important a part among the Jewish mystics and the Kabbalists. The truth is clearly that the Essenes were Kabbalists, though doubtless Kabbalists of a superior kind. The cabal they possessed very possibly descended from pre-Christian times and had remained uncontaminated by the anti-Christian strain introduced into it by the rabbis after the death of Christ. The Essenes are of importance to the subject of this book, as the first of the secret societies from which a direct line of tradition can be traced up to the present day. But if in this peaceful community no actually anti-Christian influence is to be discerned, the same cannot be said of the succeeding pseudo-Christian sects, which, whilst professing Christianity, mingled with Christian doctrines the poison of the perverted Kabbalah, main source of the errors which henceforth rent the Christian church in twain. The Gnostics The first school of thought to create a schism in Christianity was the collection of sects known under the generic name of Gnosticism. In its purer forms, Gnosticism aimed at supplementing faith by knowledge of eternal verities and at giving a wider meaning to Christianity by linking it up with earlier faiths. The belief that the divinity had been manifested in the religious institutions of all nations thus led to the conception of a sort of universal religion containing the divine elements of all. Gnosticism, however, as the Jewish Encyclopedia points out, was Jewish in character long before it became Christian. M. Matter indicates Syria and Palestine as its cradle and Alexandria as the center by which it was influenced at the time of its alliance with Christianity. This influence again was predominantly Jewish. Philo and Aristobulus, the leading Jewish philosophers of Alexandria, wholly attached to this ancient religion of their fathers, both resolved to adorn it with the spoils of other systems and to open to Judaism the way to immense conquests. This method of borrowing from other races and religions, those ideas useful for their purpose, has always been the custom of the Jews. The Kabbalah, as we have seen, was made up of these heterogeneous elements, and it is here that we find the principal progenitor of Gnosticism. The Freemason Ragon gives the clue in the words, The Kabbalah is the key of the occult sciences. The Gnostics were born of the Kabbalists. For the Kabbalah was much older than the Gnostics. Modern historians who date it merely from the publication of the Zohar by Moses de Leon in the 13th century or from the school of Luria in the 16th century obscure this most important fact, which Jewish savants have always clearly recognized. The Jewish encyclopedia, whilst denying the certainty of the connection between Gnosticism and the Kabbalah, nevertheless admits that the investigations of the anti-Kabbalist greats must be resumed on a new basis, and it goes on to show that it was Alexandria of the first century or earlier, with her strange commingling of Egyptian, Chaldean, Judean, and Greek culture, which furnished soil and seeds for that mystic philosophy. But since Alexandria was at the same period the home of Gnosticism, which was formed from the same elements enumerated here, the connection between the two systems is clearly evident. M. Matter is therefore right in saying that Gnosticism was not a defection from Christianity, 
but a combination of systems into which a few Christian elements were introduced. The result of Gnosticism was thus not to Christianize the Kabbalah, but to Kabbalize Christianity by mingling its pure and simple teaching with theosophy and even magic. The Jewish Encyclopedia quotes the opinion that the central doctrine of Gnosticism, a movement closely connected with Jewish mysticism, was nothing else than the attempt to liberate the soul and unite it with God. But as this was apparently to be effected through the employment of mysteries, incantations, names of angels, etc., it will be seen how widely even this phase of Gnosticism differs from Christianity and identifies itself with the magical Kabbalah of the Jews. Indeed, the man generally recognized as the founder of Gnosticism, a Jew commonly known as Simon Magus, was not only a Kabbalist mystic, but avowedly a magician, who, with a band of Jews, included his master Dosithius and his disciple Menander and Serinthus, instituted a priesthood of the mysteries and practiced occult arts and exorcisms. It was this Simon of whom we read in the Acts of the Apostles that he bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God, and who sought to purchase the power of the laying on of hands with money. Simon indeed, crazed by his incantations and ecstasies, developed megalomania in acute form, irrigating to himself divine honors and aspiring to the adoration of the whole world. According to a contemporary legend, he eventually became sorcerer to Nero and ended his life in Rome. The prevalence of sorcery amongst the Jews during the first century of the Christian era is shown by other passages in the Acts of the Apostles. In Paphos, the false prophet, a Jew whose surname was Bar-Jesus, otherwise known as Elimas, the sorcerer, opposed the teaching of St. Paul and brought on himself the imprecation. O full of all the subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness! Wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Perversion is the keynote of all the debased forms of Gnosticism. According to Eliphas Levi, certain of the Gnostics introduced into their rites that profanation of Christian mysteries, which was to form the basis of black magic in the Middle Ages. The glorification of evil, which plays so important a part in the modern revolutionary movement, constituted the creeds of the Ophites, who worshipped the serpent because he had revolted against Jehovah, to whom they referred under the Kabbalistic term of the Demiurges. And still more of the Cainites, so-called from their cult of Cain, whom with Dathom and Abiram, the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah, and finally Judas Iscariot, they regarded as noble victims of the Demiurges. Animated by hatred of all social and moral order, the Cainites called upon the men to destroy the works of God and to commit every kind of infamy. These men were therefore not only the enemies of Christianity, but of Orthodox Judaism, since it was against the Jehovah of the Jews that their hatred was particularly directed. Another Gnostic sect, the Carpocratians, followers of Carpocrates of Alexandria and his son Epiphanes, who died from his debaucheries and was venerated as a god, likewise regarded all written laws, Christian or Mosaic, with contempt and recognized only the knowledge given to the great men of every nation, Plato and Pythagoras, Moses and Christ, which frees one from all the vulgar called religion and makes man equal to God. So in the corporations of the second century, we find already the tendency towards the deification of humanity, which forms the supreme doctrine of the secret societies of the visionary socialists of our day. The war now begins between the two contending principles, the Christian conception of man reaching up to God and the secret society conception of man as God, needing no revelation from on high and no guidance but the law of his own nature. And since that nature is in itself divine, all that springs from it is praiseworthy, and those acts usually regarded as sins are not to be condemned. By this line of reasoning, the Carpocratians arrived at much the same conclusions as modern communists with regard to the ideal social system. Thus, Epiphanes held that since nature herself reveals the principle of the community and the unity of all things, human laws, which are contrary to this law of nature, 
are so many culpable infractions of the legitimate order of things. Before these laws were imposed on humanity, everything was in common, land, goods, and women. According to certain contemporaries, the Carpocratians returned to this primitive system by instituting the community of women and indulging in every kind of licence. The further Gnostic sect of Antitax, following the same cult of human nature, taught revolt against all positive religion and laws and the necessity for gratifying the flesh. The Adamites of North Africa going a step further in the return to nature cast off all clothing at the religious services so as to represent the primitive innocence of the Garden of Eden, a precedent followed by the Adamites of Germany in the 15th century. These Gnostics, says Eliphas Levi, under the pretext of spiritualizing matter, materialized the spirit in the most revolting ways. Rebels to the hierarchic order, they wish to substitute the mystical license of sensual passions to wise Christian sobriety and obedience to laws. Enemies of the family, they wish to produce sterility by increasing debauchery. By way of systematically perverting the doctrines of the Christian faith, the Gnostics claim to possess the true versions of the Gospels, and profess belief in these to the exclusion of all others. Thus, the Ebionites had their own corrupted version of the Gospel of St. Matthew, founded upon the Gospel of the Hebrews, known earlier to the Jewish Christians. The Marcosians had their version of St. Luke, the Canaanites their own Gospel of Judas, and the Valentinians their Gospel of St. John. As we shall see later, the Gospel of St. John is the one that, throughout the war on Christianity, has been especially chosen for the purpose of perversion. Of course, this spirit of perversion was nothing new. Many centuries earlier, the prophet Isaiah had denounced it in the words, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness. But the role of the Gnostics was to reduce perversion to a system by binding men together into sects working under the guise of enlightenment, in order to obscure all recognized ideas of morality and religion. It is this which constitutes their importance in the history of secret societies. Whether the Gnostics themselves can be described as a secret society or rather as a ramification of secret societies is open to question. M. Matter, quoting a number of the 3rd century writers, shows the possibility that they had mysteries and initiations. The Church Fathers definitely asserted this to be the case. According to Tertullian, the Valentinians continued, or rather perverted, the mysteries of Eleusis, out of which they made a sanctuary of prostitution. The Valentinians are known to have divided their members into three classes, the pneumatics, the psychics, and the hylix i.e. materialists. The Basilidians also said to have possessed secret doctrines known to hardly one in a thousand of the sect. From all this, M. Matter concludes that, one, the Gnostics profess to hold by means of tradition a secret doctrine superior to that contained in the public writings of the Apostles. Two, that they did not communicate this doctrine to everyone. Three, that they communicated it by means of emblems and symbols, as the diagram of the Ophites proves. Four, that in these communications they imitated the rites and trials of the mysteries of Eleusis. This claim to the possession of a secret oral tradition, whether known under the name of Kabbalah, confirms the conception of the Gnostics as Kabbalists and shows how far they had departed from Christian teaching. For if only in this idea of one doctrine for the ignorant and another for the initiated, the Gnostics had restored the very system which Christianity had come to destroy. Manichaeism. Whilst we have seen the Gnostic sects working for more or less subversive purposes under the guise of esoteric doctrines, we find in the Manichaeans of Persia, who followed a century later, a sect embodying the same tendencies and approaching still nearer to secret society organization. Kubricus, or Kubricius, the founder of Manichaeism, was born in Babylonia about the year AD 216. Whilst still a child, he is said to have been bought as a slave by a rich widow of Tessaphon, who liberated him and on her death left him great wealth. According to another story, for the whole history of Manes rests on legends, he inherited from a rich old woman the books of a Saracen named Scythianus, 
on the wisdom of the Egyptians. Combining the doctrines these books contained with ideas borrowed from Zoroastrianism, Gnosticism, and Christianity, and also with certain additions of his own, he elaborated a philosophic system which he proceeded to teach. Cubricus then changed his name to Mani, or Manes, and proclaimed himself the Paraclete, promised by Jesus Christ. His followers were divided into two classes, the outer circle of hearers, or combatants, and the inner circle of teachers, or aesthetics, described as the elect. As evidence of their resemblance with Freemasons, it was said that the Manichaeans made use of secret signs and grips and passwords, that owing to the circumstance of their master's adoption, they called Manes the son of the widow, and themselves the children of the widow. But this is not clearly proved. One of their custom is, however, interesting in this connection. According to legend, Manes undertook to cure the son of the king of Persia, who had fallen ill. But the prince died, whereupon Manes was flayed alive by order of the king, and his corpse hanged up at the city gate. Every year after this, on Good Friday, the Manichaeans carried out a mourning ceremony known as the Bima around the catafalque of Manes, whose real sufferings they were wont to contrast with the unreal sufferings of Christ. The fundamental doctrine of Manichaeism is dualism, that is to say, the existence of two opposing principles in the world, light and darkness, good and evil, founded, however, not on the Christian conception of this idea, but on the Zoroastrian conception of Ormuzd and Araman, and so perverted and mingled with Kabbalistic superstitions that it met with as vehement denunciation by Persian priests as by Christian fathers. Thus, according to the doctrine of Manes, all matter is absolutely evil. The principle of evil is eternal. Humanity itself is of satanic origin. And the first human beings, Adam and Eve, are represented as the offspring of devils. Much the same idea may be found in the Jewish Kabbalah, where it is said that Adam, after other abominable practices, cohabited with female devils, whilst Eve consoled herself with male devils, so that whole races of demons were born into the world. Eve is also accused of cohabiting with the serpent. In the Yalkut Shimoni, it is also related that during the 130 years that Adam lived apart from Eve, he begat a generation of devils, spirits, and hobgoblins. Manichaean demonology thus paved the way for the placation of the powers of darkness practiced by the Yukites at the end of the 4th century, and later by the Polisians and Bogomils and the Luciferians. So it is in Gnosticism and Manichaeism that we find evidence of the first attempts to pervert Christianity. The very fact that all such have been condemned by the Church as heresies has tended to enlist sympathy in their favor, yet even Eliphas Levi recognizes that here the action of the Church was right, for the monstrous gnosis of Manes was a desecration not only for Christian doctrines but of pre-Christian sacred traditions. Chapter 2. The Revolt Against Islam We have followed the efforts of subversive sects hitherto directed against Christianity and Orthodox Judaism. We shall now see this attempt, reduced by gradual stages to a working system of extraordinary efficiency, organized for the purpose of undermining all moral and religious beliefs in the minds of Muslims. In the middle of the 7th century, an immense schism was created in Islam by the rival advocates of the successors to the Prophet, the Orthodox Islamites, known by the name of Sunnis, adhering to the elected Caliphs, Abu Bakr, Omar, and Othman. Whilst the party of revolt, known as the Shias, claimed the Caliphate for the descendants of Muhammad through Ali, son of Abu Talib and husband of Fatima, the Prophet's daughter. This division ended in open warfare. Ali was finally assassinated. His elder son, Hassan, was poisoned in Medina. His younger son, Hussein, fell at the Battle of Karbala, fighting against the supporters of Othman. The deaths of Hassan and Hussein are still mourned yearly by the Shias at the Muharram. The Ismailis The Shias themselves split again over the question of Ali's successors into four factions the fourth of which divided again into two further sects. Both of these retained their allegiance to the descendants of Ali, as far as Jafar as Sadiq, but whilst one party known as the Imamas, or Isna 
Asharias, i.e. the Twelvers, supported the succession through his younger son Musa to the twelfth Imam, Muhammad, son of Askiri. The Ismailis, or Seveners, adhered to Ismail, the elder son of Jafar as Sadiq. So far, however, in spite of divisions, no body of Shias have ever deviated from the fundamental doctrines of Islamism, but merely claimed that these had been handed down through a different line from that recognized by the Sunnis. The earliest Ismailis, who formed themselves into a party at about the time of the death of Muhammad, son of Ismail, i.e. circa A.D. 770, still remained believers, declaring only that the true teaching of the Prophet had descended to Muhammad, who was not dead but would return in the fullness of time, and that he was the Mahdi, whom Muslims must wait. But in about A.D. 873, an intriguer of extraordinary subtlety succeeded in capturing the movement, which, hitherto merely schismatic, now became definitely subversive, not only of Islamism, but of all religious belief. This man, Abdullah ibn Maimun, the son of a learned and free-thinking doctor in southern Persia, brought up in the doctrines of Gnostic dualism and profoundly versed in all religions, was in reality, like his father, a pure materialist. By professing adherence to the creed of Orthodox Shiism, and proclaiming a knowledge of the mystic doctrines which the Ismailis believed to have descended through Ismail to his son Muhammad, Abdullah succeeded in placing himself at the head of the Ismailis. His advocacy of Ismail was thus merely a mask, his real aim being materialism, which he now proceeded to make into a system by founding a sect known as the Batinis, with seven degrees of initiation. Dozi has given the following description of this amazing project. To link together into one body the vanquished and the conquerors, to unite in the form of a vast secret society with many degrees of initiation freethinkers, who regarded religion only as a garb for the people, and bigots of all sects. To make tools of believers in order to give power to skeptics, to induce conquerors to overturn the empires they had founded, to build up a party, numerous, compact, and disciplined which in due time would give the throne, if not to himself, at least to his descendants, such was Abdullah ibn Maimun's general aim, an extraordinary conception which he worked out with marvelous tact, incomparable skill, and a profound knowledge of the human heart. The means which he adopted were devised with diabolical cunning. It was not among the Shiites that he sought his true supporters, but among the Gebers, the Manichaeans, the pagans of Haran and the students of Greek philosophy. On the last alone could he rely. To them alone could he gradually unfold the final mystery, and reveal that imams, religions, and morality were nothing but an imposture and an absurdity. The rest of mankind, the asses, as Abdullah called them, were incapable of understanding such doctrines. But to gain his end, he by no means disdained their aid. On the contrary, he solicited it but he took care to initiate devout and lowly souls only in the first grades of the sect. His missionaries, who were inculcated with the idea that their first duty was to conceal their true sentiments and adapt themselves to the views of their auditors, appeared in many guises and spoke, as it were, in a different language to each class. They won over the ignorant vulgar by feats of legermane, which passed for miracles, or excited their curiosity by enigmatical discourse. In the presence of the devout, they assumed the mask of virtue and piety. With mystics, they were mystical, and unfolded the inner meanings of phenomena, or explained allegories and the figurative sense of the allegories themselves. By means such as these, the extraordinary result was brought about that a multitude of men of diverse beliefs were all working together for an object known only to a few of them. I quote this passage at length because it is of immense importance in throwing a light on the organization of modern secret societies. It does not matter what the end may be, whether political, social, or religious, the system remains the same, the setting in motion of a vast number of people and making them work in a cause unknown to them. That this was the method adopted by Weishaupt in organizing the Illuminati, and then it came to him from the East, will be shown later on. We shall now see how the system of the philosopher Abdullah paved the way for bloodshed by the most terrible sect the world has ever seen.
the Carmathites, the first open acts of violence resulting from the doctrines of Abdullah were carried out by the Carmathites, a new development of the Ismailis. Amongst the many days sent out by the leader, which included his son, Ahmad, and Ahmad's son, was the day Hosein, Awazi, Abdullah's envoy to Iraq and Persia, who initiated a certain Hamdan surnamed Karmath into the secrets of the sect. Karmath, who was born an intriguer and believer in nothing, became the leader of the Karmathites in Arabia, where a number of Arabs were soon enlisted in the society. With extraordinary skill, he succeeded in persuading these dupes to make over all their money to him, first by means of small contributions, later by larger sums, until at last he convinced them of the advantages of abolishing all private property and establishing the system of the community of goods and wives. This principle was enforced by the passage of the Quran. Remember the grace of God in that whilst you are enemies, he has united your hearts so that by his grace you have become brothers. De Sassi thus transcribes the methods employed as given by the historian Nawari. When Karmath had succeeded in establishing all this, and everyone had agreed to conform to it, he ordered the days to assemble all the women on a certain night, so that they should mingle promiscuously with all the men. This, he said, was perfection in the last degree of friendship and fraternal union. Often a husband led his wife and presented her himself to one of his brothers when they gave him pleasure. When he, Carmath, saw that he had become absolute master of their minds, he assured himself of their obedience and found out the degree of their intelligence and discernment. He began to lead them quite astray. He put before them arguments borrowed from the doctrines of the dualists. They fell in easily with all that he proposed, and he took away from them all religion and released them from all those duties of piety, devotion, and the fear of God that he prescribed for them in the beginning. He permitted them pillage and every sort of immoral assents, and taught them to throw off the yoke of prayer, fasting, and other precepts. He taught them that they were held by no obligations and that they could pillage the goods and shed the blood of their adversaries with impunity, that the knowledge of the master of truth to whom they had called them took the place of everything else, and that with this knowledge they need no longer fear sin or punishment. As the result of these teachings, the Karmathites rapidly became a band of brigands, pillaging and massacring all those who opposed them and spreading terror throughout all the surrounding districts. Peaceful fraternity was thus turned into a wild lust for conquest. The Carmathites succeeded in dominating a great part of Arabia and the mouth of the Euphrates, and in A.D. 1920 extended their ravages westwards. They took possession of the holy city of Mecca, in the defense of which 30,000 Muslims fell. For a whole century, says Von Hammer, the pernicious doctrines of Karmath raged with fire and sword in the very bosom of Islamism until the widespread conflagration was extinguished in blood. But in proclaiming themselves revolutionaries, the Karmathites had departed from the plan laid down by the originator of their creed. Abdullah ibn Maymun, which had consisted not in acts of open violence, but in a secret doctrine which should lead to the gradual undermining of all religious faith and the condition of mental anarchy rather than of material chaos. For violence, as always, had produced counter-violence, and it was thus that while the Karmathites were rushing to their own destruction through a series of bloody conflicts, another branch of the Ismailis were quietly reorganizing their forces, more in conformity with the original method of their founder. These were the Fatimites, so-called, from their professed belief that the doctrine of the Prophet had descended from Ali, husband of Fatima, Muhammad's daughter. Whilst less extreme than the Karmathites, or than their predecessor Abdullah ibn Maymun, the Fatimites, according to the historian Makrizi, adopted the method of instilling doubts in the minds of believers and aimed at the substitution of a natural for a revealed religion. Indeed, after the establishment of their power in Egypt, it is difficult to distinguish any appreciable degree of difference in the character of their teaching from the anarchic code of Abdullah and his more violent exponent Karmath. The Fatimites. 
The founder of the Fatimite dynasty of the Caliphs was one Ubidallah, known as the Mahdi. Accused of Jewish ancestry by his adversaries, the Abbasides, who declared, apparently without truth, that he was the son or grandson of Ahmed, son of Abdullah ibn Maimun, by a Jewess. Under the fourth Fatimite, Khalifa Egypt fell into the power of the dynasty, and before long, bi weekly assemblages of both men and women, known as societies of wisdom, were instituted in Cairo. In 1004, these acquired a greater importance by the establishment of the Dar ul Hikmat, or the House of Knowledge, by the sixth Khalifa Hakim, who was raised to a deity after his death and is worshipped to this day by the Druses. Under the direction of the Dar ul Hikmat, or Grand Lodge of Cairo, the Fatimites continued the plan of Abdullah ibn Maymun's secret society with the addition of two more degrees, making nine in all. Their method of enlisting proselytes and system of initiation, which, as Claudio Janet points out, are absolutely those which Weishaupt, the founder of the Illuminati, prescribed to the insinuating brothers, were transcribed by the 14th century historian Nawari in a description that may be briefly summarized thus. The proselytes were broadly divided into two classes, the learned and the ignorant. The die were to agree with the former, applauding his wisdom, and to impress the latter with his own knowledge by asking him perplexing questions on the Quran. Thus, in initiating him into the first degree, the die assumed an air of profundity and explained that religious doctrines were too abstruse for the ordinary mind, but must be interpreted by men who, like the deus, had a special knowledge of the science. The initiate was bound to absolute secrecy concerning the truths to be revealed to him, and obliged to pay in advance for these revelations. In order to pique his curiosity, the die would suddenly stop short in the middle of the discourse, and should the novice finally decline to pay the required sum, he was left in a state of bewilderment, which inspired him with the desire to know more. In the second degree, the initiate was persuaded that all his former teachers were wrong and that he must place his confidence solely in those imams, endowed with the authority from God. In the third, he learnt that the imams were those of the Ismailis, seven in number ending with Muhammad, son of Ismail, in contradistinction to the twelve imams of the imamis, who supported the claims of Ismail's brother Musa. In the fourth, he was told that the prophets preceded the imams descending from Ali were also seven in number, namely Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, the first Mohammed, and finally, Mohammed, son of Ismail. So far then, nothing was said to the initiate in contradiction to the broad tenets of Orthodox Islamism. But with the fifth degree, the process of undermining his religion began. He was now told to reject tradition and to disregard the precepts of Muhammad. In the sixth, he was taught that all religious observances, prayer, fasting, etc., were only emblematic, that in fact all these things were devices to keep the common herd of men in subordination. In the seventh, the doctrines of dualism, of a greater and lesser deity, were introduced and the unity of God, fundamental doctrine of Islamism, was destroyed. In the eighth, a great vagueness was expressed on the attributes of the first and greatest of these deities. And it was pointed out that real prophets were those who concerned themselves with practical matters, political institutions, and good forms of government. Finally, in the ninth, the adept was shown that all religious teaching was allegorical, and that religious precepts need only to be observed in so far as it is necessary to maintain order. But the man who understands the truth may disregard all such doctrines. Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and all the other prophets were therefore only teachers who had profited by the lessons of philosophy. All belief in revealed religion was thus destroyed. It will be seen then that in the last degrees the whole teaching of the first five was reversed and therefore shown to be a fraud. Fraud, in fact, constituted the system of the society. In the instructions to the days, every artifice is described for enlisting proselytes by misrepresentation. Jews were to be won by speaking ill of Christians, Christians by speaking ill of Jews and Muslims alike, 
Sunnis by referring with respect to the Orthodox Caliphs, Abu Bakr and Omar, and criticizing Ali and his descendants. Above all, care was to be taken not to put before proselytes doctrine that might revolt them, but to make them advance step by step. By these means, they would be ready to obey any commands. As the instructions express it, if you were to give the order to whoever it might be to take from him all that he holds most precious, above all his money, he would oppose none of your orders, and if death surprised him, he would leave you to all that he possesses in his will and make you his heir. He will think that in the whole world he cannot find a man more worthy than you. Such was the great secret society which was to form the model for the Illuminati of the 18th century, to whom the summary of von Hammer might with equal truth apply. To believe nothing and to dare all was, in two words, the sum of the system, which annihilated every principle of religion and morality, and had no other object than to execute ambitious designs with suitable ministers, who, daring all and knowing nothing, since they consider everything a cheat and nothing forbidden, all the best tools of an infernal policy, a system which, with no other aim than the gratification of an insatiable lust for domination, instead of seeking the highest of human objects, precipitates itself into the abyss and mangling itself, is buried amidst the ruins of thrones and altars, the wreck of national happiness and the universal excretion of mankind. A system which, with no other aim than the gratification of an insatiable lust for domination, instead of seeking the highest of human objects, precipitates itself into the abyss, and mangling itself, is buried amidst the ruins of thrones and altars, the wreck of national happiness and the universal execration of mankind. The Druzes The terrible Grand Lodge of Cairo before long became the center of a new and extraordinary cult. Hakim, sixth Fatimite, Khalifa, and founder of the Dar ul Hikmat, a monster of tyranny and crime whose reign can only be compared to that of Caligula or Nero, was now raised to the place of a divinity by one Ismail Darazi, a Turk who in 1016 announced in a mosque in Cairo that the Khalifa should be made an object of worship. Hakim, who believed that divine reason was incarnate in him, four years later proclaimed himself a deity and the cult was finally established by one of his viziers, the Persian mystic Hamza ibn Ali. Hakim's cruelties, however, had so outraged the people of Egypt that a year later he was murdered by a band of malcontents, led, it is said, by his sister, who afterwards concealed his body, a circumstance which gave his followers the opportunity to declare that the divinity had merely vanished in order to test the faith of believers but would reappear in time and punish apostates. This belief became the doctrine of the Druzes of Lebanon, whom Darazi had won over to the worship of Hakim. It is unnecessary to enter into the details of this strange religion, which still persists today in the range of Lebanon. Suffice it to say that although the outcome of the Ismailis, the Druzes do not appear to have embraced the materialism of Abdullah ibn Maymun but to have grafted on a primitive form of nature worship and of Sabiism, the avowed belief of the Ismailis in the dynasty of Ali and his successors, and beyond this, an abstruse, esoteric creed concerning the nature of the supreme deity. God, they declared, to be universal reason, who manifests himself by a series of avatars. Hakim was the last of the divine embodiments. And when evil and misery have increased to the predestined height, he will appear again to conquer the world and to make his religion supreme. It is, however, a secret society that the Druzes enter into the scope of this book, for their organization presents several analogies with that which we now know as Masonic. Instead of the nine degrees instituted by the Lodge of Cairo, the Druzes are divided into only three, profanes, aspirants, and wise to whom their doctrines are gradually unfolded under seal of the strictest secrecy, to ensure which signs and passwords are employed after the manner of Freemasonry. A certain degree of duplicity appears to enter into their scheme, much resembling that enjoined to the Ismaili days, when enlisting proselytes belonging to other religions. 
Thus, in talking to Mohammedans, the Druzes profess to be the followers of the Prophet. With Christians, they pretend to hold the Christians of Christianity, an attitude they defend on the score that it is unlawful to reveal the secret dogmas of their creed to a black or unbeliever. The Druzes are in the habit of holding meetings where, as in the Dar ul Hikmat, both men and women assemble and religious and political questions are discussed. The uninitiated, however, are allowed to exercise no influence on decisions, which are reached by the inner circle to which only the wise are admitted. The resemblance between this organization and that of the Grand Orient Freemasonry is clearly apparent. The Druzes also have modes of recognition which are common to Freemasonry, and M. Achille Laurent has observed, The formula or catechism of the Druzes resembles that of the Freemasons. One can learn it only from the Akals or Akels equals intelligent, a small group of higher initiates who only reveal its mysteries after having subjected one to tests and made one to take terrible oaths. I shall refer again later in this book to the affinity between Druzes and the Freemasons of the Grand Orient. The Assassins It will be seen that the Druzes, distinguishing themselves from other Ismaili sects by their worship of Hakim, yet retaining genuine religious beliefs, had not carried on the atheistical tradition of Abdullah ibn Maymun and of the Grand Lodge of Cairo. But this tradition was to find in 1090 an exponent in the Persian Hassan Sabah, a native of Khorazan, the son of Ali, a strict Shia, who, finding himself suspected of heretical ideas, ended by declaring himself a Sunni. Hassan brought up in this atmosphere of duplicity, was therefore well fitted to play the Machiavellian role of Ismaili Dai. Von Hammer regards Hassan as a mighty genius, one of the splendid triad, of which the two others were his schoolfellows, the poet Omar Khayyam and Nizam Umuk, Grand Vizier under the Seljuk Sultan, Malik Shah. Hassan, having through the protection of Nizim Umuk, secured titles and revenues and finally risen to the office at the court of the Sultan attempted to supplant his benefactor and eventually retire in disgrace, vowing vengeance against the sultan and vizier. At this juncture, he encountered several Ismailis, one of whom, a Dai named Mumin, finally converted him to the principles of the sect, and Hassan, declaring himself now to be a convinced adherent to the Fatimite caliphs, journeyed to Cairo, where he received with honor by the Dar ul Hikmat, and also by the Khalifa, Mostensir, to whom he became counselor. But his intrigues once more involving him in disgrace, he fled to Aleppo and laid the foundations of his new sect. After enlisting proselytes in Baghdad, Isban, Khuzestan, and Damagan, he succeeded in obtaining a strategy the fortress of Alamut in Persia on the Caspian Sea where he completed the plans for his great secret society, which was to become forever infamous under the name of the Hashishin, or Assassins. Under the pretense of belief in the doctrines of Islam and also of the adherence to the Ismaili line of succession from the Prophet, Hassan Saba now set out to pave his way to power, and in order to achieve this end adopted the same method as Abdullah ibn Mamun. But the terrible efficiency of Hassan's society consisted in the fact that a system of physical force was now organized in a manner undreamt of by his predecessor. As von Hammer has observed in an admirable passage, opinions are powerless so long as they only confuse the brain without arming the hand. Skepticism and free thinking, as long as they occupied only the minds of the indolent and philosophical, have caused the ruin of no throne, for which purpose religious and political fanaticism are the strongest levers in the hands of nations. It is nothing to the ambitious man what people believe, but it is everything to know how he may turn them for the execution of his projects. Thus, as in the case of the French Revolution, whose first movers, von Hammer also observes, were the tools or leaders of secret societies. It was not merely theory, but the method of enlisting numerous dupes and placing weapons in their hands that brought about the terror of the assassins six centuries before that of the spiritual descendants, the Jacobins of 1793. 
taking as his groundwork the organization of the Grand Lodge of Cairo, Hussein reduced the nine degrees to their original number of seven. But these now received a definite nomenclature and included not only real initiates but active agents. Descending downwards, the degrees of the assassins were thus as follows. First, the Grand Master, known as the Sheikh al-Jabal, or Old Man of the Mountain, owing to the fact that the order always possessed itself of castles in mountainous regions. Second, the Dale Kibir, or Grand Priors. Third, the fully initiated Dais, religious nuncios and political emissaries. Fourth, the Rafiks, or associates, in training for the higher degrees. Fifth, the Fede, or devoted who undertook to deliver the secret blow on which their superiors had decided. Six, the Lassicus, or law brothers, and lastly, the common people, who were to be simply blind instruments. If the equivalents to the words die, Rafiks, and Fade, given by von Hammer and Dr. Bussell as master masons, fellow crafts, and entered apprentices, are accepted, an interesting analogy with the degrees of Freemasonry is provided. Designs against religion were, of course, not admitted by the order. Strict uniformity to Islam was demanded from all the lower rank of uninitiated, but the adept was taught to see through the deception of faith and works. He believed in nothing and recognized that all acts or means were indifferent and the secular and alone to be considered. Thus, the final object was dominated by a few men consumed with the lust of power, under the cloak of religion and piety. And the method by which this was to be established was the wholesale assassination of those who opposed them. In order to stimulate the energy of the Fade, who were required to carry out these crimes, the superiors of the order had recourse to an ingenious system of delusion. Throughout the territory occupied by the assassins were exquisite gardens with fruit trees, bowers of roses, and sparkling streams. Here were arranged luxurious resting places with Persian carpets and soft divans around which hovered black-eyed houris, bearing wine in gold and silver drinking vessels, whilst soft music mingling with the murmuring water and the sounds of birds. The young man whom the assassins desired to train for a career of crime was introduced to the Grand Master of the Order and intoxicated with hashish, hence the name hashishin, applied to the sect, from which the word assassin is derived. Under the brief spell of unconsciousness induced by this seductive drug, the prospective Fadai was then carried into the garden, where on awakening he believed himself to be in paradise. After enjoying all its delights, he was given a fresh dose of the opiate, and once more unconscious, was transported back to the presence of the Grand Master, who assured him that he had never left his side, but had merely experienced a foretaste of the paradise that awaited him if he obeyed the orders of his chiefs. The neophyte, thus spurred on by the belief that he was carrying out the commands of the prophet, who would reward him with eternal bliss, eagerly entered into the schemes laid down for him and devoted his life to murder. Thus, by the lure of paradise, the assassins enlisted instruments for their criminal work and established a system of organized murder on a basis of religious fervor. Nothing is true and all is allowed, was the ground of their secret doctrine, which, however, being imparted to but a few, and concealed under the veil of the most austere religionism and piety, restrained the mind under the yoke of blind obedience. To the outside world, all this remained a profound mystery. Fidelity to Islam was proclaimed as the fundamental doctrine of the sect. And when the envoy of Sultan Sajjar was sent to collect information on the religious beliefs of the order, he was met with the assurance we believe in the unity of God, and consider that only as true wisdom which accords with his word and the commands of the prophet. Von Hammer answering the possible contention that, as is in the case with the Templars and the Bavarian Illuminati, these methods of deception might be declared a calumny on the order, points out that in the case of the assassins no possible doubt existed, for their secret doctrines were eventually revealed by the leaders themselves, first by Hassan II, the third successor of Hassan Saba, and later by Jalal Ud Din Hassan, who publicly anathemized the founders of the sect and ordered the burning of the books that contained their designs against religion, a proceeding which, however, appears to have been a strategic maneuver for restoring confidence in the order and enabling him to continue the work of subversion and crime. 
A veritable reign of terror was thus established throughout the East. The Rafiks and Fadeh spread themselves in troops over the whole of Asia and darkened the face of the earth. And in the annals of the assassins is found the chronological enumeration of celebrated men of all nations who have fallen the victims of the Ismailis, to the joy of their murderers and the sorrow of the world. Inevitably, this long and systematic indulgence in bloodlust recoiled on the heads of the leaders, and the assassins, like the terrorists of France, ended by turning on each other. The old man of the mountain himself was murdered by his brother-in-law and his son Mohammed. Mohammed, in his turn, whilst aiming at the life of his son, Jula ud din was anticipated by him with poison, which murder was again avenged by poison. So that from Hussain the Illuminator down to the last of his line, the Grand Masters fell by the hands of their next of kin, and poison and the dagger prepared the grave, which the order had opened for so many. Finally, in 1250, the conquering hordes of the Mongol Mangu Khan swept away the dynasty of the assassins. But although as reigning powers the assassins and Fatimites ceased to exist, the sects from which they derived have continued up to the present day, still every year at the celebration of the Muharram. The Shias beat their breasts and besprinkle themselves with blood, calling aloud on their martyred heroes Hassan and Hussein. The Druzes of the Lebanon still await the return of Hakim, and in that inscrutable east, the cradle of all the mysteries, the profoundest European adept of secret society intrigue may find himself outdistanced by past masters in the art in which he believed himself proficient. The sect of Hassan Sabah was the supreme model on which all systems of organized murder working through fanaticism, such as the Carbonari and the Irish Republic Brotherhood, were based. And the signs, the symbols, the initiations of the Grand Lodge of Cairo formed the groundwork for the great secret societies of Europe. How came this system to be transported to the West? By what channel did the ideas of these succeeding Eastern sects penetrate to the Christian world? In order to answer this question, we must turn to the history of the Crusades. Chapter 3. The Templars in the year 1118, 19 years after the First Crusade had ended with the defeat of the Muslims, the capture of Antioch and Jerusalem, and the installment of Godefroy de Bouillon as king of the latter city, a band of nine French gentlehomes, led by Hugues de Payens and Godefroy de Saint-Omer, formed themselves into an order for the protection of pilgrims to the Holy Sepulchre. Baldwin II, who at this moment succeeded to the throne of Jerusalem, presented them with a house near the site of the Temple of Solomon, hence the name of Knights Templar under which they were to become famous. In 1128, the order was sanctioned by the Council of Troyes and by the Pope, and a rule was drawn up by St. Bernard under which the Knights Templar were bound by the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. But although the Templars distinguished themselves by many deeds of valor— the regulation that they were to live solely on alms led to donations, so enormous that, abandoning their vow of poverty, they spread themselves over Europe, and by the end of the 12th century had become a rich and powerful body. The motto that the order had inscribed upon its banner, Non nobis domin sed nomini tuo da gloriam, was likewise forgotten, for their faith waxing cold, they gave themselves up to pride and ostentation. Thus, as an 18th century Masonic writer has expressed it, the war, which for the greater number of warriors of good faith proved the source of wariness, of losses and misfortunes, became for them, the Templars, only the opportunity for booty and aggrandizement. And if they distinguished themselves by a few brilliant actions, their motives soon ceased to be a matter of doubt when they were seen to enrich themselves even with the spoils of the Confederates to increase their credit by the extent of the new possessions they had acquired, to carry arrogance to the point of rivaling crowned princes in pomp and grandeur, to refuse their aid against the enemies of the faith, as the history of Saladin testifies, and finally to ally themselves with that horrible and sanguinary prince named the Old Man of the Mountain, Prince of the Assassins. The truth of the last accusation is, however, open to question. For a time, at any rate, the Templars had been at war with the Assassins. 
When, in 1152, the assassins murdered Raymond, Comte de Tripoli, the Templars entered their territory and forced them to sign a treaty, by which they were to pay a yearly tribute of 12,000 gold pieces in expatiation of the crime. Some years later, the old man of the mountain sent an ambassador to Amuri, king of Jerusalem, to tell him privately that if the Templars would forego the payment of this tribute, he and his followers would embrace the Christian faith. Amuri accepted offering at the same time to compensate the Templars. But some of the knights assassinated the ambassador before he could return to his master. When asked for reparations, the Grand Master threw the blame on an evil one-eyed knight named Gautier de Mesnil. It is evident, therefore, that the relations between the Templars and the assassins were at first far from amicable. Nevertheless, it appears probable that later on an understanding was brought about between them. Both on this charge and that of treachery towards the Christian armies, Dr. Bussell's impartial view of the question may be quoted. When, in 1149, the Emperor Conrad III failed before Damascus, the Templars were believed to have a secret understanding with the garrison of that city. In 1154, they were said to have sold for 60,000 gold pieces a prince of Egypt who had wished to become a Christian. He was taken home to suffer certain death at the hands of his fanatical family. In 1166, Amari, king of Jerusalem, hanged 12 members of the order for betraying a fortress to Neredin. And Dr. Bustle goes on to say that it cannot be disputed that they had long and important dealings with the assassins, and were therefore suspected, not unfairly, of imbibing their precepts and following their principles. By the end of the 13th century, the Templars had become suspect, not only in the eyes of the clergy, but of the general public. Amongst the common people, one of their latest apologists admits, vague rumors circulated. They talked of the covetousness and want of scruple of the knights, of their passion for aggrandizement and their rapacity. Their haughty insolence was proverbial. Drinking habits were attributed to them. The saying was already in use, to drink like a Templar. The old German word, Tempelhaus, indicated a house of ill fame. The same rumors had reached Clement V, even before his accession to the papal throne in 1305, and in this same year he summoned the Grand Master of the Order, Jacques du Molay, to return to France from the island of Cyprus, where he was assembling fresh forces to avenge the recent reverses of the Christian armies. Du Molay arrived in France with 60 other Knights Templar and 150,000 gold florins, as well as a large quantity of silver that the Order had assumed in the East. The Pope now set himself to make inquiries concerning the charges of unspeakable apostasy against God, detestable idolatry, execrable vice, and many heresies that have been secretly intimated to him. But, to quote his own words, because it did not seem likely nor credible that such men of religion who were believed often to shed their blood and frequently expose their persons to the peril of death for Christ's name, and who showed such great and many signs of devotion both in divine offices as well as in fasts, as in other devotional observances, should be so forgetful of their salvation as to do these things, we were unwilling to give ear to this kind of insinuation. The king of France, Philip le Bel, who had thereto been the friend of the Templars, now became alarmed and urged the Pope to take action against them. But before the Pope was able to find out more about the matter, the king took the law into his own hands and had all the Templars in France arrested on October 13, 1307. The following charges were then brought against them by the Inquisitor for France, before whom they were examined. One, the ceremony of initiation into their order, was accompanied by insults to the cross, the denial of Christ, and gross obscenities. Two, the adoration of an idol, which was said to be the image of the true God. 3. The omission of the words of consecration at Mass. 4. The right that the lay chiefs arrogated to themselves of giving absolution. 5. The authorization of unnatural vice. To all these infamies, a great number of the knights, including Jacques du Molay, confessed in almost precisely the same terms. At their admission into the order, they said, they had been shown the cross on which was the figure of Christ, and had been asked whether they believed in him. When they answered yes, they were told in some cases that this was wrong, because he was not God. He was a false prophet. 
Some added that they were shown an idol or a bearded head, which they were told to worship. One added that this was of such a terrible aspect that it seemed to him to be the face of some devil, called in French, un moff, and that whenever he saw it, he was so overcome with fear that he could hardly look at it without fear and trembling. All who confessed declared that they had been ordered to spit on the crucifix, and very many that they had received the injunction to commit obscenities and to practice unnatural vice. Some said that on their refusal to carry out these orders, they had been threatened with imprisonment, even perpetual imprisonment. A few said that they had actually been incarcerated. One declared that he had been terrorized, seized by the throat, and threatened with death. Since, however, a number of these confessions were made under torture, it is important to consider the evidence provided by the trial of the knights at the hands of the Pope, where this method was not employed. Now, at the time the Templars were arrested, Clement V, deeply resenting the king's interference with an order which existed entirely under papal jurisdiction, wrote in the strongest terms of remonstrance to Philip Le Bel, urging their release. And even after their trial, neither the confessions of the knights nor the angry expostulations of the king could persuade him to believe in their guilt. But as the scandal concerning the Templars was increasing, he consented to receive in private audience a certain knight of the order, a great nobility and held by the said order in no slight esteem, who testified to the abominations that took place on the reception of the brethren, the spitting on the cross and other things which were not lawful nor, humanly speaking, decent. The Pope then decided to hold an examination of 72 French knights at Postier in order to discover whether the confessions made by them before the Inquisitor of Paris could be substantiated, and at this examination, conducted without torture or pressure of any kind in the presence of the Pope himself, the witnesses declared on oath that they would tell the full and pure truth. They then made confessions which were committed to writing in their presence, and these being afterwards read aloud to them, they expressly and willingly approved them. Besides this, an examination of the Grand Master, Jacques du Molay, and the preceptors of the order was held in the presence of the three cardinals and four public notaries and many other good men. These witnesses, says the official report, having sworn with their hands on the gospel of God that they would on all the aforesaid things speak the pure and full truth, they separately, freely, and spontaneously, without any coercion and fear, deposed and confessed, among other things, the denial of Christ and spitting upon the cross when they were received into the order of the temple. And some of them deposed and confessed that under the same form, namely with denial of Christ and spitting on the cross, they had received many brothers into the order. Some of them too confessed certain other horrible and disgusting things on which we are silent. Besides this, they said and confessed that those things which are contained in the confessions and depositions of heretical depravity, which they made lately before the Inquisitor of Paris, were true. Their confessions, being again committed to writing, were approved by the witnesses, who then with bended knees and many tears asked for and obtained absolution. The Pope, however, still refused to take action against the whole order, merely because the master and brethren around him had gravely sinned, and it was decided to hold a papal commission in Paris. The first sitting took place in November 1309, when the Grand Master and 231 knights were summoned before the pontifical commissioners. This inquiry, says Michelet, was conducted slowly with much consideration and gentleness by high ecclesiastical dignitaries, an archbishop, several bishops, etc. But although a number of the knights, including the Grand Master, now retracted their admissions, some damning confessions were again forthcoming. It is impossible within the scope of this book to follow the many trials of the Templars that took place in different countries, in Italy, at Ravenna, Pisa, Bologna, and Florence, where torture was not employed and blasphemies were admitted or in Germany, where torture was employed, but no confessions were made, and a verdict was given in favor of the order. A few details concerning the trial in England may, however, be of interest. It has generally been held that torture was not applied in England, owing to the humanity of Edward II, who at first absolutely refused to listen to any accusations against the order. On December 10, 1307, he had written to the Pope in these terms, 
And because the said master or brethren, constant in the purity of the Catholic faith, have been frequently commended by us, and by all our kingdom, both in their life and morals, we are unable to believe in suspicious stories of this kind until we know with greater certainty about these things. We therefore pity from our souls the suffering and losses of the said master and brethren, which they suffer in consequence of such infamy. And we supplicate most affectionately your sanctity, if it please you, that considering with favor suited to the good character of the master and brethren, you may deem fit to meet with more indulgence the detractions, calumnies, and charges by certain envious and evil disposed persons, who endeavor to turn their good deeds into works of perverseness opposed to divine teaching, until the said charges attributed to them shall have been brought legally before you or your representatives here and more fully proved. Edward II also wrote in the same terms to the kings of Portugal, Castile, Aragon, and Sicily. But two years later, after Clement V had himself heard the confessions of the order, and a papal bull had been issued declaring the unspeakable wickedness and abominable crimes of notorious heresy, had now come to the knowledge of almost everyone, Edward II was persuaded to arrest the Templars and order their examination. According to Mr. Castle, whose interesting treatise we quote here, the king would not allow torture to be employed, with the result that the knights denied all charges. But later it is said that he allowed himself to be over-persuaded and torture appears to have been applied on one or two occasions, with the result that three knights confessed to all and were given absolution. At Southwark, however, a considerable number of brethren admitted that they had been strongly accused of the crimes of negation and spitting. They did not say they were guilty, but that they could not purge themselves, and therefore they abjured these and all other heresies. Evidence was also given against the order by outside witnesses, and the same stories of intimidation at the ceremony of reception were told. At any rate, the result of the investigation was not altogether satisfactory, and the Templars were finally suppressed in England as elsewhere by the Council of Vienne in 1312. In France, more rigorous measures were adopted, and 54 knights, who had retracted their confessions, were burnt at the stake as relapsed heretics on May 12, 1310. Four years later, on March 14, 1314, the Grand Master Jacques du Molay suffered the same fate. Now, however much we must execrate the barbarity of the sentence, as also the cruelties that had preceded it, this is no reason why we should admit the claim of the order to noble martyrdom put forward by the historians who have espoused their cause. The character of the Templars is not rehabilitated by condemning the conduct of the king and pope. Yet, this is the line of argument usually adopted by the defenders of the order. Thus, the two main contentions on which they base their defense are, firstly, that the confessions of the knights were made under torture, therefore they must be regarded as null and void, and secondly, that the whole affair was a plot concerted between the king and the pope in order to obtain possession of the Templar's riches. Let us examine these contentions in turn. In the first place, as we have seen, all confessions were not made under torture, no one, as far as I am aware, disputes Michelet's assertion that the inquiry before the Papal Commission in Paris, at which a number of knights adhered to the statements they had made to the Pope, was conducted without pressure of any kind. But further, the fact that confessions are made under torture does not necessarily invalidate them as evidence. Guy Fox also confessed under torture, yet it is never suggested that the whole story of the gunpowder plot was a myth. Torture, however much we may condemn it, has frequently proved the only method for overcoming the intimidation exercised over the mind of a conspirator, a man bound by the terrible obligations of a confederacy and fearing the vengeance of his fellow conspirators will not readily yield to persuasion, but only to force. If then some of the Templars were terrorized by torture, or even by the fear of torture, it must not be forgotten that terrorism was exercised by both sides. Few will deny that the knights were bound by oaths of secrecy, so that on one hand they were threatened with the vengeance of the order if they betrayed its secrets, and on the other faced with torture if they refused to confess. Thus they found themselves between the devil and the deep sea. It was therefore not a case of a mild and unoffending order meeting with brutal treatment at the hands of authority, but of the victims of a terrible autocracy being delivered into the hands of another autocracy. 
Moreover, do the confessions of the knights appear to be the outcome of pure imagination, such as men under the influence of torture might devise? It is certainly difficult to believe that the accounts of the ceremony of initiation, given in detail by men in different countries, all closely resembling each other, yet related in different phraseology, could be pure inventions. Had the victims been driven to invent, they would have surely contradicted each other, have cried out in their agony that all kinds of wild and fantastic rites had taken place in order to satisfy the demands of their interlocutors. But no, each appears to have described the same ceremony more or less completely, with characteristic touches that indicate the personality of the speaker, and in the main, all the stories tally. The further contention that the case against the Templars was manufactured by the king and pope, with a view to obtaining their wealth, is entirely disproved by facts. The latest French historian of medieval France, whilst expressing disbelief in the guilt of the Templars, characterizes this counter-accusation as puerile. Philip Lebel, writes M. Funk Brentano, has never been understood. From the beginning, people have not been just to him. This young prince was one of the greatest kings and the noblest characters that have appeared in history. Without carrying appreciation so far, one must nevertheless accord to M. Funk Brentano's statement of facts the attention it merits. Philip has been blamed for debasing the coin of the realm. In reality, he merely ordered it to be mixed with alloy as a necessary measure after the war with England, precisely as own coinage was debased in consequence of the recent war. This was done quite openly, and the coinage was restored at the earliest opportunity. Intensely national, his policy of attacking the Lombards, exiling the Jews, and suppressing the Templars, however regrettable the methods by which it was carried out, resulted in immense benefits to France. M. Funk Brentano has graphically described the prosperity of the whole country during the early 14th century, the increase of population, flourishing agriculture and industry. In Provence and Languedoc, one meets swine herds who have vineyards, simple cow herds who have townhouses. The attitude of Philip Le Bel towards the Templars must be viewed in this light ruthless suppression of any body of people who interfered with the prosperity of France. His action was not that of arbitrary authority. He proceeded, says M. Funk Brentano, by means of an appeal to the people. In his name, Nogaret, the Chancellor, spoke to the Parisians in the Garden of the Palace, October 13, 1307. Popular assemblies were convoked all over France. The Parliament of Tours, with hardly a dissentient vote, declared the Templars worthy of death. The University of Paris gave the weight of their judgment as to the fullness and authenticity of the confessions. Even assuming that these bodies were actuated by the same servility as that which had been attributed to the Pope, how are we to explain the fact that the trial of the order aroused no opposition among the far from docile people of Paris? If the Templars had indeed, as they professed, been leading noble and upright lives, devoting themselves to the care of the poor, one might surely expect their arrest to be followed by popular risings. But there appears to have been no sign of this. As to the Pope, we have already seen that from the outset he shown himself extremely reluctant to condemn the order, and no satisfactory explanation is given of his change of attitude except that he wished to please the king. As far as his own interests were concerned, it is obvious that he could have nothing to gain by publishing to the world a scandal that must inevitably bring opprobrium to the church. His lamentations to this effect in the famous bull clearly show that he recognized this danger and therefore desired at all costs to clear the accused knights, if evidence could be obtained in their favor. It was only when the Templars made damning admissions in his presence that he was obliged to abandon their defense. Yet, we are told that he did this out of base compliance with the wishes of Philip Le Bel. Philip Le Bel is thus represented as the arch-villain of the whole piece. Through seven long years, hounding down a blameless order, from whom up to the very moment of their arrest he had repeatedly received loans of money, solely with the object of appropriating their wealth, yet, after all, we find the property of the Templars was not appropriated by the king, but was given by him to the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem. What was the fate of the Templars' goods? Philip Le Bel decided that they should be handed over to the hospitaliers. Clement V states that the orders given by the king on this subject were executed. 
Even the domain of the Templar in Paris, up to the eve of the Revolution, was the property of the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem. The royal treasury kept for itself certain sums for the cost of the trial. These had been immense. These facts in no way daunt the antagonists of Philip, who we are now assured, again without any proof whatever, was overruled by the Pope in this matter. But setting all morality aside as a mere question of policy, it is likely that the king would have deprived himself of this most valuable financial supporters, and gone to the immense trouble of bringing them to trial without first assuring himself that he would benefit by the affair. Would he, in other words, have killed the goose that laid the golden eggs without any guarantee that the body of the goose would remain in his possession? Again, if, as we are told, the Pope suppressed the order so as to please the king, why should he have thwarted him over the whole purpose the king had in view? Might we not expect indignant remonstrances from Philip, and thus been balked of the booty he had toiled so long to gain? But on the contrary, we find him completely in agreement with the Pope on this subject. In November 1309, Clement V distinctly stated that Philippe the Illustrious, King of France, to whom the facts concerning the Templars had been told, was not prompted by avarice, since he desired to keep or appropriate for himself no part of the property of the Templars, but liberally and devotedly left them to us and the Church to be administered, etc. Thus the whole theory concerning the object for which the Templars were suppressed falls to the ground, a theory which on examination is seen to be built up entirely on the plan of imputing motives without any justification in facts. The king acted from cupidity, the pope from servility, and the Templars confessed from fear of torture. On these pure hypotheses, defenders of the order base their arguments. The truth is, far more probably, that if the king had any additional reason for suppressing the Templars, it was not the envy of their wealth, but fear of the immense power their wealth conferred. The order dared even to defy the king and to refuse to pay taxes. The temple, in fact, constituted an imperium imperio that threatened not only the royal authority but the whole social system. An important light is thrown on the situation by M. Funk Brentano in this message. As the Templars had houses in all countries, they practiced the financial operations of the international banks of our times. They were acquainted with letters of change, orders payable at sight, they instituted dividends and annuities, undeposited capital, advanced funds lent on credit, controlled private accounts, undertook to raise taxes for the lay and ecclesiastical seniors. Through their proficiency in these matters, acquired very possibly from the Jews of Alexandria, whom they must have met in the East, the Templars had become the international financiers and international capitalists of their day. Had they not been suppressed, all the evils now denounced by socialists as peculiar to the system they describe as capitalism, trusts, monopolies, and corners, would in all probability have been inaugurated during the course of the 14th century, in a far worse form than at the present day, since no legislation existed to protect the community at large. The feudal system, as Marx and Engels perceived, was the principal obstacle to exploitation by a financial autocracy. Moreover, it is by no means improbable that this order of things would have been brought about by the violent overthrow of the French monarchy, indeed of all monarchies. The Templars, those terrible conspirators, says Eliphas Levi, threatened the whole world with an immense revolution. Here perhaps we find the reason why this band of dissolute and rapacious nobles had enlisted the passionate sympathy of democratic writers. For it will be noticed that these same writers who attribute the king's condemnation of the order to envy of their wealth never apply this argument to the demagogues of the 18th century and suggest that their accusations against the nobles of France were inspired by cupidity. Nor would they ever admit that any such motive may enter into the diatribes against private owners of wealth today. The Templars thus remain the only body of capitalists, with the exception of the Jews, to be not only pardoned for their riches, but exalted as noble victims of prejudice and envy. Is it merely because the Templars were the enemies of monarchy? Or is it that the world revolution, whilst attacking private owners of property, has never been opposed to international finance, particularly when combined with anti-Christian tendencies? 
It is the continued defense of the Templars, which, to the present writer, appears the most convincing evidence against them. For even if one believes them innocent of the crimes laid to their charge, how is it possible to admire them in their later stages? The fact that cannot be denied is that they were false to their obligations, that they took the vow of poverty and then grew not only rich but arrogant, that they took the vow of chastity and became notoriously immoral. Are all these things then condoned because the Templars formed a link in the chain of world revolution? At this distance of time, the guilt or innocence of the Templars will probably never be conclusively established either way. On the mass of conflicting evidence bequeathed to us by history, no one can pronounce a final judgment. Without attempting to dogmatize on the question, I would suggest that the real truth may be that the Knights were both innocent and guilty. That is to say, that a certain number were initiated into the secret doctrine of the order, whilst the majority remained throughout in ignorance. Thus, according to the evidence of Stephen de Stapelbruch, an English knight, there were two modes of reception, one lawful and good, and the other contrary to the faith. This would account for the fact that some of the accused declined to confess even under the greatest pressure. These may really have known nothing of the real doctrines of the order which were confided orally only to those whom the superiors regarded as unlikely to be revolted by them. Such have always been the methods of secret societies from the Ismailis onward. This theory of a double doctrine is put forward by Louis Lur, who observes, If we consult the statutes of the Order of the Temple, as they have come down to us, we shall certainly discover there is nothing that justifies the strange and abominable practices revealed at the inquiry. But besides the public rule, had not the order another one, whether traditional or written, authorizing or even prescribing these practices, a secret rule revealed only to the initiates? Eliphas Levi also exonerates the majority of the Templars from complicity in either anti-monarchical or anti-religious designs. These tendencies were enveloped in profound mystery, and the order made an outward profession of the most perfect orthodoxy. The chiefs alone knew whither they were going. The rest followed unsuspectingly. What, then, was the Templar heresy? On this point, we find a variety of opinions. According to Wilk, Rank, and Weber, it was the Unitarian deism of Islam. Le Coutal de Cantelou thinks, however, it was derived from heretical Islamic sources and relates that whilst in Palestine, one of the knights, Guliam de Montbard, was initiated by the old man of the mountain in a cave of Mount Lebanon. That a certain resemblance existed between the Templars and the assassins has been indicated by von Hammer and further emphasized by the Freemason Clavel. Oriental historians show us, at different periods, the order of the Templars maintaining intimate relations with that of the assassins, and they insist on the infinity that existed between the two associations. They remark that they had adopted the same colors, white and red that they had the same organization, the same hierarchy of degrees, those of Fadavi, Rifik, and Dai, and one corresponding to those of the novice, professed, and knight in the other, that both conspired for the ruin of the religions they professed in public, and that finally both possessed numerous castles, the former in Asia, the latter in Europe. But in spite of these outward resemblances, it does not appear from the confessions of the knights that the secret doctrine of the Templars was that of the assassins or of any Ismaili sect by which, in accordance with Orthodox Islamism, Jesus was openly held up as a prophet, although secretly, indifference to all religion was inculcated. The Templars, as far as can be discovered, were anti-Christian deists. Lois Ler considers that their ideas were derived from Gnostic or Manichaean dualists, Gathari, Paulicians, or more particularly Bogomils, of which a brief account must be given here. The Paulicians, who flourished about the 7th century AD, bore a resemblance to the Cainites and Ophites in their detestation of the Demiurgists and in the corruption of their morals. Later, in the 9th century, the Bogomils, whose name signifies in Slavonic, friends of God, and who had migrated from northern Syria and Mesopotamia to the Balkan Peninsula, particularly Thrace, appeared as a further development of Manichaean dualism. Their doctrine may be summarized thus. God, the Supreme Father, has two sons, the elder Satanael, the younger Jesus. 
to Satanael, who sat on the right hand of God, belonged the right of governing the celestial world. But filled with pride, he rebelled against his father and fell from heaven. Then, aided by the companions of his fall, he created the visible world, image of the celestial, having like the other, its sun, moon, and stars. And last, he created man and the serpent, which became his minister. Later, Christ came to earth in order to show men the way to heaven. But his death was ineffectual, for even by descending into hell, he could not wrest the power from Satanael, i.e. Satan. This belief in the impotence of Christ and the necessity, therefore, for placating Satan, not only the prince of this world, but its creator, led to the further doctrine that Satan, being all-powerful, should be adored. Nesitas Coniatis, a Byzantine historian of the 12th century, described the followers of this cult as Satanists, because considering Satan powerful, they worshipped him, lest he might do them harm. Subsequently, they were known as Luciferians, their doctrine, as stated by Nus and Vito Duranus, being that Lucifer was unjustly driven out of heaven, that one day he will ascend there again and be restored to his former glory and power in the celestial world. The Bogomils and Luciferians were thus closely akin, but whilst the former divided their worship between God and his two sons, the latter worshipped Lucifer only, regarding the material world as his work and holding that by indulging the flesh, they were propitiating their demon creator. It was said that a black cat, the symbol of Satan, figured in their ceremonies as an object of worship. Also that at their horrible nocturnal orgies, sacrifices of children were made and their blood used for making the Eucharistic bread of the sect. Thus the Templars recognized at the same time a good god, incommunicable to man and consequently without symbolic representation, and a bad god, to whom they give the features of an idol of fearful aspect. Their most fervent worship was addressed to this god of evil, who alone could enrich them. They said with the Luciferians, the elder son of God, Satanael, or Lucifer, alone has a right to the homage of mortals. Jesus, his younger brother, does not deserve this honor. Although we shall not find these ideas so clearly defined in the Confessions of the Knights, some color is lent to this theory by those who related that the reason given to them for not believing in Christ was that he knew nothing, he was a false prophet and of no value, and that they should believe in the higher God of heaven who could save them. According to Lois Leur, the idol they were taught to worship, the bearded head known to history as Baphomet, represented the inferior god, organizer and dominator of the material world, author of good and evil here below, him by whom evil was introduced into creation. The etymology of the word Baphomet is difficult to discover. Renard says it originated with two witnesses heard at Carcassonne, who spoke of figura Baphometi and suggest that it was a corruption of Muhammad, whom the inquisitors wished to make the knights confess they were taught to adore. But this surmise with regard to the intentions of the inquisitors seems highly improbable, since they must have been well aware that, as Wilkie points out, the Muslims forbid all idols. For this reason, Wilkie concludes that the Mohammedanism of the Templars was combined with Kabbalism, and that their idol was in reality the Macroposophus, or head of the Ancient of Ancients represented as an old man with a long beard, or sometimes as three heads in one, which has already been referred to under the name of the long face in the first chapter of this book, a theory which would agree with Eliphas Levi's assertion that the Templars were initiated into the mysterious doctrines of the Kabbalah. But Levi goes on to define this teaching under the name of Johannism. It is here that we reach a further theory with regard to the secret doctrine of the Templars, the most important of all, since it emanates from Masonic and Neo-Templar sources, thus effectually disposing of the contention that the charge brought about against the order of apostasy from the Catholic faith is solely the invention of Catholic writers. In 1842, the Freemason Ragon related that the Templars learnt from the initiates of the East, a certain Judaic doctrine which was attributed to St. John the Apostle. Therefore, they renounced the religion of St. Peter and become Johannites. Eliphas Levi expresses the same opinion. Now, these statements are apparently founded on a legend which was first published early in the 19th century, when an association calling itself Ordu du Temple and claiming direct descent from the original Templar order published two works, 
the Manual de Chevalier de l'Ordre du Temple in 1811, and the Levitican in 1831, together with a version of the Gospel of St. John differing from the Vulgate. These books, which appear to have been printed only for private circulation amongst the members and are now extremely rare, relate that the Order of the Temple had never ceased to exist since the days of Jacques de Molay, who appointed Jacques de l'Arminier his successor in the office. And from that time onwards, a line of grand masters had succeeded each other without a breakup to the end of the 18th century, when it ceased for a brief period but was reinstituted under a grand master, Fabra Palaprat, in 1804. Besides publishing the list of all grand masters known as the Charter of Larminius, said to have been preserved in the secret archives of the temple. These works also reproduce another document, drawn from the same repository, describing the origins of the order. This manuscript, written in Greek on parchment, dated 1154, purports to be taken from a 5th century MS, and relates to that Hugues de Payens, first Grand Master of the Templars, was initiated in 1118, that is to say in the year the order was founded, into the religious doctrine of the primitive Christian church by its sovereign pontiff and patriarch, Theocle, 60th in direct succession from St. John the Apostle. The history of the primitive church is then given as follows. Moses was initiated in Egypt, profoundly versed in the physical, theological, and metaphysical mysteries of the priests. He knew how to profit by these so as to surmount the power of the mages and deliver his companions. Aaron, his brother, and the chiefs of the Hebrews became the depositories of his doctrine. The Son of God afterwards appeared on the scene of the world. He was brought up at the school of Alexandria, imbued with a spirit wholly divine, endowed with the most astounding qualities, dispositions. He was able to reach all the degrees of Egyptian initiation. On his return to Jerusalem, he presented himself before the chiefs of the synagogue, Jesus Christ, directing the fruit of his lofty meditations towards universal civilization and the happiness of the world, rent the veil which concealed the truth from the peoples. He preached the love of God, the love of one's neighbor, and equality before the common Father of all men. Jesus conferred evangelical initiation on his apostles and disciples. He transmitted his spirit to them, divided them into several orders after the practice of John the beloved disciple, the apostle of fraternal love, whom he had instituted sovereign pontiff and patriarch. Here we have the whole Kabbalistic legend of the secret doctrine descending from Moses, of Christ as an Egyptian initiate and founder of a secret order, a theory, of course, absolutely destructive of belief in his divinity. The legend of the Order du Temple goes on to say, up to about the year 1118, i.e. the year of the order of the temple was founded, the mysteries in the hierarchic order of the initiation of Egypt, transmitted to the Jews by Moses, then to the Christians by J.C., were religiously preserved by the successors of St. John the Apostle. These mysteries and initiations, regenerated by the evangelical initiation or baptism, were a sacred trust which the simplicity of the primitive and unchanging morality of the brothers of the East had preserved from all adulteration. The Christians, persecuted by the infidels, appreciating the courage and piety of these brave crusaders, who, with the sword in one hand and the cross in the other, flew to the defense of the holy places and, above all, doing striking justice to the virtues and the ardent charity of Hoogs de Payens, held it their duty to confide to hands so pure the treasures of knowledge acquired through many centuries sanctified by the cross, the dogma, and the morality of the man-god. Hughes was invested with the apostolic patriarchal power and placed in the legitimate order of the successors of St. John the Apostle or the Evangelist. Such is the origin of the foundation of the order, of the temple, and of the fusion in this order of the different kinds of initiation of the Christians of the East, designated under the title of Primitive Christians or Johannites. It will be seen at once that all this story is subtly subversive of true Christianity, and that the appellation of Christians applied to the Johannites is an imposture. Indeed, Fabra Palaprat, a grand master of the Order du Temple in 1804, who in his book on the Templars repeats the story contained in the Levitican and the Manuel de Chevalier du Temple, 
whilst making the same profession of primitive Christian doctrines descending from St. John through Theocle and Hugues de Payens to the order over which he presides, goes on to say that the secret doctrine of the Templars was essentially contrary to the canons of the Church of Rome, and that it is principally to this fact that one must attribute the persecution of which history has preserved the memory. The belief of the primitive Christians, and consequently that the Templars, with regard to the miracles of Christ, is that he did or may have done extraordinary or miraculous things, and that since God can do things incomprehensible to human intelligence, the primitive church venerates all the acts of Christ as they are described in the gospel, whether it considers them as acts of human science or whether as acts of divine power. Belief in the divinity of Christ is thus left an open question, and the same attitude is maintained towards the resurrection, of which the story is omitted in the Gospel of St. John, possessed by the Order. Fabra Palaprat further admits that the gravest accusations brought against the Templars were founded on facts, which he attempts to explain away in the following manner. The Templars, having in 1307 carefully abstracted all the manuscripts composing the secret archives of the Order, from the search made by authority, and these authentic manuscripts having been precisely preserved since that period, we have today the certainty that the knights endured a great number of religious and moral trials before reaching the different degrees of initiation. Thus, for example, the recipient might receive the injunction under pain of death to trample on the crucifix or to worship an idol. But if he yielded to the terror which they sought to inspire in him, he was declared unworthy of being admitted to the higher grades of the order. One can imagine in this way how beings too feeble or too immoral to endure the trials of initiation may have accused the Templars of giving themselves up to infamous practices and of having superstitious beliefs. It is certainly not surprising that an order which gave such injunctions as these, for whatever purpose, should have become the object of suspicion. Eliphas Levi, who, like Ragon, accepts the statements of the Order du Temple concerning the Johannites, origin of the Templar's secret doctrine, is however not deceived by these professions of Christianity, and boldly asserts that the sovereign pontiff Theocle initiated Hugues de Payen into the mysteries and hopes of his pretended church. He lured him by the ideas of sacerdotal sovereignty and supreme royalty. He indicated him finally as his successor. So the order of the Knights of the Temple was stained from its origin with schism and conspiracy against kings. Further, Levi relates that the real story to initiates concerning Christ was no other than the infamous Toldot Yeshu, described in the first chapter of this book, and which the Johannites dared to attribute to St. John. This would accord with the confession of the Catalonian Knight Templar Galserandus de Tu who stated that the form of absolution in the order was, I pray God that he may pardon your sins as he pardoned St. Mary Magdalene and the thief on the cross. But the witness went on to explain, By the thief of which the head of the chapter speaks is meant, according to our statutes, that Jesus or Christ, who was crucified by the Jews because he was not God, and yet he said he was God and the King of the Jews, which was an outrage to the true God who is in heaven. When Jesus, a few moments before his death, had his side pierced by the lance of Longinus, he repented of having called himself God and King of the Jews, and he asked pardon of the true God. Then the true God pardoned him. It is thus that we apply to the crucified Christ these words, as God pardoned the thief on the cross. Reynard, who quotes this disposition, stigmatizes it as singular and extravagant. And matter agrees that it is doubtless extravagant, but that it merits attention. There was a whole system there, which was not the invention of Galserant. Eliphas Levi proves the clue to the system as to the reason why Christ was described as a thief, by indicating the Kabbalistic legend wherein he was described as having stolen the sacred name from the Holy of Holies. Elsewhere, he explains that the Johannites made themselves out to be the only people initiated into the true mysteries of the religion of the Savior. They professed to know the real history of Jesus Christ, and by adopting part of Jewish traditions and the stories of the Talmud, they made out that the facts related in the Gospels 
That is to say, the Gospels accepted by the Orthodox Church were only allegories of which St. John gives the key. But it is time to pass from legend to facts, for the whole story of the initiation of the Templars by the Johannites rests principally on the documents produced by the Order du Temple in 1811. According to the Abbe Gregoire and Munter, the authenticity and antiquity of these documents are beyond dispute. Gregoire, referring to the parchment manuscript of the Levitican and Gospel of St. John, says that Hellenists versed in paleography believe this manuscript to be of the 13th century. Others declare it to be earlier and to go back to the 11th century. Matter, on the other hand, quoting Munter's opinion that the manuscripts in the archives of the modern Templars date from the 13th century, observes that this is all a tissue of errors and that the critics, including the learned Professor Thilo, of Halley, have recognized that the manuscript in question, far from belonging to the 13th century, dates from the beginning of the 18th. From the arrangement of the chapters of the Gospel, M. Matter arrives at the conclusion that it was intended to accompany the ceremonies of some Masonic or secret society. We shall return to this possibility in a later chapter. The antiquity of the manuscript containing the history of the Templars thus remains an open question, on which no one can pronounce an opinion without having seen the original. In order, then, to judge of the probability of the story that this manuscript contained, it is necessary to consult the facts of history, and to discover what proof can be found that any such sect as the Johannites existed at the time of the Crusades, or earlier. Certainly none is known to have been called by this name or by one resembling it before 1622, when some Portuguese monks reported the existence of a sect whom they described as Christians of St. John, inhabiting the banks of the Euphrates. The appellation appears, however, to have been wrongly applied by the monks, for the sectarians in question, variously known as the Mandians, Mandites, Sabians, Nazareans, etc., call themselves Mandai Ayahai, that is to say, the disciples, or rather the wise men of John, the word Mandai being derived from the Chaldean word Manda, corresponding to the Greek word or wisdom. The multiplicity of names given to the Mandians arises apparently from the fact that in their dealings with other communities, they took the name of Sabians, whilst they called the wise and learned amongst themselves Nazareans. The sect formerly inhabited the banks of the Jordan, but was driven out by the Muslims, who forced them to retire to Mesopotamia and Babylonia, where they particularly affected the neighborhood of rivers in order to be able to carry out their peculiar baptismal rites. There can be no doubt that the doctrines of the Mandians do resemble their description of the Johannite heresy as given by Eliphas Levi, though not by the Ordur du Temple and that the Mandians professed to be the disciples of St. John, the Baptist, however, not the Apostle, but were at the same time the enemies of Jesus Christ. According to the Mandians, Book of John, Sidra de Yaya, Yaya, that is to say St. John, baptized myriads of men during 40 years in the Jordan. By a mistake, or in response to a written mandate from heaven saying, Yahya baptized the liar in the Jordan. He baptized the false prophet, Yeshu Meshiha, the Messiah Jesus, son of the devil Ruha, Kadishta. The same idea is found in another book of the sect called the Book of Adam, which represents Jesus as the perverter of St. John's doctrine and the disseminator of iniquity and perfidy throughout the world. The resemblance between all this and the legends of the Talmud, the Kabbalah, and the Toldot Yeshu is at once apparent. Moreover, the Mandeans claim for the Book of Adam the same origin as the Jews claim for the Kabbalah, namely that it was delivered to Adam by God through the hands of the angel Raziel. This book, known to scholars as the Codex Nazareus, is described by Munter as a sort of mosaic without order without method, where one finds mentioned Noah, Abraham, Moses, Solomon, the Temple of Jerusalem, St. John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, the Christians, and Muhammad. A matter, whilst denying any proof of the Templar succession from the Mandeans, nevertheless gives good reason for believing that the sect itself existed from the first centuries of the Christian era, and that its books dated from the 8th century. Further, that these Mandeans or Nazareans 
not to be confounded with the pre-Christian Nazarites or Christian Nazarenes, were Jews who revered St. John the Baptist as the prophet of ancient Mosaism, but regarded Jesus Christ as a false messiah sent by the powers of darkness. Modern Jewish opinion confirms this affirmation of Judaic inspiration and agrees with matter in describing the Mandeans as Gnostics. Their sacred books are in the Aramaic dialect, which has close affinities with that of the Talmud of Babylon. The Jewish influence is distinctly visible in the Mandean religion. It is essentially of the type of ancient Gnosticism, traces of which are found in the Talmud, the Midrash, and, in a modified form, the later Kabbalah. It may be then regarded as certain that a sect existed long before the time of the Crusades, corresponding to the description of the Johannites given by Eliphas Levi, in that it was Kabbalistic, anti-Christian, yet professedly founded on the doctrines of one of the St. John's. Whether it was by this sect that the Templars were indoctrinated must remain an open question. M. Matter objects that the evidence lacking to such a conclusion lies in the fact that the Templars express no particular reverence for St. John. But Louis Lair asserts that the Templars did prefer the Gospel of St. John to that of the other evangelists, and that modern Masonic lodges claiming descent from the Templars possess a special version of this Gospel, said to have been copied from the original on Mount Athos. It is also said that Baphomets were preserved in the Masonic lodges of Hungary, where a debased form of masonry known as Johannite masonry survives to this day. If the Templar heresy was that of the Johannites, the head in question might possibly represent that of John the Baptist, which would accord with the theory that the word Baphomet was derived from Greek words signifying baptism of wisdom. This would moreover not be incompatible with Louis Leur's theory of an affinity between the Templars and the Bogomils, for the Bogomils also possessed their own version of the Gospel of St. John, which they placed on the heads of their neophytes during the ceremony of initiation. Giving as the reason for the eye peculiar veneration they professed for its author, that they regarded St. John as the servant of the Jewish god Setanel. Eliphas Levi even goes so far as to accuse the Templars of following the occult practices of the Luciferians, who carried the doctrines of the Bogomils to the point of paying homage to the powers of darkness. Let us declare for the edification of the vulgar, and for the greater glory of the Church which has persecuted the Templars, burned the magicians and excommunicated the Freemasons, etc., let us say loudly and boldly that all the initiates of the occult sciences have adored, do, and will always adore that which is signified by this frightful symbol, the sabbatic goat. Yes, in our profound conviction, the Grand Masters of the Order of the Templars adored Baphomet and caused him to be adored by their initiates. It will be seen, then, that the accusation of heresy brought against the Templars does not emanate solely from the Catholic Church, but also from the secret societies. Even our Freemasons, who, for reasons I shall show later, have generally defended the order, are now willing to admit that there was a very real case against them. Thus, Dr. Ranking, who has devoted many years of study to the question, has arrived at the conclusion that Johannism is the real clue to the Templar heresy. In a very interesting paper published in the Masonic Journal, Ars Quator Coronatorum, he observes that the record of the Templars in Palestine is one long tale of intrigue and treachery on the part of the order. And finally, that from the very commencement of Christianity there has been transmitted through the centuries a body of doctrine incompatible with Christianity in the various official churches. That the bodies teaching these doctrines profess to do so on the authority of St. John, to whom, as they claimed, the true secrets had been committed by the founder of Christianity that during the Middle Ages, the main support of the Gnostic bodies and the main repository of this knowledge was the Society of the Templars. What is the explanation of this choice of St. John for the propagation of anti-Christian doctrines, which we shall find continuing up to the present day? What else than the method of perversion, which in its extreme form becomes Satanism and consists in always selecting the most sacred things for the purpose of desecration? Precisely, then, because the Gospel of St. John is the one of all the four which most insists on the divinity of Christ, the occult, anti-Christian sects have habitually made it the basis of their rites. 
Chapter 4 Three Centuries of Occultism It has been shown in the foregoing chapters that from very early times occult sects had existed for two purposes, esoteric and political. Whilst the Manichaeans, the early Ismailis, the Bogomils, and the Luciferians had concerned themselves mainly with the religious or esoteric doctrines, the later Ismailis, the Fatimites, the Karmathites, and the Templars had combined secrecy and occult rites with the political aim of domination. We shall find this double tradition running through all the secret society movement up to the present day. The dualist doctrines attributed to the Templars were not, however, confined to this order in Europe, but had been, as we have seen, those professed by the Bogomils and also by the Cathari, who spread westwards from Bulgaria and Bosnia to France. It was owing to their sojourn in Bulgaria that the Cathari gained the popular nickname of Bulgars or Bourgers, signifying those addicted to unnatural vice. One section of the Cathari in the south of France became known after 1180 as the Albigenses, thus called from the town of Albi, although their headquarters were really in Toulouse. Christians only in name, they adhered in secret to the Gnostics and Manichaean doctrines of the earlier Cathari, which they would appear to have combined with Johannism, since, like this Eastern sect, they claimed to possess their own Gospel of St. John. Although not strictly a secret society, the Albigenses were divided after the secret society system into initiates and semi-initiates. The former, few in number, known as the Perfecti, led in appearance an austere life, refraining from meat and professing abhorrence of oaths or of lying. The mystery in which they enveloped themselves won for them the adoring reference of the Credentes who formed the great majority of the sect and gave themselves up to every vice, to usury, brigandage, and perjury, and whilst describing marriage as prostitution, condoning incest and all forms of licence. The credentes, who probably were not fully initiated into the dualist doctrines of their superiors, looked to them for salvation through the laying on of hands according to the system of the Manichaeans. It was amongst the nobles of Languedoc that the Albigenses found their principal support. This Judea of France, as it had been called, was peopled by a medley of mixed races, Iberian, Gallic, Roman, and Semitic. The nobles, very different from the ignorant and pious chivalry of the North, had lost all respect for their traditions. There were few who, in going back, did not encounter some Saracen or Jewish grandmother in their genealogy. Moreover, many had brought back to Europe the laxity of morals they had contracted during the Crusades. The Comte de Cummings practiced polygamy, and according to ecclesiastical chronicles, Raymond VI, Comte de Toulouse, one of the most ardent of the Albigenses, Credentes, had his harem. The Albigensian movement had been falsely represented as a protest merely against the tyranny of the Church of Rome. In reality, it was arising against the fundamental doctrines of Christianity. More than this, against all principles of religion and morality. For whilst some of the sect openly declared that the Jewish law was preferable to that of the Christians, to others the God of the Old Testament was as abhorrent as the false Christ who suffered at Golgotha. The old hatred of the Gnostics and Manichaeans for the Demiurgus lived again in these rebels against the social order. Forerunners of the 17th century, Libertines and 18th century Illuminati, the Albigense nobles, under the pretext of fighting the priesthood, strove to throw off all the restraints the church imposed. Inevitably, the disorders that took place throughout the south of France led to reprisals, and the Albigenses were suppressed with all the cruelty of the age, a fact which has afforded historians the opportunity to exalt them as noble martyrs victims of ecclesiastical despotism. But again, as in the case of the Templars, the fact that they were persecuted does not prove them innocent of the crimes laid to their charge. Satanism At the beginning of the 14th century, another development of dualism, far more horrible than the Manichaean heresy of the Albigenses, began to make itself felt. This was the cult of Satanism, or black magic. The subject is one that must be approached with extreme caution, owing to the fact that on one hand much of it has been written about, 
is the result of medieval superstition, which sees in every departure from the Roman Catholic faith the direct intervention of the evil one, whilst on the other hand the conspiracy of history, which denies in toto the existence of the occult power, discredits all revelations on this question, from whatever source they emanate, as the outcome of hysterical imagination. This is rendered all the easier since the subject by its amazing extravagance lends itself to ridicule. It is, however, idle to deny that the cult of evil has always existed. The invocation of the powers of darkness was practiced in the earliest days of the human race, and after the Christian era found its expression, as we have seen in the Cainites, the Eukites, and the Luciferians. These were not surmises, but actual facts of history. Towards the end of the 12th century, Luciferianism spread eastwards through Syria, the Tyrol, and Bohemia, even as far as Brandenburg. By the beginning of the 13th century, it had invaded western Germany, and in the 14th century reached its zenith in that country, as also in Italy and France. The cult now reached a further stage in its development and was not the mere propitiation of Satan Al as the prince of this world practiced by the Luciferians, but actual Satanism, the love of evil for the sake of evil, which formed the doctrine of the sect known in Italy as Le Vecchia Religion, or the Old Religion. Sorcery was adopted as a profession and witches, not as is popularly supposed, sporadic growths were trained in schools of magic to practice their art. These facts should be remembered when the church is blamed for the violence it displayed against witchcraft. It was not individuals but a system which it set out to destroy. The essence of Satanism is desecration. In the ceremonies for infernal evocation described by Eliphas Levi, we read, It is requisite to profane the ceremonies of the religion one belongs to and to trample its holiest symbols underfoot. This practice found a climax in desecrating the holy sacrament. The consecrated water was given as food to mice, toads, and pigs, or denied in unspeakable ways. A revolting description of a black mass may be found in Huysman's book, Le Bas. It is unnecessary to transcribe the loathsome details here. Suffice it then to show that this cult had a very real existence, and if any further doubt remains on the matter, the life of Gilles de Ray supplies documentary evidence of the visible results of black magic in the Middle Ages. Gilles de Ray was born at Machicoul in Brittany about the year 1404. This first period of his life was glorious, the companion and guide of Jeanne d'Arc. He became Maréchal of France and distinguished himself by many deeds of valor. But after dissipating his immense fortune largely on church ceremonies carried out with the wildest extravagance, he was led to study alchemy, partly by curiosity and partly as a means for restoring his shattered fortunes. Hearing that Germany and Italy were the countries where alchemy flourished, he enlisted Italians in his service and was gradually drawn into the further region of magic. According to Hoismans, Gilles de Ray had remained until this moment a Christian mystic under the influence of Jeanne d'Arc. But after her death, possibly in despair, he offered himself to the powers of darkness. Evokers of Satan now flocked to him from every side. Amongst the Prelati, an Italian, by no means the old and wrinkled sorcerer of tradition, but a young and attractive man of charming manners for it was from Italy that came the most skillful adepts in the art of alchemy, astrology, magic, and infernal evocation, who spread themselves over Europe, particularly France. Under the influence of these initiators, Gilles de Ray signed a letter to the devil in a meadow near Machacoul, asking him for knowledge, power, and riches, and offering in exchange anything that might be asked of him, with the exception of his life or his soul. But in spite of this appeal and of a pact signed with the blood of the writer, no satanic apparitions were forthcoming. It was then that, becoming still more desperate, Gilles de Ray had recourse to the abominations for which his name has remained infamous. Still more frightful invocations, loathsome debaucheries, perverted vice in every form, sadic cruelties, horrible sacrifices, and finally, holocausts of little boys and girls collected by his agents in the surrounding country and put to death with the most inhuman tortures. During the years 1432 to 40, 
Literally, hundreds of children disappeared. Many of the names of the unhappy little victims were preserved in the records of the period. Gilles de Ray met with a well-deserved end. In 1440, he was hanged and burnt. So far, he does not appear to have found a Pangyrus to place him in the ranks of noble martyrs. It will, of course, be urged that the crimes here described were those of a criminal lunatic and not to be attributed to any occult cause. The answer to this is that Gilles was not an isolated unit, but one of a group of occultists who cannot all have been mad. Moreover, it was only after his invocation of the evil one that he developed these monstrous proclivities. So also his 18th century replica, the Marquis de Sade, combined with his abominations and impassioned hatred of the Christian religion. What is the explanation of this craze for magic in Western Europe? Deschamps points to the Kabbalah that science of demoniacal arts, of which the Jews were the initiators, and undoubtedly in any comprehensive review of the question, the influence of the Jewish Kabbalists cannot be ignored. In Spain, Portugal, Provence, and Italy, the Jews by the 15th century had become a power. As early as 1450, they had penetrated into the intellectual circles of Florence, and it was also in Italy that, a century later, the modern Kabbalistic school was inaugurated by Isaac Luria, 1533-72, whose doctrines were organized into a practical system by the Hasidim of Eastern Europe for the writing of amulets, the conjuring of devils, <clears throat> whose doctrines were organized into a practical system by the Hasidim of Eastern Europe for the writing of amulets, the conjuration of devils, mystical jugglery with numbers and letters, etc. Italy in the 15th century was thus a center from which Kabbalistic influences radiated, and it may be that the Italians who indoctrinated Gilles de Ray had drawn their inspiration from this source. Indeed, Eliphas Levi, who certainly cannot be accused of anti-Semitism, declares that the Jews, the most faithful trustees of the secret of the Kabbalah, were almost always the great masters of magic in the Middle Ages, and suggests that Gilles de Ray took his monstrous recipes for using the blood of murdered children from some of those old Hebrew grimoires, books on magic, which, if they had been known, would have sufficed to hold up the Jews to the execration of the whole earth. Voltaire, in his Henriade, likewise attributes the magical blood rites practiced in the 16th century to Jewish inspiration. Voltaire adds in a footnote, It was ordinarily Jews that were made use of for magical operations. This ancient superstition comes from the secrets of the Kabbalah, of which the Jews call themselves the sole depositories. Catherine de Medicis, the Maréchal d'Ancre, and many others employed Jews for these spells. The charge of black magic recurs all through the history of Europe from the earliest times. The Jews are accused of poisoning wells, of practicing ritual murder, of using stolen church property for purposes of desecration, etc. No doubt there enters into all this a great amount of exaggeration, inspired by popular prejudice and medieval superstition. Yet, whilst condemning the persecution to which the Jews were subjected on this account, it must be admitted that they laid themselves open to suspicion by their real addiction to magical arts. If ignorant superstition is found on the side of the persecutors, still more amazing superstition is found on the side of the persecuted. Demonology in Europe was in fact essentially a Jewish science. For although a belief in evil spirits existed from the earliest times and has always continued to exist amongst primitive races, and also amongst the ignorant classes in civilized countries, it was mainly through the Jews that these dark superstitions were imported to the West, where they persisted not merely amongst the lower strata of the Jewish population, but formed an essential part of the Jewish tradition. Thus the Talmud says, If the eye could perceive the demons that peopled the universe, existence would be impossible. The demons are more numerous than we are. They surround us on all sides like trenches dug round vineyards. Every one of us has a thousand on his left hand and ten thousand on his right. The discomfort endured by those who attend rabbinical conferences comes from the demons mingling with men in these circumstances. Besides, the fatigue one feels in one's knees in a walking comes from the demons that one knocks up against at every step. 
the clothing of the rabbis wears out so quickly, it is again because the demons rub up against them. Whoever wants to convince himself of their presence has only to surround his bed with sifted cinders, and the next morning he will see the imprints of cock's feet. The same treatise goes on to give directions for seeing demons by burning portions of a black cat and placing the ashes in one's eye. Then at once one perceives the demons. The Talmud also explains that devils particularly inhabit the water spouts on houses and are fond of drinking out of water jugs. Therefore, it is advisable to pour a little water out of a jug before drinking so as to get rid of the unclean part. These ideas received a fresh impetus from the publication of the Zohar, which, a Jewish writer tells us, from the 14th century held almost unbroken sway over the minds of the majority of the Jews. In it, the Talmudic legends concerning the existence and activity of the Shedim, demons, are repeated and amplified, and a hierarchy of demons was established corresponding to the heavenly hierarchy. Manasseh, Ben Israel's Nishmat, Hayim, is full of information concerning belief in demons. Even the scholarly and learned rabbis of the 17th century clung to the belief. Here, then, is not a case of ignorant peasants evolving fantastic visions from their own sacred imaginations, but of the rabbis, the acknowledged leaders of a race claiming civilized traditions and a high order of intelligence, deliberately inculcating in their disciples the perpetual fear of demoniacal influences. How much of this fear communicated itself to the Gentile population? It is at any rate a curious coincidence to notice the resemblances between so-called popular superstitions and the writings of the rabbis. For example, the vile confessions made by both Scotch and French peasant women accused of witchcraft concerning the nocturnal visits paid them by male devils find an exact counterpart in passages of the Kabbalah, where it is said that the demon are both male and female, and they also endeavor to consort with human beings a conception from which arises the belief in incubi and succubi. Thus, on Jewish authority, we learn the Judaic origin of this strange delusion. It is clearly to the same source that we may trace the magical formula for the healing of disease current at the same period. From the earliest times, the Jews had specialized in medicine, and many royal personages insisted on employing Jewish doctors, some of whom may have acquired medical knowledge of a high order. The Jewish writer Margoliuth dwells on this fact with some complacency and goes on to contrast the scientific methods of the Hebrew doctors with the quackeries of the monks. In spite of reports circulated by the monks that the Jews were sorcerers in consequence of their superior medical skill, Christian patients would frequent the houses of the Jewish physicians in preference to the monasteries, where cures were pretended to have been affected by some extraordinary relics, such as the nails of St. Augustine the extremity of St. Peter's second toe, etc. It need hardly be added that the cures effected by the Jewish physicians were more numerous than those by the monkish impostors. Yet, in reality, the grotesque remedies which Margoliuth attributes to Christian superstition appear to have been partly derived from Jewish sources. The author of a further article on Magic in Hastings Encyclopedia goes on to say that the magical formula handed down in Latin and ancient medical writings and used by the monks were mainly of Eastern origin, derived from Babylonish, Egyptian, and Jewish magic. The monks, therefore, played merely an intermediate role. Indeed, if we turn to the Talmud, we find cures recommended no less absurd than those which Margoliuth derides. For example, the eggs of a grasshopper as a remedy for toothache, the tooth of a fox as a remedy for sleep, viz. the tooth of a live fox to prevent sleep, and of a dead one to cause sleep, the nail from the gallows where a man was hanged as a remedy for swelling. A strongly pro-Semite writer quotes a number of Jewish medical writings of the 18th century, republished as late as the end of the 19th which show the persistence of these magical formula amongst the Jews. Most of these are too loathsome to transcribe, but some of the more innocuous are as follows, for epilepsy, kill a cock and let it putrefy. In order to protect yourself from all evils, gird yourself with the rope with which a criminal has been hung. Blood of different kinds also plays an important part, 
Fox's blood and wolf's blood are good for stone in the bladder, ram's blood for colic, weasel blood for scrofula, etc. These to be externally applied. But to return to Satanism, whoever were the secret inspirers of magical and diabolical practices during the 14th to the 18th centuries, the evidence of the existence of Satanism during this long period is overwhelming and rests on the actual facts of history. Details quite as extravagant and revolting as those contained in the works of Eliphas Levi or in Huysman's Labas are given in documentary form by Margaret Alice Murray in her singularly passionless work relating principally to the witches of Scotland. The cult of evil is a reality, by whatever means we may seek to explain it. Eliphas Levi, whilst denying the existence of Satan as a superior personality and power, admits this fundamental truth. Evil exists. It is impossible to doubt it. We can do good or evil. There are beings who knowingly and voluntarily do evil. There are also beings who love evil. Levi has admiredly described the spirit that animates such beings in his definition of black magic. Black magic is really but a combination of sacrileges and murders graduated with a view to the permanent perversion of the human will and the realization in a living man of the monstrous phantom of the fiend. It is therefore, properly speaking, the religion of the devil, the worship of darkness, the hatred of goodness, exaggerated to the point of paroxysm. It is the incarnation of death and the permanent creation of hell. The Middle Ages, which depicted the devil fleeing from holy water, were not perhaps quite so benighted as our superior modern culture has led us to suppose. For that hatred of goodness exaggerated to the point of paroxysm, that impulse to desecrate and defile, which forms the basis of black magic and has manifested itself in successive phases of the world revolution, springs from fear. So by their very hatred, the powers of darkness proclaim the existence of the powers of light and their own impotence. In the cry of the demoniac, What have we to do with thee, Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee, who thou art, the Holy One of God. Do we not hear the unwilling tribute of the vanquished to the victor in the mighty conflict between good and evil? The Rosicrucians In dealing with the question of magic, it is necessarily to realize that, although to the world in general the word is synonymous with necromancy, it does not bear this significance in the language of occultism, particularly the occultism of the 16th and 17th centuries. Magic at this date was a term employed to cover many branches of investigation, which Robert Flood, the English Rosicrucian, classified under various headings, of which the first three are as follows. 1. Natural magic, that most occult and secret department of physics, by which the mystical properties of natural substances are extracted. 2. Mathematical magic, which enables adepts in the art to construct marvelous machines by means of their geometric knowledge. Whilst 3. Vinific magic, is familiar with potions, filters, and with various preparations of poisons. It is obvious that all these have now passed into the realms of science and are no longer regarded as magical arts, but the further categories enumerated by Flood and compromised under the general heading of necromantic magic retain the popular sense of the term. These are described as 1. Goetic, which consists in diabolical commerce with unclean spirits and rites of criminal curiosity, in illicit songs and invocations, and in the evocation of the souls of the dead. 2. Maleficent, which is the abjuration of the devils by the virtue of divine names, and 3. Theurgic, purporting to be governed by good angels and the divine will, but its wonders are most frequently performed by evil spirits, who assume the names of God and of the angels. 4. The last species of magic is the thaumaturgic, begetting illusory phenomena. By this art the magi produce their phantoms and other marvels. To this list might be added celestial magic or knowledge dealing with the influence of the heavenly bodies on which astrology is based. The forms of magic dealt with in the preceding part of this chapter belong therefore to the second half of these categories, that is to say, to necromantic magic. 
But at the same period, another movement was gradually taking shape, which concerned itself with the first category enumerated above, that is to say, the secret properties of natural substances. A man whose methods appear to have approached to the modern conception of scientific research was Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim, commonly known as Paracelsus, the son of a German doctor born about 1493, who during his travels in the East is said to have acquired a knowledge of some secret doctrine, which he afterwards elaborated into a system for the healing of diseases. Although his ideas were thus doubtless drawn from some of the same sources as those from which the Jewish Kabbalah descended, Paracelsus does not appear to have been a Kabbalist, but a scientist of no mean order, and as an isolated thinker apparently connected with no secret association does not enter further into the scope of this work. Paracelsus must therefore not be identified with the school of so-called Christian Kabbalists who from Raymond Lully, the Dr. Illuminatus of the 13th century onward, drew their inspiration from the Kabbalah of the Jews. This is not to say that the influence under which they fell was wholly pernicious, for just as certain Jews appear to have acquired some real medical skill, so also they appear to have possessed some real knowledge of natural science, inherited perhaps from the ancient traditions of the East, or derived from the writings of Hippocrates, Galen, and other of the great Greek physicians, and as yet unknown to Europe. Thus, Eliphas Levi relates that the rabbi Jechiel, a Kabbalistic Jew protected by St. Louis, possessed the secret of the ever-burning lamps, claimed later by the Rosicrucians, which suggests the possibility that some kind of luminous gas or electric light may have been known to the Jews. In alchemy, they were the acknowledged leaders. The most noted alchemist of the 14th century, Nicholas Flamel, discovered the secret of the art from the book of Abraham the Jew, prince, priest, Levite, astrologer, and philosopher. And this actual book is said to have passed later into the possession of Cardinal Richelieu. It was likewise from a Florentine Jew, Alemanus or Daedalus, that Pico Della Mirandola, the 15th century mystic, received instructions in the Kabbalah and imagined that he had discovered in the doctrines of Christianity. This delighted Pope Sixtus IV, who thereupon ordered Kabbalistic writings to be translated into Latin for the use of divinity students. At the same time, the Kabbalah was introduced into Germany by Ruchelin, who had learnt Hebrew from the rabbi Jacob B. Jeschel Lohns court physician to Frederick III, and in 1494 published a Kabbalistic treatise, De Verbo Mirifico, showing that all wisdom and true philosophy are derived from the Hebrews. Considerable alarm appears, however, to have been created by the spread of rabbinical literature, and in 1509, a Jew converted to Christianity named Pfefferkorn persuaded the Emperor Maximilian I to burn all Jewish books except the Old Testament. Ruchelin consulted on this matter, advised only the destruction of the Toldot Yeshu and of the Sefer Nizikon by the Rabbi Lippmann, because these works were full of blasphemies against Christ and against the Christian religion, but urged the preservation of the rest. In this defense of Jewish literature, he was supported by the Duke of Bavaria, who appointed him professor at Ingolstadt, but was strongly condemned by the Dominicans of Cologne. In reply to their attacks, Ruchlin launched his defense, De Art Kabbalistica, glorifying the Kabbalah, of which the central doctrine for him was the messianology around which all its other doctrines grouped themselves. His whole philosophical system, as he himself admitted, was in fact entirely Kabbalistic, and his views were shared by his contemporary, Cornelius Agrippa of Netesheim. As a result of these teachings, a craze for Kabbalism spread amongst Christian prelates. Statesmen and warriors and a number of Christian thinkers took up the doctrines of the Kabbalah and essayed to work them over in their own way. Athanasius Kircher and Nor Baron von Rosenroth, author of the Kabbalah Dunudata, in the course of the 17th century, endeavored to spread the Kabbalah among the Christians by translating Kabbalistic works, which they regarded as most ancient wisdom. Most of them, the Jewish encyclopedia goes on to observe derisively, held the absurd idea that the Kabbalah contained proofs of the truth of Christianity, 
much that appears Christian in the Kabbalah is in fact nothing but the logical development of certain ancient esoteric doctrines. The Rosicrucians appear to have been the outcome both of this Kabbalistic movement and of the teachings of Paracelsus. The earliest intimation of their existence was given in a series of pamphlets which appeared at the beginning of the 17th century. The first of these entitled the Fama Fraternatitis, or the discovery of the fraternity of the most laudable order of the Rosy Cross, was published at Cassel in 1614 and the Confessio Fraternitatis earlier in the following year. These contain what may be described as the grand legend of Rosicrucianism, which has been repeated with slight variations up to the present day. Briefly, this story is as follows. The most godly and highly illuminated father, our brother C.R., that is to say Christian Rosenkreutz, a German, the chief and original of our fraternity, was born in 1378 and some 16 years later traveled to the east with a brother P.A.L., who had determined to go to the Holy Land. On reaching Cyprus, Brother P.A.L. died, and so never came to Jerusalem. Brother C.R., however, having become acquainted with certain wise men of Damasco in Arabia, and beheld what great wonders they wrought, went on alone to Damasco. Here the wise men received him, and he then set himself to study physic and mathematics, and to translate the book M into Latin. After three years, he went to Egypt, where he journeyed on to Fez, where he did get acquaintance with those who are called the elementary inhabitants, who revealed to him many of their secrets. Of those of Fez, he often did confess that their magia was not altogether pure, and also that their Kabbalah was defiled with their religion. But notwithstanding, he knew how to make good use of the same. After two years, Brother C.R. departed the city Fez and sailed away with many costly things, into Spain, where he conferred with the learned man in being ready bountiful to impart all his arts and secrets. Showed them, amongst other things, how there might be a society in Europe which might have gold, silver, and precious stones sufficient for them to bestow on kings for the necessary uses and lawful purposes. Christian Rosenkreutz then returned to Germany, where there is nowadays no want of learned men, magicians, Kabbalists, physicians, and philosophers. Here he builded himself a fitting and neat habitation in which he ruminated his voyage and philosophy and reduced them together into a true memorial. At the end of five years' meditation, there came again into his mind the wished for reformation. Accordingly, he chose some few adjoined with him. The brethren G.V., I.A., and I.O., the last of whom was very expert and well-learned in the Kabbalah, as his book H. Witnesseth, to form a circle of initiates. After this manner began the fraternity of the Rosy Cross. Five other brethren were afterwards added, all Germans except I.A., and these eight constituted his new building called Sancti Spiritus. The following agreement was then drawn up. First, that none of them should profess any other thing than to cure the sick, and that gratis. Second, none of the posterity should be constrained to wear one certain kind of habit, but therein to follow the custom of the country. Third, that every year upon the day C, they should meet together at the house Sancti Spiritus, or write the cause of his absence. Fourth, every brother should look about for a worthy person who, after his decease, might succeed him. Fifth, the word CR should be their seal, mark, and character. Sixth, the fraternity should remain secret one hundred years. Finally, Brother CR died, but where and when or in what country he was buried remained a secret. The date, however, is generally given as if 1484. In 1604, the brethren who then constituted the inner circle of the order discovered a door on which was written in large letters, Post 120, Annos Patebo. On opening the door, a vault was disclosed to view, where beneath a brass tablet the body of Christian Rosenkreutz was found, whole and unconsumed, with all his ornaments and attires, and holding in his hand the parchment eye, which, next unto the Bible, is our greatest treasure, whilst beside him lay a number of books, amongst others the vocabulario of Paracelsus, who, however the fama observes, earlier was none of our fraternity. 
The brethren now knew that after a time there would be a general reformation both of divine and human things. While declaring their belief in the Christian faith, the Fama goes on to explain that our philosophy is not a new invention, but as Adam after his fall hath received it, and as Moses and Solomon used it, wherein Plato, Aristotle, Pythagoras, and others did hit the mark, and wherein Enoch, Abraham, Moses, Solomon did excel, but especially where with that wonderful book the Bible agreeeth. It will be seen that according to this manifesto, Rosicrucianism was a combination of the ancient secret tradition handed down from the patriarchs to the philosophers of Greece and of the first Kabbalah of the Jews. The grand legend of Rosicrucianism rests, however, on no historical evidence. There is, in fact, not the latest reason to suppose that any such person as Christian Rosencruz ever existed. The Illuminatus von Nigge in the 18th century asserted that it is now recognized amongst enlightened men that no real Rosicrucians have existed, but that the whole of what is contained in the Fama and the Universal Reformation of the World, another Rosicrucian pamphlet which appeared in the same year, was only a subtle allegory of Valentin Andrea, of which afterwards partly deceivers, such as the Jesuits, and partly visionaries made use in order to realize this dream. What, then, was the origin of the name Rose Cross? According to one Rosicrucian tradition, the word rose does not derive from the flower depicted on the Rosicrucian cross, but from the Latin word ros, signifying dew, which was supposed to be the most powerful solvent of gold, whilst crux, the cross, was the chemical hieroglyphic for light. It is said that the Rosicrucians interpreted the initials on the cross, I-N-R-I, by the sentence igni nitrum roris invenitur. Supposing the derivation to be correct, it would be interesting to know whether any connection could be traced between the first appearance of the word rosy cross in the Fama Fraternatus at the date of 1614 and the Kabbalistic treatise of the celebrated rabbi of Prague, Shabbatai Sheftel Horowitz, entitled Shefatal, that is to say the effusion of dew, which appeared in 1612. Although this book has often been reprinted, no copy is to be found in the British Museum, so I am unable to pursue this line of inquiry further. A simpler explanation may be that the rosy cross derived from the red cross of the Templars. Mirabeau, who as a Freemason and an Illuminatus was in a position to discover many facts about the secret societies of Germany during his stay in the country, definitely asserted that the rose qua maisons of the 17th century were only the ancient order of the Templars secretly perpetuated. Le Coutil de Cantelot is more explicit. In France, the Knights Templar, who left the order, henceforth hidden, and so to speak unknown, formed the order of the Flaming Star and of the Rose Croix, which in the 15th century spread itself in Bohemia and Silesia. Every grand officer of these orders had all his life to wear the Red Cross and to repeat every day the prayer of St. Bernard. Eckhart states that the ritual, symbols, and names of the Rose Croix were borrowed from the Templars, and that the order was divided into seven degrees, according to the seven days of creation at the same time signifying that their principal aim was that of the mysterious, the investigation of being and of the forces of nature. The Rosicrucian Kenneth Mackenzie in his Masonic Cyclopedia appears to suggest the same possibility of Templar origin. Under the heading of Rosicrucians, he refers enigmatically to an invisible fraternity that has existed from very ancient times as early as the days of the Crusades, bound by solemn obligations of impenetrable secrecy, and joining together in work for humanity and to glorify the good. At various periods of history, this body has emerged into a sort of temporary light. But its true name has never transpired and is only known to the innermost adepts and rulers of the society. The Rosicrucians of the 16th century finally disappeared and re-entered this invisible fraternity from which they had presumably emerged. Whether any such body really existed, or whether the above account is simply an attempt at mystification, devised to excite curiosity, the incredulous may question. The writer here observes that it would be indiscreet to say more, 
But elsewhere, he throws out a hint that may have some bearing on the matter. For in his article on the Templars, he says that after the suppression of the order, it was revived in a more secret form and subsists to the present day. This would exactly accord with Mirabeau's statement that the Rosicrucians were only the order of the Templars secretly perpetuated. Moreover, as we shall see later, according to a legend preserved by the Royal Order of Scotland, the degree of the Rosy Cross had been instituted by that order in conjunction with the Templars in 1314. And it would certainly be a remarkable coincidence that a man bearing the name of Rosencruz should happen to have inaugurated a society founded, like the Templars, on Eastern secret doctrines during the course of the same century, without any connection existing between the two. I would suggest, then, that the Christian Rosencruz was a purely mythical personage, and that the whole legend concerning his travels was invented, to disguise the real sources whence the Rosicrucians derived their system, which would appear to have been a compound of ancient esoteric doctrines, of Arabian and Syrian magic, and of Jewish Kabbalism, partly inherited from the Templars, but reinforced by direct contact with Kabbalistic Jews in Germany. The Rose Croix, says Mirabeau, were a mystical, Kabbalistic, theological, and magical sect, and Rosicrucianism thus became in the 17th century the generic title by which everything in the nature of Kabbalism, Theosophy, Alchemy, Astrology, and Mysticism was designated. For this reason, it has been said that they cannot be regarded as the descendants of the Templars. Mr. Waite, in referring to the alleged connection between the Templars and the Brethren of the Rosy Cross, observes, The Templars were not alchemists. They had no scientific pretensions, and their secret, so far as it can be ascertained, was a religious secret of an anti-Christian kind. The Rosicrucians, on the other hand, were preeminently a learned society, and they were also a Christian sect. The fact that the Templars do not appear to have practiced alchemy is besides the point. It is not pretended that the Rosicrucians followed the Templars in every particular, but that they were the inheritors of a secret tradition passed on to them by the earlier order. Moreover, that they were a learned society, or even a society at all, is not at all certain. For they would appear to have possessed no organization like the Templars or the Freemasons, but to have consisted rather of isolated occultists bound together by some tie of secret knowledge concerning natural phenomena. This secrecy was no doubt necessary at a period when scientific research was liable to be regarded as sorcery, but whether the Rosicrucians really accomplished anything is extremely doubtful. They are said to have been alchemists, but did they ever succeed in transmuting metals? They are described as learned, yet do the pamphlets emanating from the fraternity betray any proof of superior knowledge? The chemical marriage of Christian Rosencruz, which appeared in 1616, certainly appears to be the purest nonsense, magical imagings of the most puerile kind, and Mr. Waite himself observes that the publication of the Fama and the Confessio Fraternitalis will not add new luster to the Rosicrucian reputations. We are accustomed to regard the adepts of the Rosy Cross as beings of sublime elevation and preternatural physical powers, masters of nature, monarchs of the intellectual world. But here, in their own acknowledged manifestos, they avow themselves a mere theosophical offshoot of the Lutheran heresy, acknowledging the spiritual supremacy of a temporal prince and calling the Pope Antichrist. We find them intemperate in their language, rabid in their religious prejudices, and instead of towering giant-like above the intellectual average of their age, we see them buffeted by the same passions and identified with all the opinions of the men by whom they were environed. The voice which addresses us behind the mystical mask of the Rose Croix does not come from an intellectual throne. So much for the Rosicrucians as a learned society. What then of their claim to be a Christian body? The Rosicrucian student of the Kabbalah, Julius Sperber, in his Echo of the Divinely Illuminated Fraternity of the Admirable Order of the R.C., 1615, has indicated the place assigned to Christ by the Rosicrucians. In De Quincey's words, Having maintained the probability of the Rosicrucian pretensions on the ground that such magnalia d had from the creation downwards been confided to the keeping of a few individuals, 
agreeably to which he affirms that Adam was the first Rosicrucian of the Old Testament and Simeon the last, he goes on to ask whether the gospel put an end to the secret tradition. By no means, he answers. Christ established a new college of magic among his disciples, and the greater mysteries were revealed to St. John and St. Paul. John Yarker, quoting this passage, adds, This brother Findel points out was a claim of the Carpocratian Gnostics. It was also, as we have seen, a part of the Johannite tradition, which is said to have been imparted to the Templars. We shall find the same idea of Christ as an initiate running through all the secret societies up to the present day. These doctrines not unnaturally brought on the Rosicrucians the suspicion of being an anti-Christian body. The writer of a contemporary pamphlet published in 1624 declares that this fraternity is a stratagem of the Jews and Kabbalistic Hebrews, in whose philosophy, says Pique de la Merandol, all things are as if hidden in the majesty of truth or as in very sacred mysteries. Another work, Examination of the Unknown and Novel Kabbalah of the Brethren of the Rose Cross, agrees with the assertion that the chief of this execrable college is Satan that its first rule is denial of God, blasphemy against the most simple and undivided trinity, trampling on the mysteries of the redemption, spitting in the face of the mother of God and all her saints. The sect is further accused of compacts with the devil, sacrificing of children, of cherishing toads, making poisonous powders, dancing with fiends, etc. Now, although all this would appear to be quite incompatible with the character of the Rosicrucians as far as it is known, we have already seen that the practices here described were by no means imaginary. In the same 17th century, when the fame of the Rosicrucians was first noised abroad, black magic was still, as in the days of Gilles de Ray, a horrible reality. Not only in France, but in England, Scotland, and Germany, where sorcerers of both sexes were continually put to death. However much we deplore the methods employed against these people or question the supernatural origin of their cult, it would be idle to deny that the cult itself existed. Moreover, towards the end of the century, it assumed in France a very tangible form in the series of mysterious dramas known as the Affaire de Poisons, of which the first act took place in 1666, when the celebrated Marquis de Brinvilliers embarked on her amazing career of crime in collaboration with her lover, St. Croix. This extraordinary woman, who for ten years made a hobby of trying the effects of various slow poisons on her nearest relations, thereby causing the death of her father and brothers, might appear to have been merely an isolated criminal of the abnormal type. But for the sequel to her exploits in the epidemic of poisoning which followed and during twenty years kept Paris in a state of terror, the investigations of the police finally led to the discovery of a whole band of magicians and alchemists, a vast ramification of malefactors covering all France, who specialized in the art of poisoning without fear of detection. Concerning all these sorcerers, alchemists, compounders of magical powders and filters, frightful rumors circulated, packs with the devil were talked of, sacrifices of newborn babies, incantations, sacrilegious masses, and other practices as disquieting as they were lugubrious. Even the king's mistress, Madame de Montespan, is said to have had recourse to black masses in order to retain the royal favor through the agency of the celebrated sorceress, Le Voisin, with whom she was later implicated in an accusation of having attempted the life of the king. All the extraordinary details of these events have been recently described in the book of Madame Latour, where the intimate connection between the poisoners and the magicians is shown. In the opinion of contemporaries, these were not isolated individuals. Their methods were too certain, their execution of crime too skillful, and too easy for them not to have belonged, either directly or indirectly to a whole organization of criminals who prepared the way and studied the method of giving to crime the appearance of illness, of forming, in a word, a school. The author of the work here quoted draws an interesting parallel between this organization and the modern traffic in cocaine, and goes on to describe the three degrees into which it was divided. Firstly, the heads, cultivated and intelligent men, who understood chemistry, physics, and nearly all useful sciences, 
invisible counselors, but supreme, without whom the sorcerers and diviners would have been powerless. Secondly, the visible magicians employing mysterious processes, complicated rites, and terrifying ceremonies. And thirdly, the crowd of nobles and plebeians who flocked to the doors of the sorcerers and filled their pockets in return for magical potions, filters, and in certain cases, insidious poisons. Thus, la voisine must be placed in the second category. In spite of her luxury, her profits, and her fame, she is only a subaltern agent in this vast organization of criminals. She depends entirely for her great enterprises on the intellectual chiefs of the corporation. Who were these intellectual chiefs? The man who first initiated Madame de Brinvilliers, lover Saint Croix, into the art of poisoning was an Italian named Elixi or Egidi. But the real initiate, from whom Egidi and another Italian poisoner had learnt their secrets, is said to have been Glazer, variously described as a German or a Swiss chemist, who followed the principles of Paracelsus and occupied the post of physician to the king and the Duke Orleans. This man, about whose history little is known, might thus have been a kind of Rosicrucian. For since, as has been said, the intellectual chiefs from whom the poisoners derived their inspiration were men versed in chemistry, in science, in physics, and in the treatment of diseases, and since, further, they included alchemists and people professing to be in possession of the philosopher's stone, their resemblance with the Rosicrucians is at once apparent. Indeed, in turning back to the branches of magic enumerated by the Rosicrucian Robert Flood, we find not only natural magic, that most occult and secret department of physics by which the mystical properties of natural substances are extracted, but also vinific magic, which is familiar with potions, filters, and with various preparations of poisons. The art of poisoning was therefore known to the Rosicrucians, and although there is no reason to suppose it was ever practiced by the heads of the fraternity, it is possible that the inspirers of the poisoners may have been perverted Rosicrucians, that is to say, students of these portions of the Kabbalah relating to magic both of the necromantic and benefic varieties, who turned the scientific knowledge with the fraternity of the rosy cross used for healing to a precisely opposite and deadly purpose. This would explain the fact that contemporaries like the author of The Examination of the Unknown and Novel Kabbalah of the Brethren of the Rosy Cross should identify these brethren with magicians and believe them to be guilty of practices deriving from the same source as Rosicrucian knowledge, the Kabbalah of the Jews. Their modern admirers would, of course, declare that they were the poles asunder, the difference between being black and white magic. Hoistmans, however, scoffs at this distinction and says that the use of the term white magic was a ruse of the rose qua. But of the real doctrines of the Rosicrucians, no one can speak with certainty. The whole story of the fraternity is wrapped in mystery. Mystery was avowedly the essence of their system. Their identity, their aims, their doctrines are said to have been kept a profound secret from the world. Indeed, it is said that no real Rosicrucian ever allowed himself to be known as such. As a result of this systematic method of concealment, Skeptics, on the one hand, have declared the Rosicrucians to have been charlatans and impostors, or have denied their very existence, whilst, on the other hand, romancers have exalted them as depositaries of supernatural wisdom. The question is further obscured by the fact that most accounts of the fraternity, as, for example, those of Eliphas Levi, Hargrave Jennings, Kenneth Mackenzie, Mr. A. E. Waite, Dr. Wynne Westcott, and Mr. Cadbury Jones, are the work of men claiming or believing themselves to be initiated into Rosicrucianism or other occult systems of a kindred nature, and as such in possession of peculiar and exclusive knowledge. This pretension may at once be dismissed as an absurdity. Nothing is easier than for anyone to make a compound out of Jewish Kabbalism and Eastern Theosophy and to label it Rosicrucianism but no proof whatever exists of any affiliation between the self-styled Rosicrucians of today and the 17th century Brothers of the Rosy Cross. In spite of Mr. Wake's claim, the real history of the Rosicrucians still remains to be written at any rate in the English language.
The book he has published under the name is merely a superficial study of the question largely composed of reprints of Rosicrucian pamphlets accessible to any student. Mr. Wigston and Mr. Pott merely echo Mr. Waite. Thus, everything that has been published hitherto consists in the repetition of Rosicrucian legends or in unsubstantiated theorizings on their doctrines. What we need are facts. We want to know who were the early Rosicrucians, when the fraternity originated, and what were its real aims. These researches must be made not by an occultist weaving his own theories into the subject, but by a historian free from any prejudices for or against the order, capable of weighing evidence and bringing a judicial mind to bear on the material to be found in the libraries of the continent, notably the Bibliothèque de l'Arsenal of Paris. Such a work would be a valuable contribution to the history of secret societies in our country. But if the continental brethren of the Rose Croix form a shadowy group of invisibles whose identity yet remains a mystery, the English adepts of the order stand forth in the light of day as philosophers well known in their age and country. That Francis Bacon was initiated into Rosicrucianism is now recognized by Freemasons. But a more definite link with the Rosicrucians of the continent was Robert Flood, who, after traveling for six years in France, Germany, Italy, and Spain, where he formed connections with Jewish Kabbalists, was visited by the German Jew Rosicrucian Michael Mayer, doctor to the Emperor Rudolf, by whom he appears to have been initiated into further mysteries. In 1616, Flood published his Tractatus Apologeticus, defending the Rosicrucians against the charges of detestable magic and diabolical superstition brought against them by Libavius. Twelve years later, Flood was attacked by Father Mersin, to whom a reply was made by Flood or by a friend of Flood's, containing a further defense of the order. The book, says Mr. Waite, treats of the noble art of magic, the foundation and nature of the Kabbalah, the essence of veritable alchemy and of the causa fratrum rosae crucis. It identifies the palace or home of the Rosicrucians with the spiritual house of wisdom. In further works by English writers, the eastern origin of the fraternity is insisted on. Thus, Thomas Vaughan, known as Eugenius Philolathes, writing in praise of the Rosicrucians in 1652, says, that their knowledge at first was not purchased by their own disquisitions, for they received it from the Arabians amongst whom it remained as the monument and legacy of the children of the East. Nor is this at all improbable, for the Eastern countries have been always famous for magical and secret societies. Another apologist to the Rosicrucians, John Hayden, who traveled in Egypt, Persia, and Arabia, is described by contemporaries having been in many strange places among the Rosicrucians and at their castles, holy houses, temples, sepulchres, sacrifices, Hayden, himself, whilst declaring that he is not a Rosicrucian, says that he knows members of the fraternity and its secrets, that they are sons of Moses, and that the rosy Crucian physic or medicine I happily and unexpectedly alight upon in Arabia. These references to castles, temples, sacrifices encountered in Egypt, Persia, and Arabia inevitably recall memories of both Templars and Ismalis. Is there no connection between the invisible mountains of the Brethren, referred to elsewhere by Hayden, and the mountains of the Assassins and the Freemasons? Between the scriptural House of Wisdom and the Dar ul Hikmat, or Grand Lodge of Cairo, the model for Western Masonic lodges? It is as the precursors of the crisis which arose in 1717 that the English Rosicrucians of the 17th century are of supreme importance. No longer need we concern ourselves with shadowy brethren laying dubious claim to supernatural wisdom, but with a concrete association of professed initiates proclaiming their existence to the world under the name of Freemasonry. Chapter 5. Origins of Freemasonry The origin of Freemasonry, says a Masonic writer of the 18th century, is known to Freemasons alone. If this was once the case, it is so no longer, for although the question would certainly appear to be one which the initiated should be most qualified to speak, 
The fact is that no official theory on the origin of Freemasonry exists. The great mass of the Freemasons do not know or care to know anything about the history of their order, whilst Masonic authorities are entirely disagreed on the matter. Dr. Mackey admits that the origin and source whence first sprang the institution of Freemasonry has given rise to more difference of opinion and discussions among Masonic scholars than any other topic in the literature of the institution. Nor is this ignorance maintained merely in books for the general public, since in those specially addressed to the craft and at discussions in lodges, the same diversity of opinion prevails, and no decisive conclusions appear to be reached. Thus, Mr. Albert Churchward, a Freemason of the 30th degree, who deplores the small amount of interest taken in this matter by Masons in general, observes, Hitherto there have been so many contradictory opinions and theories in the attempt to supply the origin and the reason whence, where, and why the Brotherhood of Freemasonry came into existence, and all the different parts and various rituals of the different degrees. All that has been written on this has hitherto been theories without any facts for their foundation. In the absence, therefore, of any origin universally recognized by the craft, it is surely open to the lay mind to speculate on the matter and to draw conclusions from history, as to which of the many explanations put forward seems to supply the key to the mystery. According to the Royal Masonic Cyclopedia, no less than twelve theories have been advanced as to the origins of the order, namely, that Masonry derived, one, from the patriarchs, two, from the mysteries of the pagans, three, from the construction of Solomon's Temple, four, from the Crusades, five, from the Knights Templar, six, from the Roman Collegia of Artificers, seven, from the Operative Masons of the Middle Ages, eight, from the Rosicrucians of the 16th century, nine, from Oliver Cromwell, ten, from Prince Charles Stuart for political purposes, eleven, from Sir Christopher Wren at the building of St. Paul's, and twelve, from the Dr. Desaguliers and his friends in 1717. This enumeration is, however, misleading, for it implies that in one of these various theories the true origin of Freemasonry may be found. In reality, modern Freemasonry is a dual system, a blend of two distinct traditions, of operative Masonry, that is to say the actual art of building, and of speculative theory on the great truths of life and death. As a well-known Freemason, the Count Goblet d'Alviella has expressed it, speculative masonry, that is to say the dual system we now know as Freemasonry, is the legitimate offspring of a fruitful union between the professional guild of medieval masons and of a secret group of philosophical adepts, the first having furnished the form and the second the spirit. In studying the origins of the present system, we have therefore one, to examine separately the history of each of these two traditions, and two, to discover their point of junction. Operative Masonry Beginning with the first two of these traditions, we find that guilds of working masons existed in very ancient times, without going back as far as ancient Egypt or Greece, which would be beyond the scope of the present work, the course of these associations may be traced throughout the history of Western Europe from the beginning of the Christian era. According to certain Masonic writers, the Druids originally came from Egypt and brought with them traditions relating to the art of building. The Chaldees, who later on established schools and colleges in this country for the teaching of arts and sciences and handicrafts, are said to have derived from the Druids. But a more probable source of inspiration in the art of building are the Romans, who established the famous Collegia of Architects, referred to in the list of alternative theories given in the Masonic Cyclopedia. Advocates of the Roman Collegia origin of Freemasonry might be right as far as operative masonry is concerned, for it is to the period following on the Roman occupation of Britain that our Masonic guilds can with the greatest degree of certainty be traced. Owing to the importance the art of building now acquired, it is said that many distinguished men, such as St. Alban, King Alfred, King Edwin, and King Athelstan, were numbered amongst its patrons, so that in time the guilds came to occupy the position of privileged bodies and were known as free corporations. 
Further, that York was the first Masonic center in England, largely under the control of the Chaldees, who at the same period exercised much influence over the Masonic Collegia in Scotland at Kilwinning, Melrose, and Aberdeen. But it must be remembered that all this is speculation. No documentary evidence has ever been produced to prove the existence of Masonic guilds before the famous York chapter of A.D. 936. And even the date of this document is doubtful. Only with the period of Gothic architecture do we reach firm ground. That guilds of working masons known in France as Compagnonages and in Germany as Steinmetzen did then form close corporations and possibly possess secrets connected with their profession is more than probable. That, in consequence of their skill in building the magnificent cathedrals of this period, they now came to occupy a privileged position seems fairly certain. The Abbey Grandidier, writing from Strasbourg in 1778, traces the whole system of Freemasonry from these German guilds. This much-vaunted society of Freemasons is nothing but a servile imitation of an ancient and useful confrérie of real Masons, whose headquarters were formerly at Strasbourg, and of which the Constitution was confirmed by the Emperor Maximilian in 1498. As far as it is possible to discover from the scanty documentary evidence that the 14th, 15th, and 16th century provides, the same privileges appear to have been accorded to the guilds of working masons in England and Scotland, which, although presided over by powerful nobles and apparently on occasion admitting members from outside the craft, remained essentially operative bodies. Nevertheless, we find the assemblies of masons suppressed by act of parliament in the beginning of the reign of Henry VI, and later on an armed force sent by Queen Elizabeth to break up the annual Grand Lodge at York. It is possible that the fraternity, merely by the secrecy with which it was surrounded, excited the suspicions of authority, for nothing could be more law-abiding than its published statutes. Masons were to be true men to God and the Holy Church, also to the masters that they served. They were to be honest in the manner of life and to do no villainy whereby the craft or the science may be slandered. Yet the 17th century writer Plot, in his Natural History of Staffordshire, expresses some suspicion with regard to the secrets of Freemasonry. That these could not be merely trade secrets relating to the art of building, but that already some speculative element had been introduced to the lodges, seems the more probable, from the fact that by the middle of the 17th century, not only noble patrons headed the craft, but ordinary gentlemen, entirely unconnected with building or received into the fraternity. The well-known entry of the Diary of Elias Ashmole under the date of October 16, 1646, clearly proves this fact. I was made a Freemason at Warrington in Lancashire, with Colonel Henry Mainwaring of Cartacham in Cheshire. The names of those that were then of the lodge, Mr. Rich, Pankett, Warden, Mr. James Collier, Mr. Rich, Sankey, Henry Littler, John Ellum, Rich Ellum, and Hugh Brewer. It is now ascertained, says Yarker, that the majority of the members present were not operative Masons. Again, in 1682, Ashmole relates that he attended a meeting held at Mason Hall in London, where with a few number of other gentlemen, he was admitted into the fellowship of the Freemasons, that is to say, into the second degree. We have then clear proof that already in the 17th century, Freemasonry had ceased to be an association composed exclusively of men concerned with building. Although eminent architects ranked high in the order, Inigo Jones is said to have been Grand Master under James I, and Sir Christopher Wren to have occupied the same position from about 1685 to 1702. But it was not until 1703 that the Lodge of St. Paul in London officially announced that the privileges of masonry should no longer be restrictive to operative masons, but extended to men of various professions, provided they were regularly approved and initiated into this order. This was followed in 1717 by the great coup d'etat, when Grand Lodge was founded, and speculative masonry, which we now know as Freemasonry, was established on a settled basis with a ritual, rules, and constitution, drawn up in due form. It is at this important date that the official history of Freemasonry begins. 
But before pursuing the course of the order through what is known as the Grand Lodge era, it is necessary to go back and inquire into the origins of the philosophy that was now combined with the system of operative masonry. This is the point on which opinions are divided and to which the various theories summarized in the Masonic Cyclopedia relate. Let us examine each of these in turn. Speculative Masonry According to certain skeptics concerning the mysteries of Freemasonry, the system inaugurated in 1717 had no existence before that date, but was devised, promulgated, and palmed upon the world by Dr. Desaguyers, Dr. Anderson, and others, and who founded the Grand Lodge of England. Mr. Patton, in an admirable little pamphlet, has shown the futility of this contention and also the injustice of representing the founders of Grand Lodge as perpetuating so gross a deception. This 1717 theory ascribes to men of the highest character the invention of a system of mere imposture. It was brought forward with pretensions which its framers knew to be false pretensions of high antiquity, whereas it had newly been invented in their studies. Is this likely? Or is it reasonable to ascribe such conduct to honorable men without even assigning a probable motive for it? We have indeed only to study Masonic ritual, which is open to everyone to read, in order to arrive at the same conclusion, that there could be no motive for this imposture, and further, that these two clergymen cannot be supposed to have evolved the whole thing out of their heads. Obviously, some movement of a kindred nature must have led to this crisis. And since Elias Ashmole's diary clearly proves that a ceremony of Masonic initiation had existed in the preceding century, it is surely only reasonable to conclude that Dr. Anderson and Desaguyers revised but did not originate the ritual and constitutions drawn up by them. Now, although the ritual of Freemasonry is couched in modern and by no means classical English, the ideas running through it certainly bear traces of extreme antiquity. The central idea of Freemasonry concerning a loss which was befallen man and the hope of its ultimate recovery is, in fact, no other than the ancient secret tradition described in the first chapter of this book. Certain Masonic writers indeed ascribe to Freemasonry precisely the same genealogy as that of the early Kabbalah, declaring that it descended from Adam and the first patriarchs of the human race. And thence, through groups of wise men amongst the Egyptians, Chaldeans, Persians, and Greeks, Mr. Albert Churchward insists particularly on the Egyptian origin of the speculative element in Freemasonry. Brother Gould and other Freemasons will never understand the meaning and origin of our sacred tenets till they have studied and unlocked the mysteries of the past. This study will then reveal the fact that the Druids, the Gymnosophists of India, the Magi of Persia, and the Chaldeans of Assyria had all the same religious rites and ceremonies as practiced by their priests who were initiated to their order, and that these were solemnly sworn to keep the doctrines a profound secret from the rest of mankind. All these flowed from one source, Egypt. Mr. Churchward further quotes the speech of the Reverend Dr. William Dodd at the opening of a Masonic temple in 1794, who traced Freemasonry from the first astronomers on the plains of Chaldea, the wise and mystic kings and priests of Egypt, the sages of Greece and philosophers of Rome, etc. But how did these traditions descend to the Masons of the West? According to a large body of Masonic opinion in this country, which recognizes only a single source of inspiration to the system we now know as Freemasonry, the speculative as well as the operative traditions of the order descended from the building guilds and were imported to England by means of the Roman Collegia. Mr. Churchward, however, strongly dissents from this view. In the new and revised edition of the Perfect Ceremonies, according to R. E. Working, a theory is given that Freemasonry originated from certain guilds of workmen, which are well known in history as the Roman College of Artificers. There is no foundation of fact for such a theory. Freemasonry is now and always was an eschatology, as may be proved by the whole of our signs, symbols, and words, and our rituals. But what Mr. Churchward fails to explain is how this eschatology reached the working Masons. 
Moreover, why, if as he asserts it derived from Egypt, Assyria, India, and Persia, Freemasonry no longer bears the stamp of these countries? For although vestiges of Sabiism may be found in the decoration of the lodges and brief references to the mysteries of Egypt and Phoenicia, to the secret teaching of Pythagoras, to Euclid, and to Plato in the ritual and instructions of the craft degrees. Nevertheless, the form in which the ancient tradition is clothed, the phraseology and passwords employed, are neither Egyptian, Chaldean, Greek, nor Persian, but Judaic. Thus, although some portion of the ancient secret tradition may have been penetrated to Great Britain through the Druids or the Romans, versed in the lore of Greece and Egypt, another channel for its introduction was clearly the Kabbalah of the Jews. Certain Masonic writers recognize this double tradition, the one descending from Egypt, Chaldea, and Greece, the other from the Israelites, and assert that it is from the latter source their system is derived. For after tracing its origin from Adam, Noah, Enoch, and Abraham, they proceed to show its line of descent through Moses, David, and Solomon. Descent from Solomon is in fact officially recognized by the craft and forms a part of the instructions to candidates for initiation into the first degree. But as we have already seen, this is the precise genealogy attributed to the Kabbalah by the Jews. Moreover, modern Freemasonry is entirely built up on the Solomonic, or rather the Hiramic legend. For the sake of readers unfamiliar with the ritual of Freemasonry, a brief resume of this grand legend must be given here. Solomon, when building the temple, employed the services of a certain artificer in brass named Hiram, the son of a widow of the tribe of Naphtali, who was sent to him by Hiram, king of Tyre. So much we know from the Book of Kings, but the Masonic legend goes on to relate that Hiram, the widow's son, referred to as Hiram Abiff, and described as the master builder, met with an untimely end. For the purpose of preserving order, the Masons working on the temple were divided into three classes, entered apprentices, fellow crafts, and master Masons, the first two distinguished by different passwords and grips and paid at different rates of wages, the last consisting only of three persons. Solomon himself, Hiram, king of Tyre, who had provided him with wood and precious stones, and Hiram Abiff. Now before the completion of the temple, fifteen of the fellow crafts conspired together to find out the secrets of the master masons, and resolved to waylay Hiram Abiff at the door of the temple. At the last moment, twelve of the fifteen drew back, but the remaining three carried out the fell design and after threatening Hiram in vain in order to obtain the secrets, killed him with three blows on the head, delivered by each in turn. Then they conveyed the body away and buried it on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. Solomon, informed of the disappearance of the master builder, sent out fifteen fellow crafts to seek for him. Five of these, having arrived at the mountain, noticed a place where the earth had been disturbed, and there discovered the body of Hiram. Leaving a branch of acacia to mark the spot, they returned with their story to Solomon, who ordered them to go and exhume the body, an order that was immediately carried out. The murder and exhumation, or raising of Hiram, accompanied by extraordinary lamentations, form the climax of craft masonry. And when it is remembered that in all probability no such tragedy ever took place, that possibly no one known as Hiram Abiff ever existed, the whole story can only be regarded as the survival of some ancient cult, relating not to an actual event but to an esoteric doctrine. A legend and a ceremony of this kind is indeed to be found in many earlier mythologies. The story of the murder of Hiram has been foreshadowed by the Egyptian legend of the murder of Osiris and the quest for his body by Isis. Whilst the lamentations around the tomb of Hiram had a counterpart in the mourning ceremonies for Osiris and Adonis, both, like Hiram, subsequently raised, and later on in that which took place around the catafalque of Manes, who, like Hiram, was barbarously put to death and is said to have been known to the Manichaeans as the son of the widow. But in the form given to it by Freemasonry, the legend is purely Judaic, and would therefore appear to have been derived from the Judaic version of the ancient tradition. The pillars of the temple, Jachin and Boaz, which play so important a part in craft masonry, are symbols which occur in the Jewish Kabbalah. 
where they are described as two of the ten Sephiroths. A writer of the 18th century referring to five curiosities he has discovered in Scotland describes one as the Mason word, which though some may make a mystery of it, I will not conceal a little of what I know. It is like a rabbinical tradition in way of comment on Yachin and Boaz, the two pillars erected in Solomon's temple with the addition delivered from hand to hand, by which they know and become familiar one with another. This is precisely the system by which the Kabbalah was handed down amongst the Jews. The Jewish encyclopedia lends color to the theory of Kabbalistic transmission by suggesting that the story of Hiram may possibly trace back to the rabbinic legend concerning the Temple of Solomon, that while all the workmen were killed so that they should not build another temple devoted to idolatry, Hiram himself was raised to heaven like Enoch. How did this rabbinic legend find its way into Freemasonry? Advocates of the Roman Collegia theory explain it in the following manner. After the building of the Temple of Solomon, the Masons who had been engaged in the work were dispersed and a number made their way to Europe, some to Marseille, some perhaps to Rome, where they may have introduced Judaic legends to the Collegia, which then passed on to the Comassini masters of the 7th century, and from these to the medieval working guilds of England, France, and Germany. It is said that during the Middle Ages, a story concerning the Temple of Solomon was current amongst the Campanages of France. In one of these groups, known as the Children of Solomon, the legend of Hiram appears to have existed much in its present form. According to another group, the victim of the murder was not Hiram Abiff, but one of his companions named Matra Jacques, who, whilst engaged with Hiram on the construction of the temple, met his death at the hands of five wicked fellow crafts, instigated by a six, the Pere Subis. But the date in which this legend originated is unknown. Clavel thinks that the Hebraic mysteries existed as early as the Roman Collegia, which he describes as largely Judaized. Yarker expresses precisely the opposite view, it is not so difficult to connect Freemasonry with the Collegia. The difficulty lies in attributing Jewish traditions to the Collegia. And we say on the evidence of the oldest charges that such traditions had no existence in Saxon times. Again, so far as this country is concerned, we know nothing from documents of a Masonry dating from Solomon's Temple until after the Crusades, when the Constitution believed to have been sanctioned by King Athelstan gradually underwent a change. In a discussion that took place recently at the Kator Coronati Lodge, the Hiramic legend could only be traced back, and then without absolute certainty, to the 14th century, which would coincide with the date indicated by Yarker. Up to this period, the lore of the Masonic guilds appears to have contained only the exoteric doctrines of Egypt and Greece, which may have reached them through the Roman Collegia, whilst the traditions of Masonry are traced from Adam, Jabal, Tubal Cain, and from Nimrod and the Tower of Babel, with Hermes and Pythagoras as their more immediate progenitors. These doctrines were evidently in the main geometrical or technical, and in no sense Kabbalistic. There is therefore some justification for Eckhart's statement that the Judeo-Christian mysteries were not yet introduced into the Masonic corporations. Nowhere can we find the least trace of them. Nowhere do we find any classification, not even that of masters, fellow crafts, and apprentices. We observe no symbol of the Temple of Solomon. All their symbolism relates to Masonic labors and to a few philosophical maxims of morality. The date at which Eckhart, like Yarker, places the introduction of these Judaic elements is in the time of the Crusades. But whilst recognizing that modern craft masonry is largely founded on the Kabbalah, it is necessary to distinguish between the different Kabbalahs. For by this date, no less than three Kabbalahs appear to have existed. First, the ancient secret tradition of the patriarchs, handed down from the Egyptians through the Greeks and Romans, and possibly through the Roman Collegia to the craft masons of Britain. Secondly, the Jewish version of this tradition, the first Kabbalah of the Jews, in no way incompatible with Christianity descended from Moses, David, and Solomon to the Essenes and the more enlightened Jews, and thirdly, the perverted Kabbalah, mingled by the rabbis with magic, barbaric superstitions, and after the death of Christ, 
with anti-Christian legends. Whatever Kabbalistic elements were introduced into craft masonry at the time of the Crusades appear to have belonged to the second of these traditions, the unperverted Kabbalah of the Jews, known to the Essenes. There are, in fact, striking resemblances between Freemasonry and Essenism. Degrees of initiation, oaths of secrecy, the wearing of the apron, and certain Masonic signs, whilst to the sabbiest traditions of the Essenes may perhaps be traced the solar and stellar symbolism of the lodges. The Hiramic legend may have belonged to the same tradition. The Templar Tradition If then no documentary evidence can be brought forward to show that either the Solomonic legend or any traces of Judaic symbolism and traditions existed either in the monuments of this period or in the ritual of the Masons before the 14th century, it is surely reasonable to recognize the plausibility of the contention put forward by a great number of Masonic writers, particularly on the continent, that the Judaic elements penetrated into Masonry by means of the Templars. The Templars, as we have already seen, had taken their name from the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem. What then more likely than that during the time they had lived there than they learnt the rabbinical legends connected with the temple? According to George Sand, who was deeply versed in the history of secret societies, the Hiramic legend was adopted by the Templars as symbolic of the destruction of their order. They wept over the impotence in the person of Hiram. The word lost and recovered is their empire. The Freemason Ragon likewise declares over the catastrophe they lamented was the catastrophe that destroyed their order. Further, the Grand Master whose fate they deplored was Jacques de Molay. Here then we have two bodies in France at the same period, the Templars and the Compagnages, both possessing a legend concerning the Temple of Solomon, and both mourning a Maitre Jacques, who had been barbarously put to death. If we accept the possibility that the Hiramic legend existed amongst the Masons before the Crusades, how are we to explain this extraordinary coincidence? It is certainly easier to believe that the Judaic traditions were introduced to the Masons by the Templars, and grafted on the ancient lore that the Masonic guilds had inherited from the Roman Collegia. That some connection existed between the Templars and the working Masons is indicated by the new influence that entered into building at this period. A modern Freemason comparing the beautifully designed and deep cut marks of the true Gothic period, say circa 1150 to 1350, with the careless and roughly executed marks, many of them mere scratches of later periods, points out that the Knights Templar rose and fell with that wonderful development of architecture. The same writer goes on to show that some of the most important Masonic symbols, the equilateral triangle and the Mason square surmounting two pillars, came through the Gothic times. Yarker asserts that the level, the flaming star, and the Tau cross, which have since passed into the symbolism of Freemasonry, may be traced to the Knights Templar, as also the five-pointed star in Salisbury Cathedral, the double triangle in Westminster Abbey, Yachin and Boaz, the circle, and the pentagon in the masonry of the 14th century. Yarker cites later, in 1556, the eye and crescent moon, the three stars and the ladder of five steps, as further evidences of Templar influence. The Templars were large builders, and Jacques de Molay alleged the zeal of his order in decorating churches in the process against him in 1310. Hence, the alleged connection of Templary and Freemasonry is bound to have a substratum of truth. Moreover, according to Masonic tradition, an alliance definitely took place between the Templars and the Masonic guilds at this period. During the proceedings taken against the Order of the Temple in France, it is said that Pierre Dumont and seven other knights escaped to Scotland in the guise of working Masons and landed in the island of Mull. On St. John's Day, 1307, they held their first chapter. Robert Bruce then took them under his protection, and seven years later they fought under the standard of Bannockburn against Edward II, who had suppressed their order in England. After this battle, which took place on St. John the Baptist Day in summer, June 24th, Robert Bruce is said to have instituted the royal order of H.R.M., Herdom, and Knights of the 
R S Y C S, Rosy Cross. These two degrees now constitute the Royal Order of Scotland, and it seems not improbable that, in reality, they were brought to Scotland by the Templars. Thus, according to one of the early writers on Freemasonry, the degree of the Rose Croix originated with the Templars in Palestine as early as 1188. Whilst the eastern origin of the word Herodom, supposed to derive from a mythical mountain on an island south of the Hebrides, where the Chaldees practice their rites, is indicated by another 18th century writer, who traces it to a Jewish source. In this same year of 1314, Robert Bruce is said to have united the Templars and the Royal Order of HRM with the guilds of working masons, who had also fought in his army at the famous Lodge of Kilwinning, founded in 1286, which now added to its name that of Herodom and became the chief seat of the order. Scotland was essentially a home of operative masonry, and in view of the Templars' prowess in the art of building, what more natural than the two bodies should enter into an alliance? Already in England, the temple is said between 1155 and 1199 to have administered the craft. It is thus at Herodom of Kilwinning, the holy house of masonry, Mother Kilwinning, as it is still known to Freemasons, that a speculative element of a fresh kind may have found its way into the lodges. Is it not here, then, that we may see that fruitful union between the professional guild of medieval masons and a secret group of philosophical adepts, alluded to by Count Goblet Daviella and described by Mr. Waite in the following words? The mystery of the building guilds, whatever it may be held to have been, was that of a simple, unpolished, pious, and utilitarian device, and this daughter of nature, in the absence of all invention on her own part, underwent or was coerced into one of the strangest marriages which has been celebrated in occult history. It so happened that her particular form and figure lent itself to such a union, etc. Mr. Waite, with his usual vagueness, does not explain when and where this marriage took place, but the account would certainly apply to the alliance between the Templars and Scottish guilds of working masons, which, as we have seen, is admitted by Masonic authorities and presents exactly the conditions described. The Templars being peculiarly fitted by their initiation into the legend concerning the building of the Temple of Solomon, to cooperate with the Masons, and the Masons being prepared by their partial initiation into ancient mysteries to receive the fresh influx of Eastern tradition from the Templars. A further indication of the Templar influence in craft masonry is the system of degrees and initiations. The names of entered apprentice, fellow craft, and master mason are said to have derived from Scotland, and the analogy between these and the degrees of the assassins has already been shown. Indeed, the resemblance between this outer organization of Freemasonry and the system of the Ismalis is shown by many writers. Thus, Dr. Bussell observes no doubt, together with some knowledge of geometry regarded as an esoteric trade secret, many symbols today current did pass down from very primitive times. But a more certain model was the Grand Lodge of the Ismalis in Cairo, that is to say the Dar ul Hikmat. Syed Amir Ali also expresses the opinion that Macrisi's account of the different degrees of initiation adopted in this lodge forms an invaluable record of Freemasonry. In fact, the lodge at Cairo became the model of all the lodges created afterwards in Christendom. Mr. Bernard Springett, a Freemason, quoting this passage adds, In this last assertion I am myself greatly in agreement. It is surely, therefore, legitimate to surmise that this system penetrated to craft masonry through the Templars whose connection with the assassins, offshoot of the Dar ul Hikmat, was a matter of common knowledge. The question of the Templar succession in Freemasonry forms perhaps the most controversial point in the whole history of the Roman Collegia theory, continental Masons more generally accepting it and even glorifying it. Mackey, in his lexicon of Freemasonry, thus sums up the matter. The connection between the Knights Templar and the Freemasons has been repeatedly asserted by the enemies of both institutions, and has often been admitted by their friends. Laurie, on this subject, holds the following language. 
We know that the Knights Templar not only possessed the mysteries, but performed the ceremonies and inculcated the duties of Freemasonry. And he attributes the dissolution of the order to the discovery of their being Freemasons and their assembling in secret to practice the rites of the order. This explains why Freemasons have always shown indulgence to the Templars. It was above all Freemasonry, says Findel, which, because it falsely held itself to be a daughter of Templarism, took the greatest pains to represent the order of the Templars as innocent and therefore free from all mystery. For this purpose, not only legends, but unhistorical facts were brought forward, but maneuvers were also resorted to in order to suppress the truth. The Masonic reverers of the Temple Order brought up the whole edition of the Actus du Process of Moldenhauer, because this showed the guilt of the Order. Only a few copies reached the booksellers. Already several decades before, the Freemasons, in their unhistorical efforts, had been guilty of real forgery. Dupuy had published his History of the Trial of the Templars as early as 1654 in Paris, for which he had made use of the original of the Act du Process, according to which the guilt of the Order leaves no room for doubt. But when in the middle of the 18th century several branches of Freemasonry wished to recall the Templar Order into being, the work of Dupuy was naturally very displeasing. It had already been current amongst the public for a hundred years, so it could no longer be bought, therefore they falsified it. Accordingly, in 1751, a reprint of Dupuy's work appeared with the addition of a number of notes and remarks, and mutilated in such a way as to prove not the guilt, but the innocence of the Templars. Now, although British masonry has played no part in these intrigues, the question of the Templar succession has been very inadequately dealt with by the Masonic writers of our country. As a rule, they have adopted one of two courses. Either they have persistently denied connection with the Templars, or they have represented them as a blameless and cruelly maligned order. But, in reality, neither of these expedients is necessary to save the honor of British Masonry. For not even the bitterest enemy of Masonry has ever suggested that British Masons have adopted any portion of the Templar heresy. The knights who fled to Scotland may have been perfectly innocent of the charges brought against their order. Indeed, there is a good reason to believe that this was the case. Thus, the Manuel de Chevalier de l'Ordre du Temple relates the incident in the following manner. After the death of Jacques du Molay, some Scottish Templars, having become apostates at the instigation of Robert Bruce, ranged themselves under the banners of a new order, instituted by this prince, and in which the receptions were based on those of the Order of the Temple. It is there that we must seek the origin of Scottish masonry, and even that of the other Masonic rites. The Scottish Templars were excommunicated in 1324 by Larminius, who declared them to be Templi deserters. And the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, Dominorum Militiae Spoliators, placed forever outside the pale of the temple, Extra Girum Templi. A similar anathema has since been launched by several Grand Masters against Templars who were rebellious to legitimate authority. From the schism that was introduced into Scotland, a number of sects took birth. This account forms a complete exoneration of the Scottish Templars, as apostates from the bogus Christian Church and the doctrines of Johannism. They showed themselves loyal to the true Church and to the Christian faith as formulated in the published statutes of their order. What they appear then to have introduced to Masonry was their manner of reception, that is to say, their outer forms and organization, and possibly certain Eastern esoteric doctrines and Judaic legends concerning the building of the Temple of Solomon, in no way incompatible with the teaching of Christianity. It will be noticed, moreover, that in the ban passed by the Order du Temple on the Scottish Templars, the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem are also included. This is a further tribute to the orthodoxy of the Scottish Knights. For to the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, to whom the Templar property was given, no suspicion of heresy had ever attached. After the suppression of the Order of the Temple in 1312, a number of the Knights joined themselves to the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, by whom the Templar system appears to have been purged of its heretical elements. 
As we shall see later, the same process is said to have been carried out by the Royal Order of Scotland. All this suggests that the Templars had imported a secret doctrine from the East, which was capable either of a Christian or anti-Christian interpretation, that through their connection with the Royal Order of Scotland and the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, this Christian interpretation was preserved, and finally, that it was this pure doctrine which passed into Freemasonry. According to early Masonic authorities, the adoption of the two St. Johns as the patron saints of Masonry arose not from Johannism, but from the alliance between the Templars and the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem. It is important to remember that the theory of the Templar connection with Freemasonry was held by the Continental Freemasons of the 18th century, who, living at the time the order was reconstituted on its present basis, were clearly in a better position to know its origins than we, who are separated from that day by a distance of 200 years. But since their testimony first comes to light at the period of the upper degrees, in which the Templar influence is more clearly visible than in craft masonry, it must be reserved for a later chapter. Before passing on to this further stage in the history of the craft, it is necessary to consider one more link in the chain of the Masonic tradition the Holy Vam. The Vamgarics. These dread tribunals, said to have been established by Charlemagne in 1772 in Westphalia, had for their avowed object the establishment of law and order amidst the unsettled and even anarchic conditions that then reigned in Germany. But by degrees the power arrogated to itself by the Holy Vem became so formidable that succeeding emperors were unable to control its workings and found themselves forced to become initiates from motives of self-protection. During the 12th century, the Vemgetics, by their continual executions, had created a veritable Red Terror, so that the east of Germany was known as the Red Land. In 1371, says Licetul de Cantelo, a fresh impetus was given to the Holy Vem by a number of the Knights Templar who, on the dissolution of their order, had found their way to Germany and now sought admission to the secret tribunals. How much of Templar lore passed into the hand of the Vemgerics, it is impossible to know. But there is certainly a resemblance between the methods of initiation and intimidation employed by the Vems and those described by certain of the Templars. Still more between the ceremony and the Vems and the ritual of Freemasonry. Thus, the members of the Vems, known as the Wasende, or Enlightened, were divided into three degrees of initiation. The free judges, the veritable free judges, and the holy judges of the secret tribunal. The candidate for initiation was led blindfold before the dread tribunal, presided over by a Stuherr, or master of the chair, or his substitute, a Freegraf, with a sword and branch of willow at his side. The initiate was then bound by a terrible oath not to reveal the secrets of the holy Vem, to warn no one of danger threatening them by its degrees, to denounce anyone, whether father, mother, brother, sister, friend, or relation, if such a one had been condemned by the tribunal. After this he was given the password and grip by which the confederates recognized each other. In the event of his turning traitor or revealing the secrets confided to him, his eyes were bandaged, his hands tied behind his back, and his tongue was torn out through the back of his neck, after which he was hanged by the feet till he was dead, with the solemn imprecation that this body should be given as prey to the birds of the air. It is difficult to believe that the points of resemblance with modern Masonic ritual which may here be discerned can be a mere matter of coincidence, yet it would be equally unreasonable to trace the origins of Freemasonry to the Vimgetics. Clearly, both derived from a common source, either the old pagan traditions on which the early Vems were founded or the system of the Templars. The latter seems the more probable for two reasons. Firstly, on account of the resemblance between the methods of the Vimgerics and the Assassins, which would be explained if the Templars formed the connecting link, and secondly, the fact that in contemporary documents the members of the secret tribunals were frequently referred to under the name of Rose Croix. 
Now, since, as we have seen, the degree of the Rosy Cross is said to have been brought to Europe by the Templars, this would account for the persistence of the name in the Vemgerex, as well as in the Rosicrucians of the 17th century, who are said to have continued the Templar tradition. Thus, Templarism and Rosicrucianism appear to have been always closely connected, a fact which is not surprising since both derive from a common source, the traditions of the Near East. This brings us to an alternative theory concerning the channel through which Eastern doctrines, and particularly Kabbalism, found their way into Freemasonry. For it must be admitted that one obstacle to the complete acceptance of the theory of the Templar succession exists, namely, that although the Judaic element cannot be traced further back than the Crusades, neither can it with certainty be pronounced to have come into existence during the three centuries that followed after. Indeed, before the publication of Anderson's Constitutions in 1723, there is no definite evidence that the Solomonic legend had been incorporated into the ritual of British masonry. So, although the possession of the legend by the Campagnages of the Middle Ages would tend to prove its antiquity, there is always the possibility that it was introduced by some later body of adepts than the Templars. According to the partisans of a further theory, these adepts were the Rosicrucians. Rosicrucian Origin One of the earliest and most eminent precursors of Freemasonry is said to have been Francis Bacon. As we have already seen, Bacon is recognized to have been a Rosicrucian, and that the secret philosophical doctrine he professed was closely akin to Freemasonry is clearly apparent in his New Atlantis. The reference to the wise man of the Society of Solomon's House cannot be a mere coincidence. The choice of Atlantis, the legendary island supposed to have been submerged by the Atlantic Ocean in the remote past, would suggest that Bacon had some knowledge of a secret tradition descending from the earliest patriarchs of the human race, whom, like the modern writer Le Plongeon, he imagined to have inhabited the Western Hemisphere and to have been the predecessors of the Egyptian initiates. Le Plongeon, however, places this early seat of the mysteries still further west than the Atlantic Ocean in the region of Mayax and Yucatan. Bacon further relates that this tradition was preserved in its pure form by certain of the Jews, who, whilst accepting the Kabbalah, rejected its anti-Christian tendencies. Thus, in this island of Ben Salam, there are Jews of a far differing disposition from the Jews in other parts. For whereas they hate the name of Christ and have a secret inbred rancor against the people amongst whom they live, these contrary wise give unto the Savior many high attributes. But at the same time, they believe that Moses, by his secret Kabbalah, ordained the laws of Ben Salam, which they now use, and that when the Messiah should come and sit on his throne at Jerusalem, the king of Ben Salam would sit at his feet, whereas other kings should be kept at a great distance. This passage is of particular interest as showing that Bacon recognized the divergence between the ancient secret tradition descending from Moses and the perverted Jewish Kabbalah of the rabbis, and that he was perfectly aware of the decency even among the best of Jews to turn the former to the advantage of the messianic dreams. Mrs. Pott, who in her, Francis Bacon and his secret society, sets out to prove that Bacon was the founder of Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry, ignores all the previous history or the secret tradition. Bacon was not the originator, but the inheritor of the ideas on which both these societies were founded. And the further contention that Bacon was at the same time the author of the greatest dramas in the English language and of the chymical marriage of Christian Rosengrutz is manifestly absurd. Nevertheless, Bacon's influence among the Rosicrucians is apparent. Hayden's voyage to the land of the Rosicrucians is in fact the mere plagiarism of Bacon's New Atlantis. Mrs. Pott seems to imagine that by proclaiming Bacon to have been the founder or even a member of the Order of Freemasonry, she is revealing a great Masonic secret which Freemasons have conspired to keep dark. But why should the craft desire to disown so illustrious a progenitor or seek to conceal his connection with the Order, if any such existed? 
Findell indeed frankly admits that the New Atlantis contained unmistakable allusions to Freemasonry and that Bacon contributed to its final transformation. This was doubtless brought about largely by the English Rosicrucians who followed after, to suggest that then Freemasonry originated with the Rosicrucians is to ignore the previous history of the secret tradition. Rosicrucianism was not the beginning but a link in the long chain connecting Freemasonry with far earlier secret associations. The resemblance between the two orders admits of no denial. Thus, Yarker writes, the symbolic tracing of the Rosicrucians was a square temple approached by seven steps. Here also we find the two pillars of Hermes, the five-pointed star, sun and moon, compasses, square and triangle. Yarker further observes that even Wren was more or less a student of Hermeticism, and if he had a full list of Freemasons and Rosicrucians, we should probably be surprised at the numbers who belong to both systems. Professor Boole emphatically states that Freemasonry is neither more or less Rosicrucianism as modified by those who transplanted it into England. Chambers, who published the famous Cyclopedia in 1728, observes, some who are no friends to Freemasonry make the present flourishing society of Freemasons a branch of Rosicrucians, or rather, the Rosicrucians themselves under a new name or relation, viz. as retainers to building. And it is certain that there are some Freemasons who have all the characters of Rosicrucians. The connection between Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism is, however, a question hardly less controversial than that of the connection between Freemasonry and Templarism. Dr. Mackey violently disputes the theory. The Rosicrucians, he writes, as this brief history indicates, has no connection whatever with the Masonic fraternity. Notwithstanding this fact, Barrowell, the most malignant of our revilers, with a characteristic spirit of misrepresentation, attempted to identify the two institutions. But the aforesaid brief history indicates nothing of the kind and the reference to Barrowell as a malignant reviler for suggesting a connection, which, as we have seen, many Freemasons admit, shows on which side this spirit of misrepresentation exists. It is interesting, however, to note that in the eyes of certain Masonic writers, connection with the Rosicrucians is regarded as highly discreditable. The fraternity would thus appear to have been less blameless than we have been taught to believe. Mr. Waite is equally concerned with proving that there is no traceable connection between Masonry and Rosicrucianism, as he goes on to explain that Freemasonry was never a learned society, that it never laid claim to any transcendental secrets of alchemy and magic or to any skill in medicine, etc. The truth may lie between the opposing contentions of Professor Boole and his two Masonic antagonists. The Freemasons were clearly, for the reasons given by Mr. Waite, not a mere continuation of the Rosicrucians, but more likely borrowed from the Rosicrucians a part of their system and symbols which they adopted to their own purpose. Moreover, the incontrovertible fact is that in the list of English Freemasons and Rosicrucians we find men who belong to both orders, and amongst these, two who contributed largely to the constitutions of English Freemasonry. The first of these is Robert Flood, whom Mr. Waite describes as the central figure of Rosicrucian literature, an intellectual giant, a man of immense erudition, of exalted mind, and, to judge by his writings, of extreme personal sanctity. Anna Moser describes him as one of the most distinguished disciples of Paracelsus. Yarker adds this clue, in 1630 we find Flood, the chief of the Rosicrucians, using architectural language, and there's proof that his society was divided into degrees, and from the fact that the Masons' Company of London had a copy of the Masonic charges presented by Mr. Flood. We may suppose that he was a Freemason before 1620. A still more important link is Elias Ashmole, the antiquary, astrologer, and alchemist, founder of the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford, who was born in 1617, an avowed Rosicrucian, and as we have seen, also a Freemason, Ashmole displayed great energy in reconstituting the craft. He is said to have perfected its organization, to have added to it further mystic symbols, and according to Ragon, it was he who drew up the ritual of the existing three craft degrees, entered apprentice, fellow craft, and master mason, 
which was adopted by the Grand Lodge in 1717. Whence did these fresh inspirations come but from the Rosicrucians? For, as Ragon also informs us, in the year that Ashmole was received into Freemasonry, the Rosicrucians held their meeting in the same room at Mason Hall. How, then, can it be said that there was no traceable connection between Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism? And why should it be a part of the malignant reviler to connect them? It is not suggested that Rosicrucians, such as Flood or Ashmole, imported any magical elements into Freemasonry but simply the system and symbols of the Rose Croix with a certain degree of esoteric learning. That Rosicrucianism forms an important link in the chain of the secret tradition is therefore undeniable. The 17th Century Rabbis There is, however, a third channel through which the Judaic legends of Freemasonry may have penetrated to the craft, namely the rabbis of the 17th century. The Jewish writer Bernard Lazar has declared that there were Jews around the cradle of Freemasonry, and if this statement is applied to the period preceding the institution of the Grand Lodge in 1717, it certainly finds confirmation in fact. Thus, it is said that in the preceding century, the coat of arms now used by Grand Lodge had been designed by an Amsterdam Jew, Jacob Yehuda Leon Templo, colleague of Cromwell's friend the Kabbalist. Manasseh ben Israel. To quote Jewish authority on this question, Mr. Lucian Wolf writes that Templo had a monomania for everything relating to the Temple of Solomon and the Tabernacle of the Wilderness. He constructed gigantic models of both these edifices. These he exhibited in London, which he visited in 1675 and earlier, and it seems not unreasonable to conclude that this may have provided a fresh source of inspiration to the Freemasons who framed the Masonic ritual some 40 years later. At any rate, the Masonic coat of arms, still used by Grand Lodge of England, is undoubtedly of Jewish design. This coat, says Mr. Lucian Wolf, is entirely composed of Jewish symbols and is an attempt to display heraldically in the various forms of the cherubim pictured to us in the second vision of Ezekiel, an ox, a man, a lion, and an eagle, and thus belongs to the highest and most mystical domain of Hebrew symbolism. In other words, this vision, known to the Jews as the Merkabah, belongs to the Kabbalah, where a particular interpretation is placed on each figure so as to provide an esoteric meaning not perceptible to the uninitiated. The Masonic coat of arms is thus entirely Kabbalistic, as is also the seal on the diplomas of craft masonry, where another Kabbalistic figure, that of a man and woman combined, is reproduced. Of the Jewish influence in masonry after 1717 I shall speak later. To sum up, then, the origins of the system we now know as Freemasonry are not to be found in one source alone. The twelve alternative sources enumerated in the Masonic Cyclopedia and quoted in the beginning of this chapter may all have contributed to its formation. Thus, operative Masonry may have descended from the Roman Collegia and through the operative Masons of the Middle Ages, whilst speculative Masonry may have derived from the Patriarchs and the Mysteries of the Pagans. But the source of inspiration which admits of no denial is the Jewish Kabbalah. Whether this penetrated to our country through the Roman Collegia, the Campagnages, the Templars, the Rosicrucians, or through the Jews of the 17th and 18th centuries, whose activities behind the scenes of Freemasonry we shall see later, is a matter of speculation. The fact remains that when the ritual and constitutions of Masonry were drawn up in 1717, Although certain fragments of the ancient Egyptian and Pythagorean doctrines were retained, the Judaic version of the secret tradition was the one selected by the founders of Grand Lodge on which to build up their system. Chapter 6. The Grand Lodge Era Whatever were the origins of the order we now know as Freemasonry, it is clear that during the century preceding its reorganization under Grand Lodge of London, the secret system of binding men together for a common purpose, based on Eastern esoteric doctrines, had been anticipated by the Rosicrucians. Was this secret system employed, however, by any other body of men? It is certainly easy to imagine how in this momentous 17th century, 
when men of all opinions were coalescing against opposing forces, Lutherans combining against the papacy, Catholics rallying their forces against invading Protestantism, Republicans plotting in favor of Cromwell, Royalists in their turn plotting to restore the Stuarts, finally Royalists plotting against each other on behalf of rival dynasties. An organization of this kind, enabling one to work secretly for a cause and to set invisibly vast numbers of human beings in motion, might prove invaluable to any party. Thus, according to certain Masonic writers on the continent, the system used by the Rosicrucians in their fight against popery was also employed by the Jesuits for a directly opposite purpose. In the manuscripts of the Prince of Hesse, published by Le Coutel de Cantelou, it is declared that in 1714 the Jesuits used the mysteries of the Rose Croix. Mirabeau also relates that the Jesuits profited by the internal troubles of the reign of Charles I to possess themselves of the symbols, the allegories, and the carpets, tapis, of the Rose Croix Masons, who were only the ancient order of the Templars secretly perpetuated. It may be seen by means of what imperceptible innovations they succeeded in substituting their catechism to the instruction of the Templars. Other continental writers again assert that Cromwell, the arch-opponent of the Catholic Church, was a higher initiate of Masonic mysteries and used this system for his own elevation to power. Further, that he found himself outdistanced by the levelers, that this sect, whose name certainly suggests Masonic inspiration, adopted for its symbols the square and compass, and in its claim of real equality threatened the supremacy of the usurper. Finally, Elias Ashmole, the Rosicrucian royalist, is said to have turned the Masonic system against Cromwell, so that towards the end of the 17th century the order rallied to the Stuart cause. But all this is pure speculation resting on no basis of known facts. The accusation that the Jesuits used the system of the Rose Croix as a cover to political intrigues is referred to by the Rosicrucian Eliphas Levi as the outcome of ignorance, which refutes itself. It is significant to notice that it emanates mainly from Germany and from the Illuminati. The Prince of Hesse was a member of the Strict Observance, and Mirabeau an Illuminatus at the time he wrote the passage quoted above. That in the 17th century certain Jesuits played the part of political intriguers, I suppose their warmest friends would hardly deny. But that they employed any secret or Masonic system seems to me perfectly incapable of proof. I shall return to this point later, however, in connection with the Illuminati. As to Cromwell, the only circumstance that lends any color to the possibility of his connection with Freemasonry is his known friendship for Manasseh ben Israel, the colleague of the Rabbi Templo, who designed the coat of arms later adopted by Grand Lodge. If, therefore, the Jews of Amsterdam were a source of inspiration to the Freemasons of the 17th century, it is not impossible that Cromwell may have been the channel through which this influence first penetrated. In the matter of the Stuarts, we are, however, on firm ground with regard to Freemasonry. That the lodges at the end of the 17th century were royalist is certain, and there seems to be good reason to believe that when the revolution of 1688 divided the royalist cause, the Jacobites who fled to France with James II took Freemasonry with them. With the help of the French, they established lodges in which, it is said, Masonic rites and symbols were used to promote the cause of the Stuarts. Thus, the land of promise signified Great Britain. Jerusalem stood for London, and the murder of Hiram represented the execution of Charles I. Meanwhile, Freemasonry in England did not continue to adhere to the Stuart cause, as it had done under the aegis of Elias Ashmole, and by 1717 it is said to have become Hanoverian. From this important date, the official history of the present system may be said to begin. Hitherto, everything rests on stray documents, of which the authenticity is frequently doubtful, and which provide no continuous history of the order. In 1717, for the first time, Freemasonry was established on a settled basis, and in the process underwent a fundamental change. So far it would seem to have retained an operative element, but the transformation that now took place was entirely eliminated, and the whole order was transformed into a middle and upper-class speculative body. 
This coup d'etat, already suggested in 1703, took place in 1716, when four London lodges of Freemasons met together at the Apple Tree Tavern in Charles Street, Covent Garden. And having put into the chair the oldest master mason, now the master of a lodge, they constituted themselves a grand lodge, pro tempore, in due form. On St. John the Baptist's day, June 24th of the next year, the annual assembly and banquet were held at the Goose and Gridiron in St. Paul's Churchyard, when Mr. Anthony Sayer was elected Grand Master and invested with all the badges of office. It is evident from the above account that already in 1717 these speculative elements must have predominated in the lodges, otherwise we might expect to find the operative masons taking some part in those proceedings and expressing their opinion as to whether their association should pass under the control of men entirely unconnected with the craft. But no, the leaders of the new movement all appear to have belonged to the middle class, nor from this movement do either Masons or architects seem to have played any prominent part in Freemasonry. But the point that the official history does not attempt to elucidate is the reason for this decision. Why should the Freemasons of London, whether they were at this date a speculative or only a semi-speculative association, have suddenly recognized the necessity of establishing a Grand Lodge and drawing up a ritual and constitution. It is evident, then, that some circumstances must have arisen which led them to take this important step. I would suggest that the following may be the solution to the problem. Freemasonry, as we have seen, was a system that could be employed in any cause and had now come to be used by intriguers of every kind. And not only by intriguers, but by merely convivial bodies. Jolly Brotherhoods of the Bottle, who modeled themselves on Masonic associations. But the honest citizens of London who met and feasted at the Goose and Gridiron were clearly not intriguers. They were neither royalist nor republican plotters, neither Catholic nor Lutheran fanatics, neither alchemists nor magicians. Nor can it be supposed that they were simply revelers. If they were political, they were certainly not supporters of the Stuarts. On the contrary, they were generally reported to have been Hanoverian in their sympathies. Indeed, Dr. Bussell goes so far as to say the Grand Lodge was instituted to support the Hanoverian dynasty. It would perhaps be nearer the truth to conclude that if they were Hanoverian, it was because they were constitutional, and the Hanoverian dynasty having now been established, they wished to avoid further changes. In a word, then, they were simply men of peace, anxious to put an end to dissensions, who, seeing the system of masonry utilized for the purpose of promoting discord, determined to wrest it from the hands of political intriguers and restore it to its original character of brotherhood, though not of brotherhood between working masons only, but between men drawn from all classes and professions. By founding a grand lodge in London and drawing up a ritual and constitutions, they hoped to prevent the perversion of their signs and symbols and to establish the order on a settled basis. According to Nikolai, this pacific purpose had already animated English Freemasons under the grand mastership of Sir Christopher Wren. Its principal object from this period was to moderate the religious hatreds so terrible in England during the reign of James II and try and establish some kind of concord or fraternity, by weakening as far as possible the antagonisms arising from the differences of religions, ranks, and interests. An 18th century manuscript of the Prince of Hesse, quoted by Le Coutil de Cantelot, expresses the view that in 1717, the mysteries of Freemasonry were reformed and purified in England of all political tendencies. In the matter of religion, craft masonry adopted an equally non-sectarian attitude. The first constitutions of the order, drawn up by Dr. Anderson in 1723, contain the following paragraph. Concerning God and religion, a mason is obliged, by his tenure, to obey the moral law, and if he rightly understands the art, he will never be a stupid atheist, nor an irreligious libertine. But... Though in ancient times Masons were charged in every country to be of the religion of that country or nation, whatever it was, yet tis now thought more expedient only to oblige them to that religion in which all men agree, leaving their particular opinions to themselves. That is to be good men and true, or men of honor and honesty, by whatever denominations or persuasions they may be distinguished. 
whereby masonry becomes the center of union and the means of conciliating true friendship among persons that must have remained at a perpetual distance. The phrase that religion in which all men agree has been censured by Catholic writers as advocating a universal religion in the place of Christianity. But this by no means follows. The idea is surely that Masons should be men adhering to that law of right and wrong common to all religious faiths. Craft Masonry may thus be described as deist in character, but not in the accepted sense of the word which implies the rejection of Christian doctrines. If Freemason has been deist in its sense, might not we expect to find some connection between the founders of Grand Lodge and the school of deists? Toland, Bolingbroke, Woolston, Hume, and others? Which flourished precisely at this period? Might not some analogy be detected between the organization of the order and the sedilities described in Toland's Pantheisticon, published in 1720? But of this I can find no trace whatever. The principal founders of Grand Lodge were, as we have seen, clergymen, both engaged in preaching Christian doctrines at their respective churches. It is surely, therefore, reasonable to conclude that Freemasonry at the time of its reorganization in 1717 was deistic only in so far that it invited men to meet together on the common ground of a belief in God. Moreover, some of the early English rituals contained distinctly Christian elements. Thus, both in Yachin and Boaz, 1762, and Hiram, or the Grand Master Key to the door of both ancient and modern Freemasonry, by a member of the Royal Arch, 1766, we find prayers in the lodges concluding with the name of Christ. These passages were replaced much later by purely deistic formulas under the grand mastership of the free-thinking Duke of Sussex in 1813. But in spite of its innocuous character, Freemasonry, merely by reason of its secrecy, soon began to excite alarm in the public mind. As early as 1724, a work entitled The Grand Mystery of the Freemasons Discovered had provoked an angry remonstrance from the craft. And when the French edict against the order was passed, a letter signed Yachin appeared in the Gentleman's Magazine, declaring the Freemasons who have lately been suppressed, not only in France, but in Holland, to be a dangerous race of men. No government ought to suffer such clandestine assemblies where plots against the state may be carried on under the pretense of brotherly love and good fellowship. The writer, evidently unaware of the possible Templar traditions, goes on to observe that the sentinel placed at the door of the lodge, with a drawn sword in his hand, is not the only mark of there being a military order, and suggests that the title of Grand Master is taken in imitation of the Knights of Malta. Yachin, moreover, scents a popish plot. They not only admit Turks, Jews, infidels, but even Jacobites, non-jurors, and papists themselves. How can we be sure that those persons who are known to be well affected and let into their mysteries? They make no scruple to acknowledge that there is a distinction between prentices and master masons, and who knows whether they may not have a higher order of Kabbalists, who keep the grand secret of all entirely to themselves. Later on in France, the Abbe Perrault published his satires on Freemasonry, Le Secret de Franck Mecon, 1742 and another in 1745, and another 1746. And in about 1761, another English writer said to be a mason brought down a torrent of invective on his head by the publication of the Ritual of the Craft Degrees, under the name of Yachin and Boaz. It must be admitted that from all this controversy, no party emerges in a very charitable light, Catholics and Protestants alike indulging in sarcasm and reckless accusations against Freemasonry the Freemasons retorting with far from brotherly forbearance. But again, one must remember that all these men were of their age, an age which, seen through the eyes of Hogarth, would certainly not appear to have been distinguished for delicacy. It should be noted, however, when one reads in Masonic works of the persecutions to which Freemasonry has been subjective, that aggression was not confirmed only to the one side in the conflict. Moreover, that the Freemasons at this period were divided amongst themselves and expressed with regard to opposing groups much the same suspicions that non-Masons expressed with regard to the order as a whole. For the years following after the suppression of Masonry in France were marked 
by the most important development in the history of the modern order, the inauguration of the additional degrees. The additional degrees. The origin and inspiration of the additional degrees has provoked hardly less controversy in Masonic circles than the origin of Masonry itself. It should be explained that craft Masonry or blue Masonry, that is to say the first three degrees of entered apprentice, fellow craft, and master Mason, of which I have attempted to trace the history, were the only degrees recognized by Grand Lodge at the time of its foundation in 1717 and still form the basis of all forms of modern masonry. On this foundation were erected somewhere between 1740 and 1743 the degree of the Royal Arch and the first of the series of upper degrees now known as the Scottish Rite or as the ancient and accepted rite. The acceptance or rejection of this superstructure has always formed a subject of violent controversy between masons, one body affirming that craft masonry is the only true and genuine masonry, the other declaring that the real object of masonry is only to be found in the higher degrees. It was this controversy centering around the Royal Arch degree that about the middle of the 18th century split masonry into opposing camps of ancients and moderns, the ancients declaring that the RA was the root heart and marrow of Freemasonry, the moderns rejecting it. Although worked by the ancients from 1756 onwards, this degree was definitely repudiated by Grand Lodge in 1792 and only in 1813 was officially received into English Freemasonry. The RA degree, which is said nevertheless to be contained in embryo in the 1723 Book of Constitutions, is purely Judaic, a glorification of Israel and commemorating the building of the Second Temple. That it was derived from the Jewish Kabbalah seems probable, and Yarker, commenting on the phrase in the Gentleman's Magazine quoted above, who knows whether they, the Freemasons, have not a higher order of Kabbalists who keep the secret, the grand secret of all entirely to themselves, observes. It looks very like an intimation of the Royal Arch Degree, and elsewhere he states that the Royal Arch Degree, when it had the three veils, must have been the work, even if by instruction, of a Kabbalistic Jew about 1740, and from this time we may expect to find a secret tradition grafted upon Anderson's system. Precisely in the same year of 1740, Mr. Waite says that an itinerant peddler of the Royal Arch degree is said to have propagated it in Ireland, claiming that it was practiced at York and London, and in 1744 a certain Dr. Dassini wrote that the minds of the Dublin Brethren have been lately disturbed about Royal Arch Masonry owing to the activities in Dublin of a number of traders or hucksters in pretended masonry, whom the writer connects with Italians or the Italic order. A Freemason quoting this passage in a recent discussion on the upper degrees expresses the opinion that these hucksters were Jacobite emissaries disguised under the form of a pretended masonry, and that by Italians and Italian order he intends a reference to the court of King James III, i.e. the old pretender at Rome, and to the Ecosse, Italic, order of masonry. It is much more likely that he had referred to another source of Masonic instruction in Italy, which I shall indicate in a later chapter. But precisely at the moment when it is suggested that the Jacobites were intriguing to introduce the Royal Arch degree into Masonry, they are also said to have been engaged in elaborating the Scottish Rite. Let us examine this contention. Freemasonry in France the foundation of Grand Lodge in London had been followed by the inauguration of Masonic lodges on the continent, in 1721 at Mons, in 1725 in Paris, in 1728 at Madrid, in 1731 at The Hague, in 1733 at Hamburg, etc. Several of these received their warrant from the Grand Lodge of England. But this was not the case with the Grand Lodge of Paris, which did not receive a warrant till 1743. The men who founded this lodge, far from being non-political, were Jacobite leaders engaged in active schemes for the restoration of the Stuart dynasty. The leader of the group, Charles Radcliffe, had been imprisoned with his brother, the ill-fated Lord Derwentwater, who was executed on Tower Hill in 1716. Charles had succeeded in escaping from Newgate and made his way to France, where he assumed the title of Lord Derwentwater although the earldom had ceased to exist under the Bill of Attainer. 
against his brother. It was this Lord Derwentwater, afterwards executed for taking part in the 1745 rebellion, who with several other Jacobites is said to have founded the Grand Lodge of Paris in 1725, and himself to have become Grand Master. The Jacobite character of the Paris Lodge is not a matter of dispute. Mr. Gould relates that the colleagues of Lord Derwentwater are stated to have been a Chevalier Masculine, a Squire Higuerty, and others, all partisans of the Stuarts. But he goes on to contest the theory that they used Freemasonry in the Stuart cause, which he regards as amounting to a charge of bad faith. This is surely unreasonable. The founders of Grand Lodge in Paris did not derive from Grand Lodge in London, from which they held no warrant, but, as we have seen, took their Freemasonry with them to France before Grand Lodge of London was instituted. They were therefore in no way bound by its regulations, and until the Constitutions of Anderson were published in 1723, no rule had been laid down that the lodges should be non-political. In the old days, Freemasonry had always been royalist, as we see from the ancient charges that members should be true liegemen of the king. And if the adherents of James Edward saw in him their rightful sovereign, they may have conceived that they were using Freemasonry for a lawful purpose in adopting it to his cause. So although we may applaud the decision of the London Freemasons to purge Freemasonry of political tendencies and transform it into a harmonious system of brotherhood, we cannot accuse the Jacobites in France of bad faith in not conforming to a decision in which they had taken no part and in establishing lodges on their own lines. Unfortunately, however, as too frequently happens when men form secret confederacies for a wholly honorable purpose, their ranks were penetrated by confederates of another kind. It has been said in an earlier chapter that according to the documents produced by the Order du Temple in the early part of the 19th century, the Templars had never ceased to exist in spite of their official suppression in 1312 and that a line of grandmasters had succeeded each other in unbroken successions from Jacques du Molay to the Duke de Cosbrissac, who was killed in 1792. The Grand Master appointed in 1705 is stated to have been Philip, Duke d'Orleans, later the Regent. Mr. Waite has expressed the opinion that all this was an invention of the late 18th century, and that the Charter of Larminius was fabricated at this date, though not published until 1811, by the revived Order du Temple, under the Grand Master Fabra Palaprat. But evidence points to a contrary conclusion. M. Matter, who, as we have seen, disbelieves the story of the Order du Temple and the authenticity of the Charter of Larminius, insofar as it professes to be a genuine 14th century document, nevertheless asserts that the savants who have examined it declare it to date from the early part of the 18th century, at which period Matter believes the Gospel of St. John used by the Order to have been arranged so as to accompany the ceremonies of some Masonic or secret society. Now it was about 1740 that a revival of Templarism took place in France and Germany. We cannot therefore doubt that if matter is right in his hypothesis, the secret society in question was that of the Templars. Whether they existed as lineal descendants of the 12th century order or merely as a revival of that order, the existence of German Templars at this date under the name of Strict Observance, which we shall deal with in a further chapter, is indeed a fact disputed by no one, but that there was also an Order du Temple in France at the very beginning of the 18th century must be regarded as highly probable. Dr. Mackey, John Yarker, and Lucotil de Cantelot, who, owing to his possession of Templar documents, had exclusive sources of information, all declare this to have been the case and accept the charter of Larminius as authentic. It is quite certain, says Yarker, that there was at this period in France an order du temple with a charter from John Mark Larminius, who claimed appointment from Jacques du Molay. Philip of Orleans accepted the grand mastership in 1705 and signed the statutes. Without, however, necessarily accepting the Charter of Larminius as authentic, let us examine the probability of this assertion with regard to the Duc d'Orleans. Amongst the Jacobites supporting Lord Derwentwater at the Grand Lodge of Paris was a certain Andrew Michael Ramsay, known as Chevalier Ramsay, 
who was born at Ayr, near the famous lodge of Kilwinning, where the Templars are said to have formed their alliance with the Masons in 1314. In 1710, Ramsey was converted to the Roman Catholic faith by Fenelon, and in 1724 became tutor to the sons of the Pretender at Rome. Mr. Gould has related that during his stay in France, Ramsey had formed a friendship with the regent, Philip, Duke d'Orleans, who was Grand Master of the Order de Saint-Lazare, instituted during the Crusades as a body of hospitaliers devoting themselves to the care of the lepers, and which in 1608 had been joined to the Order de Mont-Carmel. It seems probable from all accounts that Ramsay was a chevalier of this order, but he cannot have been admitted into it by the Duke d'Orleans, for the Grand Master of the Order de Saint-Lazare was not the Duke d'Orleans, but the Marquis de Dangon, who on his death in 1720 was succeeded by the son of the regent, the Duke de Chartres. If then Ramsay was admitted to any order by the regent, it was surely the Order du Temple, of which the regent is said to have been the Grand Master at this date. Now, the infamous charter of the Duc d'Orleans is a matter of common knowledge. Moreover, during the Regency, that period of impiety and moral dissolution had thereto unparalleled in the history of France, the chief of council was the Duc de Bourbon, who later placed his mistress, the Marquis de Prix, and the financier, Paris Duverny, at the head of affairs, thus creating a scandal of such magnitude that he was exiled in 1726 through the influence of Cardinal Fleury. This Duc de Bourbon, in 1737, is said to have become Grand Master of the Temple. It was thus, observes de Cantelou, that these two Grand Masters of the Temple degraded the royal authority and ceaselessly increased hatred against the government. It would therefore seem strange that a man so upright as Ramsay appears to have been, who had moreover but recently been converted to the Catholic Church, should have formed a friendship with the dissolute regent of France, unless there had been some bond between them. But here we have a possible explanation. Templarism. Doubtless, during Randy's youth at Kilwinning, many Templar traditions had come to his knowledge. And if in France he found himself befriended by the Grand Master himself, what wonder that he should have entered into an alliance, which resulted in his admission to an order, he had been accustomed to revere, and which, moreover, was represented to him as the Fons et Origo of the Masonic Brotherhood to which he also belonged. It is thus that we find Ramsay in the very year that the Duke de Bourbon is said to have been made Grand Master of the Temple, artlessly writing to the Cardinal Fleury, asking him to extend his protection to the Society of Freemasons in Paris, and enclosing a copy of the speech which he was to deliver on the following day. March 21st, 1737. It is in this famous oration that for the first time we find Freemasonry traced to the Crusades. At the time of the Crusades in Palestine, many princes, lords, and citizens associated themselves and vowed to restore the Temple of the Christians in the Holy Land and to employ themselves in bringing back their architecture to its first institution. They agreed upon several ancient signs and symbolic words drawn from the well of religion in order to recognize themselves amongst the heathens and Saracens. These signs and words were only communicated to those who promised solemnly, and even sometimes at the foot of the altar, never to reveal them. The sacred promise was therefore not an execrable oath, as it has been called, but a respectable bond to unite Christians of all nationalities into one co-fraternity. Sometime afterwards, our order formed an intimate union with the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem. From that time, our lodges took the name of Lodges of St. John. The speech of Ramses had raised a storm of controversy amongst Freemasons because it contains a very decided hint of a connection between Templarism and Freemasonry. Mr. Tuckett, in the paper referred to above, points out that only the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem are here mentioned. But Ramsey distinctly speaks of our order forming a union with the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem and we know that the Templars did eventually form such a union. The fact that Ramsey does not mention the Templars by name admits of a very plausible explanation. It must be remembered that, as Mr. Gould has shown, a copy of the oration was enclosed by Ramsey in his letter to Cardinal Fleury, 
appealing for royal protection to be extended to Freemasonry. It is therefore hardly likely that he would have proclaimed a connection between the order he was anxious to present in the most favorable light and one which had formerly been suppressed by king and pope. Moreover, if the charter of Larminius is to be believed, the newly elected Grand Master of the Temple was the Duke de Bourbon, who had already incurred the Cardinal's displeasure. Obviously, therefore, Templar influence was kept in the background. This is not to imply bad faith on the part of Ramsay, who doubtless held the Order of the Templars to be wholly praiseworthy, but he could not expect the King or Cardinal to share his view, and therefore held it more prudent to refer to the progenitors of Freemasonry under the vague description of a crusading body. Ramsay's well-meant effort met, however, with no success, whether on account of this unlucky reference by which the Cardinal may have detected Templar influence, or for some other reason, the appeal for royal protection was not only refused, but the new order which hitherto Catholics had been allowed to enter was now prohibited by royal edict. In the following year, 1738, the Pope Clement XII issued a bull in eminenti, banning Freemasonry and excommunicating Catholics who took part in it. But this prohibition appears to have been without effect, for Freemasonry not only prospered, but soon began to manufacture new degrees. And in the Masonic literature of the following 30 years, the Templar tradition becomes still more clearly apparent. Thus, the Chevalier de Barrage, in a well-known pamphlet of which the first edition is said to have appeared in 1747, gives the following account of the origins of Freemasonry. This order was initiated by Godfroy de Bouillon in Palestine in 1330, after the decadence of the Christian armies, and was only communicated to the French Masons some time after, and to a very small number, as a reward for the obliging services they rendered to several of our English and Scottish knights, from whom the true Masonry is taken. Their Metropolitan Lodge is situated on the mountain of Herodom, where the first lodge was held in Europe, and which exists in all its splendor. The General Council is still held there, and it is the seal of the Sovereign Grand Master in office. This mountain is situated between the west and north of Scotland at 60 miles from Edinburgh. Apart from the historical confusion of the first sentence, this passage is of interest as evidence that the theory of a connection between the Crusading Knights and the Lodge of Herodom of Kilwinning was current as early as 1747. The Baron Schutte and his Etoile Flamboyant, which appeared in 1766, says that the crusading origin of Freemasonry is the one officially taught in the lodges, where candidates for initiation are told that several knights who had set forth to rescue the holy places of Palestine from the Saracens formed an association under the name of Freemasons, thus indicating that their principal desire was the reconstruction of the Temple of Solomon, that further they adopted certain signs, grips, and passwords as a defense against the Saracens, and finally that our society fraternized on the footing of an order with the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, from which it is apparent that the Freemasons borrowed the custom of regarding St. John as the patron of the whole order in general. After the Crusades, the Masons kept their rites and methods, and in this way perpetuated the royal art by establishing lodges, first in England, then in Scotland, etc., in this account, therefore, Freemasonry is represented as having been instituted for the defense of Christian doctrines. De Barrage expresses the same view and explains that the object of these crusaders, in thus binding themselves together, was to protect their lives against the Saracens, by enveloping their sacred doctrines in a veil of mystery. For this purpose they made use of Jewish symbolism, which they invested with a Christian meaning. Thus, the Temple of Solomon was used to denote the Church of Christ. The bow of acacia signified the cross, the square and the compass, the union between the Old and New Testaments, etc. So, the mysteries of Masonry were in their principle and still are nothing else than those of the Christian religion. Baron Schutte, however, declares that all this stops short of the truth, that Freemasonry originated long before the Crusades in Palestine, and that the real ancestors, fathers, authors of the Masons, those illustrious men of whom I will not say the date nor betray the secret, were a disciplined body, whom Schutte describes by the name of the Knights of the Aurora in Palestine, 
After the almost total destruction of the Jewish people, these knights had always hoped to regain possession of the domains of their fathers and to rebuild the temple. And they carefully preserved their regulations and particular liturgy, together with a sublime treatise, which was the object of their continual study and of their philosophical speculations. Shudi further relates that they were students of the occult sciences, of which alchemy formed a part, and that they had abjured the principles of the Jewish religion in order to follow the lights of the Christian faith. At the time of the Crusades, the Knights of Palestine came out from the desert of the Thebad, where they had remained hidden and joined to themselves some of the Crusaders who had remained in Jerusalem, declaring that they were the descendants of the Masons who had worked on the Temple of Solomon. They professed to concern themselves with speculative architecture, which served to disguise a more glorious point of view. From this time, they took the name of Freemasons, presented themselves under this title to the crusading armies, and assembled under their banners. It would, of course, be absurd to regard any of the foregoing accounts as historical facts. The important point is that they tend to prove the fallacy of supposing that the Johannite Templar theory originated with the revived Order du Temple, since one corresponding to it so closely was current in the middle of the preceding century. It is true that in these earlier accounts the actual words Johannite and Templar do not occur, but the resemblance between the sect of Jews professing the Christian faith but possessing a particular liturgy and a sublime treatise apparently some earlier form of the Kabbalah, dealing with occult science and the Mandeans or Johannites with their Kabbalistic Book of Adam, their Book of John, and their ritual is at once apparent. Further, the allusions to the connection between the knights who had been indoctrinated in the Holy Land and the Scottish lodges coincides exactly with the Templar tradition, published not only by the Order du Temple, but handed down in the Royal Order of Scotland. From all this, the following facts stand out. One, that whilst British craft masonry traced its origin to the operative guilds of masons, the Freemasons of France from 1737 onwards placed the origin of the order in crusading chivalry. Two, that it was amongst these Freemasons that the upper degrees known as the Scottish Rite arose. And three, that as we shall now see, these degrees clearly suggest Templar inspiration. The earliest form of the upper degrees appears to have been the one given by de Barrage as follows. 1. Parfait Macon Ulu. 2. Elu de Perignon. 3. Elu de Quinze. 4. Petit Architect. 5. Grand Architect. 6. Chevalier de Lepi et de Rose Croix. 7. Nocaite au Chevalier Prosson. The first of these to make its appearance is believed to have been the one here assigned to the sixth place. This degree, known in modern masonry as Prince of the Rose Croix, of Herodom or Knight of the Pelican and Eagle, became the 18th and the most important degree in what was later called the Scottish Rite, or at the present time in England, the ancient and accepted rite. Why was this rite called Scottish? It cannot be too strongly insisted on, says Mr. Gould, that all Scottish masonry has nothing whatever to do with the Grand Lodge of Scotland, nor, with one possible exception, that of the Royal Order of Scotland. Did it ever originate in that country? But in the case of the Rose Quad degree, there is surely some justification for the term in legend, if not in proven fact. For, as we have already seen, according to the tradition of the Royal Order of Scotland, this degree has been contained in it since the 14th century, when the degrees of H.R.M., Herodom, and R.S.Y.C.S., Rosie Cross, are said to have been instituted by Robert Bruce in collaboration with the Templars after the Battle of Bannockburn. Dr. Mackey is one of the few Masons who admit this probable affiliation and is referring to the tradition of the Royal Order of Scotland observes. From that order it seems to us by no means improbable that the present degree of Rose Croix de Herodom may have taken its origin. But the Rose Croix degree, like the Templar tradition from which it appears to have descended, is capable of a dual interpretation, or rather of a multiple interpretation, for no degree in masonry has been subject to so many variations. 
that on the continent had it descended through the Rosicrucians in an alchemical form seems more than probable. It would certainly be difficult to believe that a degree of RSYCS was imported from the East and incorporated in the Royal Order of Scotland in 1314. That by a mere coincidence, a man named Christian Rosencruz was, according to the Rosicrucian legend, born in the same century and transmitted a secret doctrine he had discovered in the East to the 17th century brethren of the rosy cross and finally that a degree of the rose croix was founded in cirque 1741 without any connection existing between these succeeding movements even if we deny direct affiliation we must surely admit a common source of inspiration producing if not a continuation at any rate a periodic revival of the same ideas Dr. Oliver indeed admits affiliation between the 17th century fraternity and the 18th century degree. And after pointing out that first indication of the rose qua degree appears in the Fama Fraternatus in 1613, goes on to say, It was known much sooner, although not probably as a degree in masonry, for it existed as a Kabbalistic science from the earliest times in Egypt, Greece, and Rome, as well as amongst the Jews and Moors in times more recent. And in our own country, the names of Roger Bacon, Flood, Ashmole, and many others are found in its list of adepts. Dr. Mackey, quoting this passage, observes that Oliver confounds the Masonic Rose Qua with the alchemical Rosicrucians, and proceeds to give an account of the Rose Qua degree as worked in England and America, which he truly describes as, in the strictest sense, a Christian degree. But the point Dr. Mackey overlooks is that this is only one version of the degree, which, as we shall see later, has been and still is worked in a very different manner on the continent. It is, however, certain that the version of the Rose Croix degree, first adopted by the Freemasons of France in about 1741, was not only so Christian but so Catholic in character as to have given rise to the belief that it was devised by the Jesuits in order to counteract the attacks of which Catholicism was the object. In a paper on the additional degrees, Mr. J. S. Tucker writes, There is undeniable evidence that in their earliest forms, the Ecossais or Scots degrees were Roman Catholic. I have MS ritual in French, of which I believe to be the original Chev de Languil, or SPDRC. And in it, the new law is declared to be Le Foy Catholique and the Baron Schutte in his Etoile Flamboyant of 1766 describes the same degree as Le Catholicisme Mis en Grade, Volume 1, page 114. I suggest that Ecossais, or Scots Masonry, was intended to be a Roman Catholic as well as a Stuart form of Freemasonry, in which none but those devoted to both restorations were to be admitted. But is it necessary to read this political intention into the degree? If the tradition of the Royal Order of Scotland is to be believed, the idea of the Rose Qua degree was far older than the Stuart cause and dated back to Bannockburn, when the degree of heredom with which it was coupled was instituted in order to correct the errors and reform the abuses which had crept in among the three degrees of St. John's Masonry, and to provide a Christianized form of the third degree purified of the dross of paganism and even of Judaism. Whether the antiquity attributed to these degrees can be proved or not, it certainly appears probable that the legend of the Royal Order of Scotland had some foundation in fact, and therefore that the ideas embodied in the 18th century Rose Qua degree may have been drawn from the store of that order and brought by the Jacobites to France. At the same time, there is no evidence in support of the statement made by certain continental writers that Ramsey actually instituted this or any of the upper degrees. On the contrary, in his oration, he expressly states that Freemasonry is composed of the craft degrees only. We have amongst us three kinds of brothers, novices or apprentices, fellow or professed brothers, masters or perfected brethren. To the first are explained the moral virtues, to the second the heroic virtues, and to the last the Christian virtues. It might be said then that the Rose Qua degree was here foreshadowed in the Master's degree, and that the latter definitely inculcated Christianity. This would be perfectly in accord with Ramsey's point of view as set forth in his account of his conversion by Fenelon. 
when he first met the Archbishop of Cambrai in 1710, Ramsey relates that he had lost faith in all Christian sects and had resolved to take refuge in a wise deism, limited to respect for the divinity and for the immutable ideas of pure virtue. But that his conversation with Fenelon led him to accept the Catholic faith, and he goes on to show that Monsieur de Cambrai turned atheists into deists, and deists into Christians, and Christians into Catholics, by a sequence of ideas full of enlightenment and feeling. Might not this be the process which Ramsey aimed at introducing into Freemasonry? The process which in fact does form part of the Masonic system in England today? where the atheist must become, at least by profession, a deist before he can be admitted to the craft degrees, whilst the Rose Croix degree is reserved solely for those who profess the Christian faith? Such was undoubtedly the idea of the men who introduced the Rose Croix degree into France, and Ragon, who gives an account of this ancient Rose Croix Francais, which is almost identical with the degree now worked in England, but long since abandoned in France objects to it on the very score of its Christian character. In this respect, the Rose Croix amongst all the upper degrees introduced to France in the middle of the 18th century stands alone, and it alone can with any probability be attributed to Scottish Jacobite inspiration. It was not, in fact, until three or four years after Lord Derwentwater or his mysterious successor, Lord Harnooster, had resigned the Grand Mastership in favor of the Duc d'Antin, in 1738, that the additional degrees were first heard of, and it was not until eight years after the Stuart cause had received its death blow at Culloden, that is to say in 1754, that the right of perfection in which the so-called Scots degrees were incorporated was drawn up in the following form. Right of perfection. 1. Entered apprentice. 2. Fellow craft. 3. Master mason. 4. Secret Master, 5. Perfect Master, 6. Intimate Secretary, 7. Intendant of the Buildings, 8. Provost and Judge, 9. Elect of 9, 10. Elect of 15, 11. Chief of the 12 Tribes, 12. Grand Master Architect, 13. Knight of the Ninth Arch, 14. Ancient Grand Elect, 15. Knight of the Sword, 16. Prince of Jerusalem. 17. Knight of the East and West. 18. Rose Croix Knight. 19. Grand Pontiff. 20. Grand Patriarch. 21. Grand Master of the Key of Masonry. 22. Prince of Libanus or Knight of the Royal Axe. 23. Sovereign Prince Adept. 24. Commander of the Black and White Eagle. 25. Commander of the Royal Secret. We have only to glance at the nomenclature of the last 22 of these degrees to see that on the basis of mere operative masonry, there has been built up a system composed of two elements, crusading chivalry and Judaic tradition. What else is there but Templarism? Even Mr. Gould, usually so reticent on Templar influence, admits it at this period. In France, some of the Scots lodges would appear to have very early manufactured new degrees connecting these very distinguished Scots Masons with the Knights Templar, and thus given rise to the subsequent flood of Templarism. The earliest of all are supposed to have been the Masons of Lyon, who invented the Kadosh degree, representing the vengeance of the Templars in 1741. From that time, new rites multiplied in France and Germany, but all those of French origin contained knightly and almost all Templar grades. In every case, the connecting link was composed of one or more Scots degrees. The name Kadosh here mentioned is a Hebrew word signifying holy or consecrated, which in the Kabbalah is found in conjunction with the Tetragrammaton. The degree is said to have developed from that of Grand Elect, one of the three degrees of vengeance, celebrating with sanguinary realism the avenging of the murder of Hiram, but in its final form of Knight Kadosh, later to become the 30th degree of the ancient and accepted Scottish rite, the Hiramic legend was changed into the history of the Templars with Jacques du Molay as the victim. So the reprobation of attack on authority personified by the master builder becomes approbation of attack on authority in the person of the King of France. 
the introduction of the upper degrees with their political and later on anti-Christian tendencies thus marked a complete departure from the fundamental principle of Freemasonry, that nothing concerning the religion or government shall ever be spoken of in the Lodge. For this reason they have been assailed not only by anti-Masonic writers, but Freemasons themselves. To represent Beruel and Robeson as the enemies of Freemasonry is therefore absolutely false. Neither of these men denounced craft masonry as practiced in England, but only the superstructure erected on the continent. Beruel indeed incurs the reproaches of Monnier for his championship of English Freemasons. He vaunts the respect for religious opinion and for authority. When he speaks of Freemasons in general, they are impious, rebellious successors of the Templars and Albigenses. But all those of England are innocent. More than this, all the entered apprentices, fellow crafts, and master masons in all parts of the world are innocent. There are only guilty ones in the higher degrees which are not essential to the institution and are sought by a small number of people. In this opinion of Barrowell's, a great number of Masonic writers concur. Clavel, Ragon, Ribold, Thory, Findel, and others too numerous to mention all indicate craft masonry as the only true kind and the upper degrees as constituting a danger to the order. Rebold, who gives a list of these writers, quotes a Masonic publication, authorized by the Grand Orient and the Supreme Council of France, in which it is said that, from all these rites, there result the most foolish conceptions, the most absurd legends, the most extravagant systems, the most immoral principles, and those the most dangerous for the peace and preservation of states, and that therefore, except the first degrees of masonry, which are really ancient and universal, everything is chimera, extravagance, futility, and lies. Did Beruel and Robeson ever use stronger language than this? To attribute the perversion of masonry to Jacobite influence would be absurd. How could it be supposed that either Ramsay or Lord Derwentwater, who died as a devout Catholic on the scaffold in 1746, could have been concerned in an attempt to undermine the Catholic faith or the monarchy of France? I would suggest, then, that the term Scots Masonry became simply a veil for Templarism. Templarism, moreover, of a very different kind to that which, from the original degree of Rose Croix, was derived. It was this so-called Scots masonry that, after the resignation of Lord Derwentwater, boldly came forward and claimed to be not merely a part of masonry, but the real masonry, possessed of a superior knowledge and entitled to greater privileges and the right to rule over the ordinary, i.e. craft masonry. The Grand Lodge of France seems, however, to have realized the danger of submitting to the domination of the Templar element, and on the death of the Duc d'Antin, and his replacement by the Comte de Clermont in 1743 signified its adherence to English craft masonry by proclaiming itself Grand Lodge Anglais de France and reissued the Constitutions of Anderson, first published in 1723, with the injunction that the Scots masons should be placed on the same level as the simple apprentices and fellow crafts and allowed to wear no badges of distinction. Grand Lodge of England appears to have been reassured by this proclamation as to the character of French masonry, for now, in 1743, it at last delivered a warrant to Grand Lodge of France. Yet, in reality, it was from this moment that French Freemasonry degenerated the most rapidly. The order was soon invaded by intriguers. This was rendered all the easier by the apathy of the Comte de Clermont, appointed Grand Master in 1743, who seems to have taken little interest in the order and employed a substitute in the person of a dancing master named Le Corne, a man of low character, through whose influence the lodges fell into a state of anarchy. Freemasonry was thus divided into warring factions. Le Corne and the crowd of low-class supporters who had followed him into the lodges founded a Grand Lodge of their own, Grand Lodge Le Corne, and in 1756, the original Freemasons again attempted to make craft masonry the national masonry of France by deleting the word Anglais from the appellation of Grand Lodge and renaming it Grand Lodge Nationale de France. But many lodges still continue to work the additional degrees. The rivalry between the two groups became so violent that in 1767 the government intervened and closed down Grand Lodge. 
The Templar group had, however, formed two separate associations, the Knights of the East, 1756, and the Council of the Emperors of the East and West, 1758. In 1761, a Jew named Stephen Morin was sent to America by the emperors, armed with a warrant from the Duc de Clermont and Grand Lodge of Paris, and bearing the sonorous title of Grand Elect Perfect and Sublime Master, with orders to establish a lodge in that country. In 1766, he was accused in Grand Lodge of propagating strange and monstrous doctrines, and his patent of Grand Inspector was withdrawn. Morin, however, had succeeded in establishing the right of perfection. Sixteen inspectors, nearly all Jews, were now appointed. These include Isaac Long, Isaac de Costa, Moses Hayes, B. Spitzer, Moses Cohen, Abraham Jacobs, and Hyman Long. Meanwhile, in France, the closing of Grand Lodge had not prevented meetings of Le Corne's group, which, on the death of the Duc de Clermont in 1772, instituted the Grand Orient with the Duc de Chartres the future Philippe Egalité as Grand Master. The Grand Orient then invited the Grand Lodge to revoke the degree of expulsion and unite with it, and this offer being accepted, the Revolutionary Party inevitably carried all before it, and the Duc de Chartres was declared Grand Master of all the councils, chapters, and Scotch lodges of France. In 1782, the Council of Emperors and the Knights of the East combined to form the Grand Chapitre General de France, which in 1786 joined up with the Grand Orient. The victory of the Revolutionary Party was then complete. It is necessary to enter into all these tedious details in order to understand the nature of the factions grouped together under the banner of Masonry at this period. The Martinist Papist attributes the revolutionary influences that now prevailed in the lodges to their invasion by the Templars and goes on to explain that this was owing to a change that had taken place in the Order de Temple. Under the Grand Mastership of the Regent and his successor, the Duke de Bourbon, the revolutionary elements amongst the Templars had had full play, but from 1741 onwards, the Grand Masters of the Order were supporters of the monarchy. When the revolution came, the Duke de Cos Brissac, who had been Grand Master since 1776, perished amongst the defenders of the throne. It was thus that by the middle of the century the order of the temple ceased to be a revolutionary force, and the discontented elements it had contained, no longer able to find in it a refuge, threw themselves into Freemasonry and entered into the higher degrees turned them to their subversive purpose. According to Papus, Le Corne was a member of the Templar group, and the dissensions that took place were principally a fight between the ex-Templars and the genuine Freemasons, which ended in the triumph of the former. Victorious rebels thus founded the Grand Orient of France. So a contemporary Mason is able to write, it is not excessive to say that the Masonic Revolution of 1773 was a prelude and the precursor to the Revolution of 1789. What must be well observed is the secret action of the Brothers of the Templar Rite. It is they who are the real fomenters of revolution. The others are only docile agents. But all this attributes the baneful influence of Templarism to the French Templars alone, and the existence of such a body rests on no absolutely certain evidence. What is certain, and admits of no denial on the part of any historian, is the inauguration of a Templar order in Germany, at the very moment when the so-called Scottish degrees were introduced into French masonry. We shall now return to 1738 and follow events that were taking place at this important moment beyond the Rhine. Chapter 7. German Templarism and French Illuminism The year after Ramsey's oration, that is to say in 1738, Frederick, Crown Prince of Prussia, the future Frederick the Great, who for two years had been carrying on a correspondence with Voltaire, suddenly evinced a curiosity to know the secrets of Freemasonry, which he had hitherto derided as kinderspiel, and accordingly went through a hasty initiation during the night of August 14th to 15th, whilst passing through Brunswick. The ceremony took place not at a Masonic lodge, but at a hotel, in the presence of a deputation summoned by the Graf von Lipp Buckberg from the Grand Lodge at Hamburg for the occasion. It is evident that something of an unusual kind must have occurred to necessitate these speedy and makeshift arrangements. 
Carlyle, in his account of the episode, endeavors to pass it off as a very trifling circumstance. A reason the more for regarding it as of the highest importance, since we know now from facts that have recently come to light how carefully Carlyle was spoon-fed by Potsdam whilst writing his book on Frederick the Great. But let us follow Frederick's Masonic career. In June 1740, after his accession to the throne, his interest in Masonry had clearly not waned. For we find him presiding over a lodge at Charlottesburg, where he received into the order two of his brothers, his brother-in-law and Duke Frederick William of Holsteinbeck. At his desire, the Baron de Bielfeld and his privy councillor Jordan founded a lodge at Berlin, the Three Globes, which by 1746 had no less than 14 lodges under its jurisdiction. In this same year of 1740, Voltaire, in response to urgent invitations, paid his first visit to Frederick the Great in Germany. Voltaire is usually said not to have yet become a Mason, and the date of his initiation is supposed to have been 1778, when he was received into the Lodge de Neuf Sur in Paris. But this by no means precludes the possibility that he had belonged to another Masonic order at an earlier date. At any rate, Voltaire's visit to Germany was followed by two remarkable events in the Masonic world of France. The first of these was the institution of the additional degrees. The second, perhaps not wholly unconnected with the first, was the arrival in Paris of a Masonic delegate from Germany named von Marshall, who brought with him instructions for a new, or rather, a revived order of Templarism, in which he attempted to interest Prince Charles Edward and his followers. Von Marshall was followed about two years later by Baron von Hunt, who had been initiated in 1741 into the three degrees of craft masonry in Germany, and now came to consecrate a lodge in Paris. According to von Hunt's own account, he was then received into the Order of the Temple by an unknown knight of the Red Plume, in the presence of Lord Kilmarnock, and was presented as a distinguished brother to the Prince Charles Edward whom he imagined to be Grand Master of the Order. But all this was afterwards shown to be a pure fabrication, for Prince Charles Edward denied all knowledge of the affair, and von Hunt himself admitted later he did not know the name of the lodge or chapter in which he was received, but that he was directed from a hidden center, and by unknown superiors, whose identity he was bound not to reveal. In reality, it appears that von Hunt's account was exactly the opposite of the truth and that it was von Hunt who, seconding von Marshall's effort, tried to enroll Prince Charles Edward in the new German order, by assuring him that he could raise powerful support for the Stuart cause under the cover of reorganizing the Templar order, of which he claimed to possess the true secrets handed down from the knights of the 14th century. By way of further rehabilitating the order, von Hunt declared that all the accusations brought against it by Philippe, Le Bel, and the Pope were based on false charges manufactured by two recreant knights named Nofadai and Florian as a revenge for having been deprived of their commands by the order in consequence of certain crimes they had committed. According to Le Cotil de Cantelou, von Hunt eventually succeeded after the defeat of Colloden in persuading Prince Charles Edward to enter his order. But this is extremely doubtful. At any rate, when in 1751 von Hunt officially founded his new Templar order under the name of Strict Observance, the unfortunate Charles Edward played no part at all in the scheme. As Mr. Gould has truly observed, no trace of Jacobite intrigues ever blended with the teaching of the Strict Observance. The order of Strict Observance was in reality a purely German association composed of men drawn entirely from the intellectual and aristocratic classes and in imitation of the chivalric orders of the past, known to each other under knightly titles. Thus, Prince Charles of Hesse became Equus a Lyon Resurgent, Duke Ferdinand of Brunswick, Equus of Victoria, the Prussian minister von Bischofswerder, Equus a Griffo, Baron de Watcher, Equus a Sorazo, Christian Bode, Councillor of Legation in Saxe-Gotha, Equus a Lilio Convalium, Von Hogwitz, cabinet minister of Frederick the Great, Equus Montesancto, etc. 
But according to the declarations of the order, the official leaders, knights of the moon, the star, the golden sun, or of the sacred mountain, were simply figureheads. The real leaders, known as the unknown superiors, remained in the background, unadorned by titles of chivalry, but exercising supreme jurisdiction over the order. The system had been foreshadowed by the invisibles of the 17th century, Rosicrucianism. But now, instead of an intangible group whose very existence was only known vaguely to the world, there appeared in the light of day a powerful organization led apparently by men of influence and position, yet secretly directed by hidden chiefs. Mirabeau has described the advent of these mysterious directors in the following passage. In about 1756, there appeared, as if they had come out of the ground, men sent, they said, by unknown superiors, and armed with powers to reform the order of Freemasonry, and reestablish it in its ancient purity. One of these missionaries, named Johnston, came to Weimar and Jena, where he established himself. He was received in the best way in the world by the brothers, Freemasons, who were lured by the hope of great secrets, of important discoveries which were never made known to them. Now, in the manuscripts of the Prince of Hesse, published by Le Coutier de Cantelot, it is said that this man Johnston, or rather Johnson, who proclaimed himself to be Grand Prior of the Order, was a Jew named Licht or Lucht. Gould says that his real name was either Lucht or Becker, but that he professed to be an Englishman, although unable to speak the English language, hence his assumption of the name Johnson. Mr. Gould has described Johnson as a consummate rogue and unmitigated vagabond, of almost repulsive demeanor and of no education, but gifted with boundless impudence and low cunning. Indeed, Von Hunt himself, after enlisting Johnson's services, found him too dangerous and declared him to be an adventurer. Johnson was thereupon arrested by Von Hunt's friend, the counselor Von Pritsch, and thrown into the castle of Wartburg, where sudden death ended his career. It is, however, improbable that Mirabeau could be right in indicating Johnson as one of the unknown superiors, who were doubtless men of vaster conceptions than this adventurer appears to have been. Moreover, the manner of his end clearly proves that he occupied a subordinate position in the strict observance. Here, then, we have a very curious sequence of events, which it may be well to recapitulate briefly in order to appreciate their full significance. 1737, oration of Chevalier Ramsey indicating Templar origin of Freemasonry, but making no mention of upper degrees. 1738, Duke Dantin becomes Grand Master of French Freemasonry in the place of Lord Harnuster. 1738, Frederick, Crown Prince of Prussia, initiated into Masonry at Brunswick. 1740, Voltaire pays his first visit to Frederick, now King. 1741, Baron von Marshall arrives in Paris with a plan for reviving the Templar order. Templar degrees first heard of in France under name of Scots Masonry. 1743, arrival in France of Baron von Hunt with fresh plans for reviving the Templar order. Degree of Knight Kadosh celebrating vengeance of Templars said to have been instituted at Lyon. 1750, Voltaire goes to spend three years with Frederick. 1751, Templar Order of the Strict Observance founded by Von Hunt. 1754, Templar Order of the Strict Observance founded by Von Hunt. 1754, Rite of Perfection, early form of Scottish Rite, founded in France. 1761, Frederick acknowledged head of Scottish Rite. Morin sent to found Rite of Perfection in America. 1762, Grand Masonic Constitutions ratified in Berlin. It will be seen, then, that what Mr. Gould describes as the flood of Templarism, which both he and Mr. Tuckett attribute to the so-called Scots Masons, corresponds precisely with the decline of Jacobite and the rise of German influence. Would it not, therefore, appear probable that, except in the case of the Rose Croix degree, the authors of the upper degrees were not Scotsmen nor Jacobites? that Scots masonry was a term used to cover not merely Templarism, but more especially German Templarism, and that the real author and inspirer of the movement was Frederick the Great? No, it is significant to find that in the history of the Order du Temple, publishing at the beginning of the 19th century, 
Frederick the Great is cited as one of the most distinguished members of this order in the past, and the Abbe Gregoire adds that he was consecrated at Remersburg, Rheinsburg, in 1738. That is to say, in the same year that he was initiated into masonry at Brunswick. There is therefore a definite reason for connecting Frederick with Templarism at this date. I would suggest then that the truth about the Templar succession may be found in one of the two following theories. One, that the documents produced by the Order du Temple in the 19th century, including the Charter of Larminius, were genuine, that the Order had never ceased to exist since the days of the Crusades, that the Templar heresy was Johannism, but that this was not held by the Templars who escaped to Scotland, that the Rose Croix degree in its purely Christian form was introduced by the Scottish Templars to Scotland and 400 years later brought by Ramsay to France, that the master of the temple at this date was the regent, Philip, Duke d'Orleans, as stated in the Charter of Larminius. Finally, that after this, fresh Templar degrees were introduced from Germany by von Hunt, acting on behalf of Frederick the Great. Number two, that the documents produced by the Order du Temple in the 19th century were, as M. Matter declares, early 18th century fabrications. That although in view of the tradition preserved in the Royal Order of Scotland, there appears to be good reason to believe the story of the Scottish Templars and the origin of the Rose Croix degree, the rest of the history of the Templars, including the Charter of Larminius, was an invention of the concealed superiors of the strict observance in Germany and that the most important of these concealed superiors were Frederick the Great and Voltaire. I shall not attempt to decide which of these two theories is correct. All that I do maintain is that in either case, the preponderating role in Templarism at the crisis was played by Frederick the Great, probably with the cooperation of Voltaire, who is in his Essay sur le Mur, championed the cause of the Templars. Let us follow the reasons for arriving at this conclusion. Ramsey's oration in 1737 connecting Freemasonry with the Templars may well have come to the ears of Frederick and suggested to him the idea of using Masonry as a cover for his intrigues, hence his hasty initiation at Brunswick. But in order to acquire influence in a secret society, it is always necessary to establish a claim to superior knowledge, and Templarism seemed to provide a fruitful source of inspiration. For this purpose, new light must be thrown on the order. Now there was probably no one better qualified than Voltaire, with his knowledge of the ancient and medieval world and hatred of the Catholic Church, to undertake the construction of a historical romance subversive of the Catholic faith, hence the urgent summons to the philosopher to visit Frederick. We can imagine Voltaire delving amongst the records of the past in order to reconstruct the Templar heresy. This was clearly Gnostic, and the Mandeans, or Christians of St. John, may well have appeared to present the required characteristics. If it could be shown that here in Johannism, true primitive Christianity was to be found, what a blow for the infame! A skillful forger could easily be found to fabricate the documents said to have been preserved in the secret archives of the order. Further, we find von Marshall arriving in the following year in France to reorganize the Templars, and von Hunt later claiming to be in possession of the true secrets of the order, handed down from the 14th century. That some documents bearing on this question were either discovered or fabricated under the direction of Frederick the Great seems the more probable from the existence of a Masonic tradition to this effect. Thus, Dr. Oliver quotes a report of the Grand Inspectors General in the 19th century, stating that during the Crusades, at which 27,000 Masons were present, some Masonic MSS of great importance were discovered among the descendants of the ancient Jews, and that other valuable documents were found at different periods down to the year of light 557, i.e. 1553, at which time a record came to light in Syrian characters relating to the most remote antiquity and from which it would appear that the world is many thousand years older than given by the Mosaic account. Few of these characters were translated till the reign of our illustrious and most enlightened brother Frederick II, King of Prussia, whose well-known zeal for the craft was the cause of so much improvement in the society over which he condescended to preside. I suggest then that the documents had referred to and containing the secrets claimed by von Hunt may have been the ones afterwards published by the Order du Temple in the 19th century. 
and that if unauthentic, they were the work of Voltaire, aided probably by a Jew capable of forging Syriac manuscripts. That Johnson was the Jew in question seems probable, since Findel definitely asserts that the history of the continuation of the Order of Knights Templar was his work. Frederick, as we know, was in the habit of employing Jews to carry out shady transactions, and he may well have used Johnson to forge documents, as he used a frame to coin false money for him. It would be further quite in keeping with his policy to get rid of the man as soon as he served his purpose, lest he should betray his secrets. At any rate, whatever were the methods employed by Frederick the Great for obtaining control over masonry, the fruitful results of that very trifling circumstance, his initiation at Brunswick, became more and more apparent as the century advances. Thus, when in 1786 the rite of perfection was reorganized and rechristened, the ancient and accepted Scottish rite, always the same Scottish cover for Prussianism. It is said to have been Frederick who conducted operations, drew up the new constitutions of the order, and rearranged the degrees so as to bring the total number up to 33, as follows. 26, Prince of Mercy, 27, Sovereign Commander of the Temple, 28, Knight of the Sun, 29, Grand Scotch Knight of St. Andrew, 30, Grand Elect Knight of Kadosh, 31, Grand Inspector, Inquisitor Commander, 32, Sublime Prince of the Royal Secret, and 33, Sovereign Grand Inspector General. In the last four degrees, Frederick the Great and Prussia play an important part. In the 30th degree of Knight Kadosh, largely modeled on the Vemgarics, the knights wear Teutonic crosses. The throne is surmounted by the double-headed eagle of Prussia, and the president, who is called thrice Poisson Grand Master, represents Frederick himself. In the 32nd degree of Sublime Prince of the Royal Secret, Frederick is described as the head of Continental Freemasonry. In the 33rd degree of Sovereign Grand Inspector General, the jewel is again the double-headed eagle, and the Sovereign Grand Commander is Frederick, who at the time this degree was instituted figured with Philippe, Duke d'Orleans, Grand Master of the Grand Orient, as his lieutenant. The most important of these innovations was the 32nd degree, which was in reality a system rather than a degree for bringing together the Masons of all countries under one head, hence the immense power acquired by Frederick. By 1786, French Masonry was thus entirely Prussianized, and Frederick had indeed become the idol of Masonry everywhere. Yet probably no one ever despised Freemasonry more profoundly. As the American Mason Albert Pike shrewdly observed, there is no doubt that Frederick came to the conclusion that the great pretensions of Masonry in the Blue Degrees were merely imaginary and deceptive. He ridiculed the order, and thought its ceremonies mere child's play, and some of his sayings to that effect have been preserved. It does not at all follow that he might not at a later day found it politic to put himself at the head of an order that had become a power. It is not without significance to find that in the year following the official foundation of the strict observance, that is to say in 1752, Lord Holderness, in a letter to the British ambassador in Paris, Lord Albemarle, headed very secret, speaks of the influence which the King of Prussia has of late obtained over all the French councils. And a few weeks later, Lord Albemarle's refers to the great influence of the Prussian court over the French councils, by which they are so blinded as not to be able to judge for themselves. But it is time to turn to another sphere of activity which Masonry opened out to the ambitions of Frederick. The making of the Encyclopedia, which even those writers the most skeptical with regard to secret influences behind the revolutionary movement admit to have contributed towards the final cataclysm, is a question on which official history has thrown but little light. According to the authorized version of the story, as related, for example, in Lord Morley's work on the Encyclopedists, the plan of translating Ephraim's Chambers' Cyclopedia, which had appeared in 1728, was suggested to Diderot some 15 years later by a French bookseller named Le Breton. Diderot's fertile and energetic intelligence transformed the scheme. It was resolved to make Chambers' work a mere starting point for a new enterprise of far wider scope. We then go on to read of the financial difficulties that now beset the publisher, of the embarrassment of Diderot, 
who felt himself unequal to the task of arranging and supervising every department of a new book that was to include the whole circle of the sciences, of the fortunate enlisting of de Lambert as a collaborator, and later of men belonging to all kinds of professions, all united in a work that was as useful as it was laborious, without any view of interest, without any common understanding and agreement further of the cruel persecutions encountered at the hands of the Jesuits, who had expected at least to have control of the articles on theology, and finally of the tyrannical suppression of the great work on account of the anti-Christian tendencies these same articles displayed. Now for a further light on the matter. In the famous speech of the Chevalier Ramsey already quoted, which was delivered at Grand Lodge of Paris in 1737, the following passage occurs. The fourth quality required in our order is the taste for useful sciences and the liberal arts. Thus the order exacts of each of you to contribute, by his protection, liberality or labor, to a vast work for which no academy can suffice, because all these societies being composed of a very small number of men, their work cannot embrace an object so extended. All the grand masters in Germany, England, Italy, and elsewhere exhort all the learned men and all the artisans of the fraternity to unite to furnish the materials for a universal dictionary of all the liberal arts and useful sciences, excepting only theology and politics. The work has already been commenced in London, and by means of the unions of our brothers it may be carried to a conclusion in a few years. So, after all, it was no enterprising bookseller, no brilliantly inspired philosopher, who conceived the idea of the encyclopedia, but a powerful international organization able to employ the services of more men than all the academies could supply, which devised the scheme at least six years before the date at which is said to have occurred to Diderot. Thus the whole story, as usually told to us, would appear to be a complete fabrication. Struggling publishers, toiling literatures, carrying out their superhuman task as independent men of letters, without the patronage of the great which Lord Morley points out as one of the most important facts in the history of the encyclopedia. Writers of all kinds bound together by no common understanding or agreement are all seen in reality to have been closely associated as artisans of the fraternity, carrying out the orders of their superiors. The encyclopedia, therefore, was essentially a Masonic publication, and papists, whilst erroneously attributing the famous oration and consequently the plan of the Encyclopédie to the inspiration of the Duc d'Antin emphasizes the importance of this fact. Thus he writes, The revolution manifests itself by two stages. First, intellectual revolution by the publication of the Encyclopédia due to French Freemasonry under the high inspiration of the Duc d'Antin Second, occult revolution in the lodges due to, in great part, the members of the Templar Rite and executed by a group of expelled Freemasons afterwards amnestied. The Masonic authorship of the Encyclopedia and the consequent dissemination of revolutionary doctrines has remained no matter of doubt to the Freemasons of France. On the contrary, they glory in the fact that the Congress of the Grand Orient in 1904, the Freemason Bonnet declared in the 18th century, the glorious line of encyclopedists formed in our temples a fervent audience, which was then alone in invoking the radiant device as yet unknown to the crowd. Liberty, equality, fraternity. The revolutionary seed quickly germinated amidst this elite. Our illustrious Freemasons, de Lambert, Diderot, Helvetius, de Holbach, Voltaire, Condorcet, completed the evolution of minds and prepared the new era. And when the Bastille fell, Freemasonry had the supreme honor of giving to humanity the Charter, i.e. the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which it had elaborated with devotion. Applause. This Charter, the orator went on to say, was the work of the Freemason Lafayette, and was adopted by the Constituent Assembly, of which more than 300 members were Freemasons. But in using the lodges to sow the seeds of revolution, the encyclopedias betrayed not only the cause of monarchy, but of masonry as well. It will be noticed that, in conformity with true Masonic principles, Ramsey in his oration expressly stated that the encyclopedia was to concern itself with the liberal arts and sciences, and that theology and politics were to be excluded from the contemplated scheme. 
How then did it come to pass that these were eventually the two subjects to which the encyclopedists devoted the greatest attention? So that their work became principally an attack on church and monarchy. If Papus was right in attributing the revolutionary tendency to the encyclopedia, from the time of the famous oration, then Ramsey could only be set down as the profoundest hypocrite or as the mouthpiece of hypocrites professing intentions, the very reverse of their real designs. A far more probable explanation seems to be that during the interval between Ramsey's speech and the date when the encyclopedia was begun in earnest, the scheme underwent a change. It will be noticed that the year of 1746, when Diderot and D'Alembert are said to have embarked on their task, coincided with the decadence. It will be noticed that the year of 1746, when Diderot and D'Alembert are said to have embarked on their task, coincided with the decadence of French Freemasonry under the Comte de Clermont and the invasion of the lodges by the subversive elements. Thus, the project propounded with the best intentions by the Freemasons of 1737 was filched by their revolutionary successors and turned to a diametrically opposite purpose. But it is not to the dancing master Lacorne and his middle-class following that we can attribute the efficiency with which not only the encyclopedia, but a host of minor revolutionary publications were circulated all over France. Frederick the Great had seen his opportunity. If I am right in my surmise that Ramsey's speech had reached the ears of Frederick, the prospect of the encyclopedia contained therein may well have appeared to him a magnificent method for obtaining a footing in the intellectual circles of France. Hence then, doubtless, an additional reason for his hasty initiation into masonry, his summons to Voltaire, and his subsequent overtures to Diderot and de Lambert, who by the time the first volume of the Encyclopedia appeared in 1751, had both been made members of the Royal Academy of Prussia. In the following year, Frederick offered de Lambert the presidency of the Academy in place of Maupertuis, an offer which was refused. But in 1755 and again in 1763, de Lambert visited Frederick in Germany, and received his pension regularly from Berlin. It is therefore not surprising that when the encyclopedia had reached the letter P, it included, in an unsigned article on Prussia, a panegyric on the virtues of the talents and the illustrious monarch who presided over the destinies of that favored country. The art of Frederick the Great, as of his successors on the throne of the Hohenzollerns, was to make use of every movement that could further the design of Prussian supremacy. He used the Freemasons as he used the philosophers and as he used the Jews to carry out his great scheme, the destruction of the French monarchy and of the alliance between France and Austria. Whilst through his representatives at the court of France, he was able to create discord between Versailles and Vienna and bring discredit on Marie Antoinette. Through his allies in the Masonic lodges and in the secret societies, he was able to reach the people of France. The gold and the printing presses of Frederick the Great were added to those of the Orleanists for the circulation of seditious literature throughout the provinces. So, as the century advanced, the association founded by royalists and Catholics was turned into an engine of destruction by revolutionary intriguers. The rites and symbols were gradually perverted to an end directly opposed to that which they had been instituted and the two degrees of Rose Croix and Knight Kadosh came to symbolize respectively war on religion and war on the monarchy of France. It is no Orthodox Catholic, but an occultist and Rosicrucian who thus describes the role of Masonry in the Revolution. Masonry has not only been profaned, but it has been served as a cover and pretext for the plots of anarchy by the occult influence of the avengers of Jacques du Molay and the continuers of the schismatic work of the Temple. Instead of avenging the death of Hiram, they have avenged his assassins. The anarchists have taken the plumb line, the square, and the mallet, and have written on them liberty, equality, fraternity. That is to say, liberty for envyings, equality in degradation, fraternity for destruction. Those are all men whom the church had justly condemned, and that she will always condemn. But it is time to turn to another Masonic power, which meanwhile had entered the lists, the Martinists, or French Illumines. French Illuminism. Whilst Frederick the Great, the Freemasons, the Encyclopedists, and the Orleanists were working on the material plane to undermine the church and monarchy in France, 
Another cult had arisen, which by the middle of the century succeeded in insinuating itself into the lodges. This was a recrudescence of the old craze for occultism, which now spread like wildfire all over Europe from Bordeaux to St. Petersburg. During the reign of Anna of Courland, 1730-40, to 40, the Russian court was permeated with superstition, and professional magicians and charlatans of every kind were encouraged. The upper classes of Germany in the 18th century proved equally susceptible to the attractions of the supernatural, and princes desirous of long life or greater power eagerly pursued the quest of the philosopher's stone, the elixir of life, and evokes spirits under the direction of occultists in their service. In France, occultism reduced to a system adopted the outer forms of masonry as a cover to the propagation of its doctrines. It was in 1754 that Martins de Pascali, or Paschali, a Rosecroix mason, founded his order of Illus Cohen's elected priests, known later as the Martinists or the French Illumines. Although brought up in the Christian faith, Pasquali has been frequently described as a Jew. The Baron de Glician, himself a Martinist and a member of the Amos Runus, throws an interesting light on the matter in this passage. Pasquale's was originally Spanish, perhaps of the Jewish race, since his disciples inherited from him a large number of Jewish manuscripts. It was this Kabbalistic sect, the Martinists, which now became the third great Masonic power in France. The right of the Martinists was broadly divided into two classes, in the first of which was represented the fall of man and in the second his final restoration. A further variation on the Masonic theme of a loss and a recovery. After the first three craft degrees came the Cohen degrees of the same, Apprentice Cohen, Fellow Craft Cohen, and Master Cohen, then those of Grand Architect, Grand Elect of Zerubbabel, or Knight of the East, but above these were concealed degrees leading up to the Rose Croix, which formed the capstone of the edifice. Pasquale first established his right at Marseilles, Toulouse, and Bordeaux, then in Paris, and before long Martinist lodges spread all over France with the center at Lyon, under the direction of Willermoz, a prosperous merchant living there. From this moment, other occult orders sprang up in all directions. In 1760, Dom Pernetti founded his sect of Illumines d'Avignon in that city, declaring himself a high initiate of Freemasonry and teaching the doctrines of Swedenborg. Later, a certain Chastinier founded the Illumines Theosophy. And in 1783, the Marquis de Thome started a purified variety of Swedenborgianism under the name of Rite of Swedenborg. Beneath all these occult sects, one common source of inspiration is to be found the perverted and magical Kabbalah of the Jews, that conglomeration of wild theosophical imaginings and barbaric superstitions founded on ancient pagan cults and added to throughout 17 centuries by succeeding generations of Jewish occultists. This influence is particularly to be detected in the various forms of the Rose Croix degree, which in nearly all these associations forms the highest and most secret degree. The ritual of the eminent order of the Knights of the Black Eagle or Sovereigns of the Rose Croix, a secret and unpublished document of the 18th century, which differs entirely from the published rituals, explains that no one can attain to knowledge of the highest sciences without the clavicules de Salomon, of which the real secrets were never committed to print and which is said to contain the whole of the Kabbalistic science. The catechism of this same degree deals mainly with the transmutation of metals, the philosopher's stone, etc. In the rite of perfection as worked in France and America, this Kabbalistic influence is shown in those degrees known under the name of the ineffable degrees, derived from the Jewish belief in the mystery that surrounds the ineffable name of God. According to the custom of the Jews, the sacred name Jehovah or Javeh, composed of the four letters Yod, He, Vau, He, which formed the tetragrammaton, was never to be pronounced by the profane, who were obliged to substitute for it the word Adonai. The tetragrammaton might only be uttered once a year on the Day of Atonement by the High Priest in the Holy of Holies amid the sound of trumpets and cymbals, which prevented the people from hearing it. It is said that in consequence of the people thus refraining from its utterance, the true pronunciation of the name was at last lost. The Jews further believed that the Tetragrammaton was possessed of unbounded powers. 
He who pronounces it shakes heaven and earth and inspires the very angels with astonishment and terror. The ineffable name thus conferred miraculous gifts. It was engraved on the rod of Moses and enabled him to perform wonders, just as, according to the Toldot Yeshu, it conferred the same powers on Christ. The superstition was clearly a part of Rosicrucian tradition, for the symbol of the Tetragrammaton with a triangle, adopted by the Masonic lodges, figures in Flood's Kabbalistic system. In the ineffable degrees, it was invested with all the mystic awe by which it is surrounded in Jewish theology. And according to early American working, brothers and companions of these degrees received the name of God, as it was revealed to Enoch and were sworn to pronounce it but once in their lives. In the alchemical version of the Rose Qua degree, referred to above, the ineffable name is actually invested with magical powers, as in the Jewish Kabbalah. Ragon, after describing the Jewish ceremony when the word Jehovah was pronounced by the high priest in the Holy of Holies, goes on to say that Shem Ham Forash, another term for the Tetragrammaton, forms the sacred word of a Scotch degree, and that this belief in its mystic properties will be found at the head of the instructions for the third degree of the Knight of the Black Eagle, called Rose Qua. Thus, Question, what is the most powerful name of God on the pentaculum? Answer, Adonai. Question, what is its power? Answer, to move the universe. That one of the knights who had the good fortune to pronounce it Kabbalistically would have at his disposal the powers that inhabit the four elements and the celestial spirits and would possess all the virtues possible to man that this form of the rose qua was of purely Jewish origin is thus clearly evident. In the address to the candidate for initiation into the rose qua degree at the lodge of the Contrat Social, it is stated, This degree, which includes an order of perfect masons, was brought to light by Brother R., who took it from the Kabbalistic treasure of the doctor and Rabbi Nimuth, chief of the synagogue of Leiden in Holland who had preserved its precious secrets and its costume, both of which we shall see in the same order in which he placed them in this mysterious Talmud. Now we know that in the 18th century, a society of Rosicrucian magicians had been instituted in Florence, which was believed to date back to the 15th century and to have been partly, if not wholly, composed of Orientals, as we shall see in the next chapter. But it seems probable that this sect, whilst secretly inspiring the Rose Qua Masons, was itself either nameless or concealed under a disguise. Thus, in 1782, an English Freemason writes, I have found some rather curious MSS in Algiers in Hebrew relating to the society of the Rosicrucians, which exists at present under another name, which the same forms. I hope, moreover, to be admitted to their knowledge. It has frequently been argued that the Jews can have played no part in Freemasonry at this period since they themselves were not admitted to the lodges, but this is by no means certain. In the article from the Gentleman's Magazine already quoted, it is stated that the Jews are admitted. De Luchet further quotes the instance of David Moses Hertz, received in a London lodge in 1787, and the author of Le Franc Maisons, a classes, published in 1746, states that he has seen three Jews received into a lodge at Amsterdam. In the Melchizedek lodges of the continent, non-Christians were openly admitted, and here again the Rose Qua degree occupies the most important place. The highest degrees of this rite were the initiated brothers of Asia, the masters of the wise, and the royal priests, otherwise known as the degree of Melchizedek, or the true brothers of the Rose Qua. This order, usually described as the Asiatic Brethren, of which the center was in Vienna, and the leader a certain Baron von Eckhofen, is said to have been a continuation of the Brothers of the Golden and Rosy Cross, a revival of the 17th century Rosicrucians organized in 1710 by a Saxon priest, Samuel Richter, known as Sincerus Renatus. The real origins of the Asiatic Brethren are, however, obscure, and little literature on the subject is to be found in this country. Their further title of the Knights and Brethren of St. John the Evangelist suggests Johannite inspiration and was clearly an imposture, since they included Jews, Turks, Persians, and Armenians. De Luchet, who as a contemporary was in position to acquire first-hand information, thus describes the organization of the order, which it will be seen was entirely Judaic. 
The superior direction is called the small and constant Sanhedrin of Europe. The names of those employed by which they conceal themselves from their inferiors are Hebrew. The signs of the third principal degree, i.e. the rose croix, are Urim and Thummim. The order has the true secrets and the explanations, moral and physical, of the hieroglyphics of the very venerable order of Freemasonry. The initiate has to swear absolute submission and unswearing obedience to the laws of the order and to follow its laws implicitly to the end of his life, without asking by whom they were given or whence they came. Who, asks Deluche, gave to the order these so-called secrets? That is the great and insidious question for the secret societies. But the initiate who remains and must remain eternally in the order never finds this out. He dare not even ask it. He must promise never to ask it. In this way, those who participate in the secrets of the order remain the masters. Again, as in the strict observance, the same system of concealed superiors, that same blind obedience to unknown directors. Under the guidance of these various sects, the Illumines' wave of occultism swept over France, and lodges everywhere became centers of instruction on the Kabbalah, magic, divination, alchemy, and theosophy. Masonic rites degenerated into ceremonies for the evocation of spirits. Women, who were now admitted to these assemblies, screamed, fainted, fell into convulsions, and lent themselves to experiments of the most horrible kind. By means of these occult practices, the Illumines in time became the third great Masonic power in France, and the rival orders perceived the expediency of joining forces. Accordingly, in 1771, an amalgamation of all the Masonic groups was effected at the new lodge of the Amos Runis. The founder of this lodge was Savalette de Lang, keeper of the royal treasury, grand officer of the Grand Orient, and a high initiate of Masonry versed in all mysteries, in all the lodges, and in all the plots. In order to unite them, he made his lodge a mixture of all sophistic, Martinist, and Masonic systems. And as a bait to the aristocracy, organized balls and concerts at which the adepts, male and female, danced and feasted, or sang of the beauties of their liberty and equality, little knowing that above them was a secret committee which was arranging to extend this equality beyond the lodge, to rank and fortune, to castles and to cottages, to marquesses and bourgeois alike. A further development of the Amos Runis was the right of the Philalethes, compounded by Savalette de Lang in 1773, out of Swedenborgian, Martinist, and Rosicrucian mysteries, into which the higher initiates of the Amos Runis, Count de Gabellen, the Prince de Hesse, Condorcet, the Vicomte de Tavenis, Willemus, and others were initiated. A modified form of this rite was instituted at Narbonne in 1780 under the name of Free and Accepted Masons de Rit Primitif. The English nomenclature being adopted, according to Clavel, in order to make it appear that the rite emanated from England. In reality, its founder, the Marquis de Chef de Bien, Dormesson, a member of the Grand Orient and of the Amos Runis, drew his inspiration from certain German Freemasons with whom he maintained throughout close relations and who were presumably members of the strict observance. Since Chef de Bien was a member of this order, in which he bore the title of Equus Acapit Gilito, the correspondence that passed between Chef de Bien and Salvette de Lang, recently discovered and published in France, is one of the most illuminating records of the Masonic ramifications in existence before the revolution ever brought to light. To judge by the tone of these letters, the leaders of the Rit Primitif would appear to have been law-abiding and loyal gentlemen devoted to the Catholic religion. Yet, in their passion for new forms of masonry and thirst for occult lore, ready to associate themselves with every kind of adventure and charlatan who might be able to initiate them into further mysteries, in the curious notes drawn up by Savalade for the guidance of the Marquis de Chef de Bien, we catch a glimpse of the power behind the philosophers of the salons and the aristocratic adepts of the lodges, the professional magicians and men of mystery, and behind these again the concealed directors of the secret societies, the real initiates. The Magicians 
The part played by magicians during the period preceding the French Revolution is of course a matter of common knowledge and has never been disputed by official history. But like the schools of philosophers, this sudden crop of magicians is always represented as a sporadic growth called into being by the idle and curious society of the day. The important point to realize is that just as the philosophers were all Freemasons, the principal magicians were not only Freemasons but members of occult secret societies. It is therefore not as isolated charlatans but as agents of some hidden power that we must regard the men whom we will now pass in a rapid survey. One of the first to appear in the field was Schropfer, a coffee house keeper of Leipzig, who declared that no one could be a true Freemason without practicing magic. Accordingly, he proclaimed himself the reformer of Freemasonry and set up a lodge in his own house with a rite based on the Rose Quad degree for the purpose of evoking spirits. The meetings took place at the dead of night, when by means of carefully arranged lights, magic mirrors, and possibly of electricity, Schropfer contrived to produce apparitions which his disciples, under the influence of strong punch, took to be visitors from the other world. In the end, Schropfer, driven crazy by his own incantations, blew out his brains in a garden near Leipzig. According to Licutil de Cantelot, it was Schropfer who indoctrinated the famous Comte de Saint-Germain, the master of our modern Comasonic lodges. The identity of this mysterious personage has never been established. By some contemporaries, he was said to be a natural son of the King of Portugal, by others, the son of a Jew and a Polish princess. The Duc de Choisil, on being asked whether he knew of the origin of Saint Germain, replied, No doubt we know it. He is the son of a Portuguese Jew who exploits the credulity of the town and court. In 1780, a rumor went round that his father was a Jew of Bordeaux, but according to the souvenirs of the Marquis de Crecchi, the Baron de Pretour, discovered from the archives of his ministry, that the pretended Comte de Saint-Germain was the son of a Jewish doctor of Strasbourg, that his real name was Daniel Wolf, and that he was born in 1704. The general opinion thus appears to have been in favor of his Jewish ancestry. Saint-Germain seems first to have been heard of in Germany about 1740, where his marvelous powers attracted the attention of the Maréchal de Belle Isle, who always the ready dupe of charlatans brought him back with him to the court of France, where he speedily gained the favor of Madame de Pompadour. The Marquis before long presented him to the king, who granted him an apartment at Chambord, and, enchanted by his brilliant wit, frequently spent long evenings in conversation with him in the rooms of Madame de Pompadour. Meanwhile, his invention of flat-bottomed boats for the invasion of England raised him still higher in the estimation of the Maréchal de Belle Isle. In 1761, we hear of him as living in great splendor in Holland, and giving out that he had reached the age of 74, though appearing to be only 50. If this were so, he must have been 97 at the time of his death in 1784 at Schleswig. But this feat of longevity is far from satisfying his modern admirers, who declare that St. Germain did not die in 1784, but is still alive today in some corner of Eastern Europe. This is in accordance with the theory, said to have been circulated by St. Germain himself, that by the 18th century he had passed through several incarnations, and that the last one had continued for 1,500 years. Beruel, however, explains that St. Germain, in thus referring to his age, spoke in Masonic language, in which a man who has taken the first degree is said to be three years old, after the second five or the third seven, so that by means of the huge increase, the higher degrees conferred it might be quite possible for an exalted adept to attain the age of 1500. St. Germain has been represented by modern writers, not only those who compose his following, as a person of extraordinary attainments, a sort of superman towering over the minor magicians of his day. Contemporaries, however, take him less seriously and represent him rather as an expert charlatan, whom the wits of the salons made the butt of pleasantries. His principal importance on the subject of this book consists, however, in his influence on the secret societies. According to the memoir Authentique, Pour Severe la Histoire de Comte de Cagliostro, 
Saint Germain was the Grand Master of Freemasonry, and it was he who initiated Cagliostro into the mysteries of Egyptian Masonry. Joseph Balsamo, born in 1743, who assumed the name of Comte de Cagliostro as a magician far eclipsed his master. Like Saint Germain, he was generally reputed to be a Jew, the son of Pietro Balsamo, a Sicilian tradesman of Jewish origin and he made no secret of his ardent admiration for the Jewish race. After the death of his parents, he escaped from the monastery in which he had been placed at Palermo and joined himself to a man known as Altotas, said to have been an Armenian, with whom he traveled to Greece and Egypt. Cagliostro's travels later took him to Poland and Germany, where he was initiated into Freemasonry and finally to France. But it was in England that he himself declared that he elaborated his famous Egyptian rite, which he founded officially in 1782. According to his own account, this rite was derived from a manuscript by a certain George Cofton, whose identity has never been discovered, which he bought by chance in London. Yarker, however, expresses the opinion that the rite of Cagliostro was clearly that of Pasquale and that if he acquired it from a manuscript in London, it would indicate that Pasquale had disciples in that city. A far more probable explanation is that Cagliostro derived his Egyptian masonry from the same source as that on which Pasquale had drawn for his order of Martinists, namely the Kabbalah, and that it was not from a single manuscript but from an eminent Jewish Kabbalist in London that he took his instructions. Who this may have been we shall soon see. At any rate, in a contemporary account of Cagliostro, we find him described as a doctor initiated into Kabbalistic art, and a rose croix, but after founding his own right, he acquired the name of Grand Copt, that is to say, supreme head of Egyptian masonry, a new branch that he wished to graft onto old European Freemasonry. We shall return to this further Masonic adventures later. In a superior category to St. Germain and Cagliostro was the famous Swabian Dr. Mesmer, who was given his name to an important branch of natural science. In about 1780, Mesmer announced his great discovery of the animal magnetism, the principle of life in all organized beings, the soul of all that breathes. But if today Mesmerism has come to be regarded as almost synonymous with hypnotism, and in no way a branch of occultism, Mesmer himself, stirring the fluid in his magic bucket, around which his disciples wept, slept, fell into trances or convulsions, raved or prophesied, earned not unnaturally the reputation of a charlatan. The Freemasons, eager to discover the secret of the magic bucket, hastened to enroll him in their order, and Mesmer was received into the primitive rite of free and accepted Masons in 1785. Space forbids a description of the minor magicians who flourished at this period of Schroeder, founder in 1776 of a chapter of true and ancient Rosequa Masons, practicing certain magical, theosophical, and alchemical degrees, of Gassner, worker of miracles in the neighborhood of Ratisborn, of the Jew Leon, one of the band of charlatans who made large sums of money with magic mirrors in which the imaginative were able to see their absent friends, and who was finally banished from France by the police. All these and many others exploited the credulity and curiosity of the upper classes both in France and in Germany between the years 1740 and 1790. De Luchette, writing before the French Revolution, describes the part played in their mysteries by the soul of the Kabbalistic Jew named Gabladon, who lived before Christ and who predicted that in the year 1800 there will be on our globe a very remarkable revolution, and there will be no other religion but that of the patriarchs. How are we to account for this extraordinary wave of Kabbalism in Western Europe? By whom was it inspired, if, as Jewish writers assure us, neither Marlins Pasquale, St. Germain, Cagliostro, nor any of the visible occultists or magicians were Jews? The problem only becomes the more insoluble, we cannot believe that Sanhedrin's Hebrew hieroglyphics, the contemplation of the Tetragrammaton and other Kabbalistic rites, originated in the brains of French and German aristocrats, philosophers, and Freemasons. Let us turn then to the events taking place at this moment in the world of Jewry and see whether these may provide some clue. 
Chapter 8 The Jewish Kabbalists It has been shown in the preceding chapters that the Jewish Kabbalah played an important part in the occult and anti-Christian sects from the very beginning of the Christian era. The time has now come to inquire what part Jewish influence played meanwhile in revolutions. Merely to ask the question is to bring on oneself the accusation of anti-Semitism. Yet the Jewish writer Bernard Lazar has shown the falseness of this charge. This, he writes, is what must separate the impartial historian from the anti-Semitism. The anti-Semite says, The Jew is the preparer, the machinator, the chief engineer of revolutions. The impartial historian confines himself to studying the part which the Jew, considering his spirit, his character, the nature of his philosophy, and his religion, may have taken in revolutionary processes and movements. Lazar himself expresses the opinion, however, that the complaint of the anti-Semite seems to be founded. The Jew has the revolutionary spirit, consciously or not, he is an agent of revolution. Yet the complaint complicates itself, for anti-Semitism accuses the Jew of being the cause of revolutions. Let us examine what this accusation is worth. In the light of our present knowledge, it would certainly be absurd to ascribe to the Jews the authorship of the conspiracy of Catiline or of the Gracchi, the rising of Jack Straw and Watt Tyler, Jack Cade's rebellion, the Jacqueries of France, or the Peasants' Wars in Germany. Although historical research may lead in time to the discovery of certain occult influences, not necessarily Jewish, behind the European insurrections here referred to. Moreover, apart from grievances or other causes of rebellion, the revolutionary spirit has always existed independently of the Jews. In all times and in all countries, there have been men born to make trouble as the sparks fly upward. Nevertheless, in modern revolutions, the part played by the Jews cannot be ignored, and the influence that they have exercised will be seen on examination to have been twofold, financial and occult. Throughout the Middle Ages, it is as sorcerers and usurers that they incur the reproaches of the Christian world, and it is still in that same role under the more modern terms of magicians and loan mongers that we detect their presence behind the scenes of revolution from the 17th century onward. Wherever money was to be made out of social or political upheavals, wealthy Jews have been found to back the winning side. And wherever the Christian races have turned against their own institutions, Jewish rabbis, philosophers, professors, and occultists have lent them their support. It was not then necessarily that Jews created these movements, but they knew how to make use of them for their own ends. It is thus that in the Great Rebellion we find them not amongst the iron sides of Cromwell or the members of his state council, but furnishing money and information to the insurgents, acting as army contractors, loan mongers, and super spies, or to use the more euphonious term of Mr. Lucien Wolf as political intelligencers of extraordinary efficiency. Thus, Mr. Lucien Wolf, in referring to Carvajal, the great Jew of the Commonwealth, explains that the wide ramifications of his commercial transactions and his relations with other crypto Jews all over the world placed him in an unrivaled position to obtain news of the enemies of the Commonwealth. It is obvious that a secret service of this kind rendered the Jews a formidable hidden power the more so since their very existence was frequently unknown to the rest of the population around them. This precaution was necessary because Jews were not supposed to exist at that date in England. In 1290, Edward I had expelled them all, and for three and a half centuries they had remained in exile. The crypto-Jews, or Moranos, who had come over from Spain, contrived, however, to remain in the country by skillfully taking the color of their surroundings. Mr. Wolf goes on to observe that Jewish services were regularly held in a secret synagogue, but in public, Carvajal and his friends followed the practice of the secret Jews in Spain and Portugal, passing as Roman Catholics and regularly attending Mass in the Spanish ambassador's chapel. But when war between England and Spain rendered this expedient inadvisable, the Moranos threw off the disguise of Christianity and proclaimed themselves followers of the Jewish faith. Now, just at this period, the Messianic era was generally believed by the Jews to be approaching. 
and it appears to have occurred to them that Cromwell might be fitted to the part. Consequently, emissaries were dispatched to search the archives of Cambridge in order to discover whether the protector could possibly be of Jewish descent. This quest proving fruitless, the Kabbalist rabbi of Amsterdam, Manasseh ben Israel, addressed a petition to Cromwell for the readmission of the Jews to England, in which he adroitly insisted on the retribution that overtakes those who afflict the people of Israel and the rewards that await those who cherish them. These arguments were not without effect on Cromwell, who entertained the same superstition. And although he is said to have declined the Jews' offer to buy St. Paul's Cathedral and the Bodleian Library because he considered the 500,000 pounds they offered inadequate, he exerted every effort to obtain their readmission to the country. In this he encountered violent opposition, and it seems the Jews were not permitted to return in large numbers, or at any rate to enjoy full rights and privileges until after the accession of Charles II, who in his turn had enlisted their financial aid. Later, in 1688, the Jews of Amsterdam helped with their credit the expedition of William of Orange against James II. The former, in return, brought many Jews with him to England. So a Jewish writer is able to boast that a monarch reigned who was indebted to Hebrew gold for his royal diadem. In all this, it is impossible to follow any consecutive political plan. The role of the Jews seems to have been to support no cause consistently, but to obtain a footing in every camp, to back any venture that offered a chance of profit. Yet mingled with these material designs were still their ancient messianic dreams. It is curious to note that the same messianic idea pervaded the levelers, the rebels of the commonwealth, such phrases as, let Israel go free. Israel's restoration is now beginning, recur frequently, in the literature of the sect. Gerard Winstonley, one of the two principal leaders, addressed an epistle to the twelve tribes of Israel that are circumcised in the heart and scattered through all the nations of the earth, and promised them David their king that they have been waiting for. The other leader of the movement, by name Everard, in fact declared when summoned before the Lord Fairfax at Whitehall that he was of the race of the Jews. It is true that the levelers were by profession Christian, but after the manner of the Bavarian Illuminati and of the Christian Socialists two centuries later, claiming Christ as the author of their communistic and equalitarian doctrines. For Jesus Christ, the Savior of all men, is the greatest, first, and truest leveler that ever was spoken of in the world. The levelers are said to have derived originally from the German Anabaptists, but Claudio Janet, quoting German authorities, shows that there were Jews amongst the Anabaptists. They were carried away by their hatred of the name of Christian and imagined that their dreams of the restoration of the kingdom of Israel would be realized amidst the conflagration. Whether this was so or not, it is clear that by the middle of the 17th century, the mystical ideas of Judaism had penetrated into all parts of Europe. Was there then some Kabbalistic center from which they radiated? Let us turn our eyes eastward, and we shall see. Since the 16th century, the great mass of Jewry had settled in Poland, and a succession of miracle workers known by the name of Zadokim, or Balal Shems, had arisen. The latter word, which signifies master of the name, originated with the German-Polish Jews and was derived from the Kabbalistic belief in the miraculous use of the sacred name of Jehovah, known as the Tetragrammaton. According to Kabbalistic traditions, certain Jews of peculiar sanctity or knowledge were able to, with impunity to make use of the divine name. A Baal Shem was therefore one who acquired this power and employed it in writing amulets, invoking spirits, and prescribing cures for various diseases. Poland, and particularly Podolia, which had not yet been ceded to Russia, became thus a center of Kabbalism, where a series of extraordinary movements of a mystical kind followed each other. In 1666, when the Messianic era was still believed to be approaching, the whole Jewish world was convulsed by the sudden appearance of Shabbatai Zebi, the son of a poulterer in Smyrna, named Mordecai, who proclaimed himself the promised Messiah and rallied to his support, a huge following not only amongst the Jews of Palestine, Egypt, and Eastern Europe, 
but even the hard-headed Jews of the continental bourses. Samuel Pebbies and his diary refers to the bets made amongst the Jews in London on the chances of a certain person now in Smyrna being acclaimed king of the world and the true Messiah. Shabbatai, who was an expert Kabbalist and had the temerity to utter the ineffable name Jehovah, was said to be possessed of marvelous powers. His skin exuded exquisite perfume. He indulged perpetually in sea bathing and lived in a state of chronic ecstasy. The pretensions of Shabbatai, who took the title of the King of the Kings of the Earth, split Jewry in two. Many rabbis launched imprecations against him, and those who had believed in him were bitterly disillusioned when challenged by the sultan to prove his claim to be the Messiah by allowing poisoned arrows to be shot at him. He suddenly renounced the Jewish faith and proclaimed himself a Mohammedan. His conversion, however, appeared to be only partial, for at times he would assume the role of a pious Mohammedan and revile Judaism. At others, he would enter into relations with Jews as one of their own faith. By this means, he retained the allegiance both of Muslims and of Jews. But the rabbis, alarmed for the cause of Judaism, succeeded in obtaining his incarceration by the sultan in a castle near Belgrade, where he died of colic in 1676. This prosaic ending to the career of the Messiah did not, however, altogether extinguish the enthusiasm of his followers, and the Sabbathean movement continued into the next century. In Poland, Kabbalism broke out with renewed energy. Fresh Zadikim and Baal Shems arose, the most noted of these being Israel of Podolia, known as Baal Shem Tob, or by the initial letters of his name, Besht, who founded his sect of Hasidim in 1740. Besht, whilst opposing bigoted rabbinism and claiming the Zohar as his inspiration, did not, however, adhere strictly to the doctrine of the Kabbalah, that the universe was an emanation of God, but evolved a form of pantheism, declaring that the whole universe was God, that even evil existed in God, since evil is not bad in itself, but only in its relation to man. Sin, therefore, has no positive existence. As a result, the followers of Besht, calling themselves the New Saints, and at his death, numbering no less than 40,000, threw aside not only the precepts of the Talmud, but all the restraints of morality and even decency. Another Baal Shem of the same period was Hilprin, Elias Joel ben Uri of Satanov, who, like Israel of Podolia, professed to perform miracles by the use of the divine name, and collected around him many pupils who, on the death of their master, formed a band of charlatans and shamelessly exploited the credulity of their contemporaries. But the most important of these Kabbalistic groups was that of the Frankists, who were sometimes known as the Zoharists or the Illuminated, from their adherence to the Zohar or Book of Light, or in their birthplace, Podolia, as the Shabbathian Zebists, from their allegiance to the false messiah of the preceding century a heresy that has been kept alive in secret circles which had something akin to a Masonic organization. The founder of this sect was Jacob Frank, a brandy distiller profoundly versed in the doctrines of the Kabbalah, who in 1755 collected around him a large following in Podolia and lived in a style of oriental magnificence, maintained by vast wealth of which no one ever discovered the source. The persecution to which he was subjected by the rabbis led to the Catholic clergy to champion his cause, whereupon Frank threw himself on the mercy of the Bishop of Kamenik and publicly burnt the Talmud, declaring that he recognized only the Zohar, which he alleged admitted the doctrine of the Trinity. Thus the Zoharists claimed that they regarded the Messiah Deliverer as one of the three divinities, but failed to state that by the Messiah they meant Shabbatai Zebi. The bishop was apparently deceived by this maneuver, and in 1759 the Zoharites declared themselves converted to Christianity and were baptized, including Frank himself, who took the name of Joseph. The insincerity of the Frankists soon became apparent, however, for they continued to intermarry only among themselves and held Frank in reverence, calling him the Holy Master. It soon became evident that, whilst openly embracing the Catholic faith, they had, in reality, retained their secret Judaism. Moreover, it was discovered that Frank endeavored to pass as a Mohammedan in Turkey. 
He was therefore arrested in Warsaw and delivered to the church tribunal on the charge of feigned conversion to Christianity and the spreading of a pernicious heresy. Unlike his predecessor in apostasy, Shabbatai Zebi, Frank, however, came to no untimely end, but after his release from prison continued to prey on the credulity of Christians and frequently traveled to Vienna with his daughter Eve, who succeeded in duping the pious Maria Theresa. But here also the sectarian plans of Frank were found out, and he was obliged to leave Austria. Finally, he settled at Offenbach, and supported by liberal subsidies from other Jews, he resumed his former splendor. With a retinue of several hundred beautiful Jewish youth of both sexes, carts containing treasures were reported to be perpetually brought into him, chiefly from Poland. He went out daily in a great state to perform his devotions in the open field. He rode in a chariot drawn by noble horses, ten or twelve hulans in red or green uniform, glittering with gold by his side, with pikes in their hands and crests on their caps, eagles or stags or the sun and the moon. His followers believed him immortal, but in 1791 he died. His burial was as splendid as his mode of living. Eight hundred persons followed him to the grave. Now, it is impossible to study the careers of these magicians in Poland and Germany without being reminded of their counterparts in France. The family likeness between the Baron von Offenbach and the Comte de Saint-Germain and the Comte de Cagliostro is at once apparent. All claimed to perform miracles, all lived with extraordinary magnificence on wealth derived from an unknown source, and one was certainly a Jew, the other two were believed to be Jews, and all were known to be Kabbalists. Moreover, all three spent many years in Germany, and it was whilst Frank was living as Baron von Offenbach, close to Frankfurt, that Cagliostro was received into the order of the strict observance in a subterranean chamber a few miles from that city. Earlier in his career, he was known to have visited Poland, whence Frank derived. Are we to believe that all these men, so strangely alike in their careers, living at the same time and in the same places, were totally unconnected? It is a mere coincidence that this group of Jewish Kabbalist miracle workers should have existed in Germany and Poland at the precise moment that the Kabbalist magicians sprang up in France. Is it again a coincidence that Martins Pasquale founded his Kabbalistic sect of Illumins in 1754 and Jacob Frank his sect of Zoharites or Illuminated in 1755? Moreover, when we know from purely Jewish sources that the Balal Shem Heilprin had many pupils, who formed a band of charlatans who shamelessly exploited the credulity of their contemporaries. That the Baal Shem Tob and Jacob Frank both had large followings, it is surely here that we may find the origin of those mysterious magicians who spread themselves over Europe at this date. But what proof is there that any one of these Baal Shems or Kabbalists was connected with Masonic or secret societies? The answer is that the most important Baal Shem of the day, known as the Chief of All the Jews, is shown by documentary evidence to have been an initiate of Freemasonry, and in direct contact with the leaders of the secret societies. If then it is agreed that neither St. Germain nor Cagliostro can be proved to have been Jews, here we have a man concerned in the movement, more important than either, whose nationality admits of no doubt whatever. This extraordinary personage, known as the Baal Shem of London, was a Kabbalistic Jew named Haim Samuel Jacob Falk, also called Dr. Falk, Falk or De Falk or Falcon, born in 1708, probably in Podolia. The further fact that he was regarded by his fellow Jews as an adherent of the Messiah Shabbatai Zebi clearly shows his connection with the Podolian Zoharites. Falk was thus not an isolated phenomena, but a member of one of the groups described in the foregoing pages. The following is a summary of the account given of the Baal Shem of London in the Jewish Encyclopedia. Falk claimed to possess thaumaturgic powers and to be able to discover hidden treasure. Arkenholz recounts certain marvels which he had seen performed by Falk in Brunswick and which he attributes to a special knowledge of chemistry. In Westphalia, at one time, Falk was sentenced to be burned as a sorcerer, but escaped to England. Here he was received with hospitality and rapidly gained the fame as a Kabbalist and worker of miracles. Many stories of his powers were current, 
He would cause a small taper to remain alight for weeks. An incantation would fill his cellar with coal. Plate left with a pawnbroker would glide back into his house. When a fire threatened to destroy the great synagogue, he averted the disaster by writing four Hebrew letters on the pillars of the door. Obviously, the Tetragrammaton. On his arrival in London in 1742, Falk appeared to be without means, but soon after he was seen to be in possession of a considerable wealth. Living in a comfortable house in well close Square, where he had his private synagogue, whilst gold and silver plate adorned his table, his journal, still preserved in the library of the United Synagogue, contains references to mysterious journeyings to and from Epping Forest, to meetings, a meeting chamber in the forest, and chests of gold there buried. It was said that on one occasion, when he was driving thither along Whitechapel Road, a back wheel of his carriage came off, which alarmed the coachman. But Falk ordered him to drive on, and the wheel followed the carriage all the way to the forest. The stories of Falk's miraculous powers are too numerous to relate here, but a letter written by an enthusiastic Jewish admirer, Sussman Szczesnowski, to his son in Poland will serve to show the reputation he enjoyed. Hear, my beloved son, of the marvelous gifts entrusted to a son of man, who verily is not a man, a light of the captivity, a holy light, a saintly man, who dwells at present in the great city of London. Albeit I could not fully understand him on account of his volubility and his speaking as an inhabitant of Jerusalem. His chamber is lighted by silver candlesticks on the walls with a central eight-branched lamp made of pure silver of beaten work. And albeit it contained oil to burn a day and a night, and it remained enkindled for three weeks. On one occasion he abode in seclusion in his house for six weeks without meat and drink. When at the conclusion of this period ten persons were summoned to enter, they found him seated on a sort of throne, his head covered with a golden turban, a gold chain around his neck with a pendant silver star, on which sacred names were inscribed. Verily this man stands alone in his generation by reason of his knowledge of holy mysteries. I cannot recount to you all the wonders he accomplishes. I am grateful in that I am found worthy to be received amongst those who dwell within the shadow of his wisdom. I know that many will believe my words, but others who do not occupy themselves with mysteries will laugh thereat. Therefore, my son, be very circumspect, and show this only to wise and discreet men, for here in London this master has not been disclosed to anyone who does not belong to our brotherhood. The esteem in which Falk was held by the Jewish community, included the chief rabbi and the rabbi of the new synagogue, appears to have roused the resentment of his co-religionist Enmden who denounced him as a follower of the false messiah and an exploiter of Christian credulity. Falk, he wrote in a letter to Poland, had made his position by his pretense to be an adept in practical Kabbalah, by which means he professed to be able to discover hidden treasures. By his pretensions he had entrapped a wealthy captain whose fortune he had cheated him out of, so that he was reduced to depending on the rabbi's charity, and yet, despite this, Wealthy Christians spend their money on him, whilst Falk spends his bounty on the men of his brotherhood so that they may spread his fame. In general, Falk appears to have displayed extreme caution in his relations with Christian seekers after occult knowledge, for the Jewish Encyclopedia goes on to say, Arkenholds mentions a royal prince who applied to Falk in his quest for the Philosopher's Stone, but was denied admittance. Nevertheless, Hayum Azuli mentions that when in Paris in 1778 he was told by the Marchesa de Crona that the Balal Sham of London had taught her the Kabbalah. Falk seems also to have been on intimate terms with that strange adventurer, Baron Theodore de Neuf. Falk's principal friends were the London bankers Aaron Goldsmith and his son. Pawnbroking and successful speculation enabled him to acquire a considerable fortune. He left large sums of money to charity, and the overseers of the United Synagogue in London still distribute annually certain payments left by him for the poor. Nothing of all this would lead one to suppose that Falk could be regarded in the light of a black magician. It is therefore surprising to find Dr. Adler observing that a horrible account of a Jewish Kabbalist in the Gentleman's Magazine for September 1762 obviously refers to Dr. Falk, though his name is not mentioned. This man is described as a christened Jew and the biggest rogue and villain in all the world. 
who had been imprisoned everywhere and banished out of all countries in Germany, and also sometimes publicly whipped, so that his back lost all the old skin and became new again, and yet, left never off from his villainies, he grew always worse. The writer goes on to relate that the Kabbalists offered to teach him certain mysteries, but explained that before entering on any experiments of the said godly mysteries, we must first avoid all churches and places of worshipping as unclean. He then bound his initiate by a very strong oath, and proceeded to tell him that he must steal a Hebrew Bible from a Protestant, and also procure one pound of blood out of the veins of an honest Protestant. The initiate thereupon robbed a Protestant of all his effects, but had himself bled of about three quarters of a pound of blood, which he gave to the magician. He thus describes the ceremony that took place. Then the next night at about eleven o'clock we both went into the garden of my own, and the Kabbalist puts a cross, tainted with my blood, in each corner of the garden, and in the middle of the garden a threefold circle. In the first circle were written all the names of God in Hebrew, in the second all the names of the angels, and in the third the first chapter of the Holy Gospel of St. John, and it was all written with my blood. The cruelties then performed by the Kabbalist on a he-goat are too loathsome to transcribe, the whole story indeed appears a farrago of nonsense. It would not be worth quoting, but for the fact that it appears to be taken seriously by Dr. Adler as a description of the great Baal Shem. The death of Falk took place on April 17, 1782, and the epitaph on his grave in the cemetery at Globe Road, Mile End, bears witness to his excellencies and orthodoxy. Here is interred the aged and honorable man, a great personage who came from the East, an accomplished sage, an adept in Kabbalah. His name was known to the ends of the earth and distant isles, etc. This, then, is surely the portrait of a most remarkable personage, a man known for his powers in England, France, and Germany, visited by a royal prince in search of the Philosopher's Stone, and acclaimed by one of his own race as standing alone in his generation by reason of his knowledge. Yet, whilst St. Germain and Cagliostro figure in every account of 18th century magicians, it is only in exclusively Judaic or Masonic works, not intended for the general public, that we shall find any reference to Falk. Have we not here striking evidence of the truth of M. André Barron's dictum? Remember that the constant rule of the secret societies is that the real authors never show themselves? It will now be asked, what proof is there that Falk is connected with any Masonic or secret societies? True, in the accounts given by the Jewish Encyclopedia, the word Freemasonry is not even mentioned once. But in the curious portrait of the great Balal Shem appended, we see him holding in his hand the pair of compasses, and before him, on the table at which he is seated, the double triangle, or seal of Solomon, known amongst Jews as the Shield of David, which forms an important emblem in Masonry. Moreover, it is significant to find in the Royal Masonic Encyclopedia by the Rosicrucian Kenneth Mackenzie that a long and detailed article is devoted to Falk, though again without any reference to his connection with Freemasonry. May we not conclude that in certain inner Masonic circles the importance of Falk is recognized but must not be revealed to the uninitiated? Mr. Gordon Hills, in the above-quoted paper, contributed to the Ars Quatuor Coronatorum, indulges in some innocent speculation as to the part Falk may have played in the Masonic movement. If, he observes, Jewish brethren did not introduce Kabbalistic learning into the so-called high degrees, here we have one who, if a Mason, would have been eminently qualified to do so. Falk indeed was more than a Mason. He was a high initiate, the supreme oracle to which the secret societies applied for guidance. All this was disclosed a few years ago in the correspondence between Savalette de Lang and the Marquis de Chef de Bien, referred to in the previous chapter. Thus, in the dossiers of the leading occultists supplied by Savalette, we find the following note on the Baal Shem of London. This Dr. Falk is known to many Germans. He is a very extraordinary man from every point of view. Some people believe him to be the chief of all the Jews and attribute to purely political schemes all that is marvelous and singular in his life and conduct. He is referred to in a very curious manner and as a rose croix in the memoirs of the Chevalier de Ramsau. 
He has had adventures with the Marechal de Richelieu, a great seeker of the Philosopher's Stone. He had a strange history with the Prince de Rohan Guemini and the Chevalier de Luxembourg, relating to Louis the Fifteenth, whose death he foretold. He is almost inaccessible. In all the sects and savants and secret sciences, he passes as a superior man. He is at present in England. The Baron de Gleichen can give good information about him. Try to get more at Frankfurt. Again, in notes on other personages, the name of Falk recurs with the same instance on his importance as a high initiate. Lehmann, pupil of Falk. The Baron de Gleichen, intimately connected with Wechter. And Wachenfeld, he knows Falk. The Baron de Waldenfels is, according to what I know from the Baron de Gleichen, the princes of Damestalt. And others, the most interesting man for you and me to know. If we made his acquaintance, he could give us the best information on all the most interesting objects of institution. He knows Falk and Wechter. Prince Louis de Hamstadt is also a member of the Amos Runas, 12 degrees, and in charge of the directories. He worked in his youth with a Jew whom he believes to be taught by Falk. Here then, behind the organization of the strict observance of the Amos Runas and the Philolathes, we catch a glimpse at last of one of those real initiates whose identity has been so carefully kept dark. For Falk, as we see in these notes, was not an isolated sage. He had pupils, and to be one of these was to be admitted to the inner mysteries. Was Cagliostro one of these adepts? It is here we may seek the explanation of the Egyptian rite, devised by him in London and of his chance discovery on a bookstall in that city of a Kabbalistic document by the mysterious George Cofton, whose identity has never been revealed. I would suggest that the whole story of the bookstall was a fable, and that it was not from any manuscript, but from Falk, that Cagliostro received his directions. Thus Cagliostro's right was in reality concealed Kabbalism. That Falk was only one of the several concealed superiors is further suggested by the intriguing correspondence of Savalette de Lang. Schroeder, we read, had for his master an old man of Swabia, by whom the Baron de Wachter was also said to have been instructed in masonry, and to have become one of the most important initiates of Germany. Accordingly, de Wachter was dispatched by his order to Florence in order to make inquiries on further secrets and on certain famous treasures, about which Schropfer, the Baron de Hunt, and others had heard that a Prosi, the secretary of the pretender, could give them information. Wachter, however, wrote to say that all they had been told on the latter point was fabulous, but that he had met in Florence certain brothers of the Holy Land, who had initiated him into marvelous secrets. One in particular who was described as a man who is not European had perfectly instructed him. Moreover, de Wachter, who had set forth poor, returned loaded with riches, attributed by his fellow masons to the Asiatic brethren, yet frequented in Florence who possessed the art of making gold. I would suggest then that these were the members of the Italian order referred to by Mr. Tuckett, which, like Schwopfer and de Hunt, he imagined to have been connected with the Jacobites. But all these secret sources of instruction are wrapped in mystery, while Saints Germain and Cagliostro, who is referred to in this correspondence in terms of light derision, emerged into limelight, the real initiates remain concealed in the background. Falk is almost inaccessible. Yet one more almost forgotten document of the period may throw some light on the important part he played behind the scenes in masonry. It may be remembered that Arkenholds had spoken of certain marvels he had seen performed by Falk in Brunswick. Now, in 1770, the German poet Gotthold of Frame Lessing was made librarian to the Duke of Brunswick in that city. The fame of Falk may then have reached his ears. At any rate, in 1771, Lessing, after having mocked at Freemasonry, was initiated in a Masonic lodge at Hamburg, and in 1778, he published not only his famous Masonic drama, Nathan Der Weiss, in which the Jew of Jerusalem is shown in admirable contrast to the Christians and Mohammedans, but he also wrote five dialogues on Freemasonry, which he dedicated to the Duke of Brunswick, Grand Master of all the German lodges, and which he entitled Ernst und Falk. 
Gesprach für Freimaurer, Lessing's friendship with Moses Mendelssohn has led to the popular theory, unsupported, however, by any real evidence, that the Jewish philosopher of Berlin provided the inspiration for the character of Nathan. But might it not equally have been provided by the miracle worker of Brunswick? However, in the case of the dialogues, less room is left for doubt. Falk is mentioned by the name and represented as initiated into the highest mysteries of Freemasonry. This, of course, is not explained by Lessing's commentators, who give no clue to his identity. It is evident that Lessing committed an enormous blunder in thus letting so important a cat out of the bag. For after the publication of the first three dialogues, and whilst the last two were circulating privately in manuscript amongst the Freemasons, an order from the Duke of Brunswick forbade their publication as dangerous. In spite of this prohibition, the rest of the series was printed, however, without Lessing's permission, in 1870 with a preface by an unknown person describing himself as a non-Mason. The dialogue between Ernst and Falk throw a curious light on the influences at work behind Freemasonry at this period, and gain immensely in interest when the identity of the two men in question is understood. Thus Ernst, by whom Lessing evidently represents himself, is at the beginning not of Freemason, and whilst sitting with Falk in a wood, questions the high initiate on the aims of the order. Falk explains that Freemasonry has always existed, but not under this name. Its real purpose has never been revealed. On the surface, it appears to be a purely philanthropic association, but in reality, philanthropy forms no part of its scheme, its object being to bring about a state of things which will render philanthropy unnecessary. As an illustration, Falk points to an ant heap at the foot of the tree beneath which the two men are seated. Why, he asks, should not human beings exist without government like the ants or bees? Falk then goes on to describe his idea of a universal state, or rather a federation of states, in which men will no longer be divided by national, social, or religious prejudices, and where greater equality will exist. At the end of the third dialogue, an interval occurs during which Ernst goes away and becomes a Freemason, but on his return expresses his disappointment to Falk at finding many Freemasons engaged in such futilities as alchemy or the evocation of spirits. Others again seek to revive the blank. Falk replies that although the great secrets of Freemasonry cannot be revealed by any man even if he wished it, one thing, however, has been kept dark, which should now be made public, and this is the relationship between the Freemasons and the blank. The blank were, in fact, the Freemasons of their time. It seems probable, from the context and from Falk's references to Sir Christopher Wren as the founder of the modern order, that the asterisks denote the Rosicrucians, or the blanks denote the Rosicrucians. The most interesting point of these dialogues is, however, the hint continually thrown out by Falk that there is something behind Freemasonry, something far older and far wider in its aims than the order now known by its name. The modern Freemasons are for the most part only playing at it. Thus, when Ernst complains that true equality has not been attained in the lodges since Jews are not admitted, Falk observes that he himself does not attend them, that true Freemasonry does not exist in outward forms. A lodge bears the same relation to Freemasonry as a church to belief. In other words, the real initiates do not appear upon the scene. Here, then, we see the role of the concealed superiors. What wonder that Lessing's dialogues were considered too dangerous for publication. Moreover, in Falk's conception of the ideal social order and his indictment of what he calls bourgeois society, we find the clue to the movements of immense importance. Has not the system of the ant heap or the beehive proved, as I have pointed out elsewhere, the model on which modern anarchists from Proudhon onwards have formed their schemes for the reorganization of human life? Has not the idea of world state, the universal republic, become the war cry of the internationalist socialists, the Grand Orient Masons, the Theosophists, and the world revolutionaries of our day? Was Falk then a revolutionary? This again will be disputed. Falk may have been a Kabbalist, a Freemason, a high initiate, but what proof is there that he had any connection with the leaders of the French Revolution? Let us turn again to the Jewish Encyclopedia. 
Falk is believed to have given the Duke d'Orleans to ensure his succession to the throne a talisman consisting of a ring, which Philippe Egalite, before mounting the scaffold, is said to have sent to a Jewess, Juliette Gauchau, who passed it on to his son, subsequently Louis Philippe. The Baron de Glichen, who knew Falk, refers to a talisman of lapis lazuli, which the Duke d'Orleans had received in England from the celebrated Falk Sheck, first rabbi of the Jews, and says that a certain occultist, Madame de la Croix, imagined she had destroyed it by the power of prayer. But the theory of its survival is further confirmed by the information supplied from the Jewish sources to Mr. Gordon Hills, who states that Falk was in touch with the French court in the person of Prince Emmanuel, whom he describes as a servant of the King of France, and adds that the talismanic ring which he gave to the Duke d'Orleans is still in the possession of the family, having passed to King Louis Philippe and thence to the Comte de Paris. One fact then looms out of the darkness that envelopes the secret power behind the Orleanist conspiracy, one fact of supreme importance, and based moreover on purely Jewish evidence. The Duke was in touch with Falk when in London, and Falk supported his scheme of usurpation. Thus, behind the arch-conspirator of the revolution stood the chief of all the Jews. It is here, perhaps, in Falk's chests of gold that we might find the source of some of those loans raised in London by the Duke d'Orleans to finance the riots of the revolution, so absurdly described as Lord de Pitt. The direct connection between the attack on the French monarchy and the Jewish circles in London is further shown by the curious sequel to the Gordon riots. In 1780, the half-witted Lord George Gordon, as a Jewish writer describes him, the head of the so-called Protestant mob, marched on the House of Commons to protest against the bill for the relief of Roman Catholic disabilities, and then proceeded to carry out his plan of burning down London. During the five days rioting that ensued, property to the amount of £180,000 was destroyed. After this, the scion of the Ducal House of Gordon proved the durability of his love for the Protestantism by professing the Hebrew faith, and was received with the highest honors into the synagogue. The same Jewish writer, who had described him earlier as half-witted, quotes the panegyric on his orthodoxy. He was very regular in his Jewish observances. Every morning he was seen with the phylacteries between his eyes and opposite his heart. His Saturday bread was baked according to the manner of the Jews. His wine was Jewish, his meat was Jewish, and he was the best Jew in the congregation of Israel. And it was immediately after his conversion to Judaism that he published in the public advertiser the libel against Marie Antoinette, which brought about his imprisonment in Newgate. Now we know that Lord George Gordon met Cagliostro in London in 1786. Is it not probable that the author of the scurrilous pamphlet and the magician concerned in the attack on the Queen's honor through the affair of the necklace, one a Jew by profession and the other said to be a Jew by race, may have had some connection with Philippe Agalitz, Jewish supporter, the miracle worker of well Close Square? But already a vaster genius than Falk or Cagliostro, than Pasquale or Sabalette de Lange had arisen, who, gathering into his hands the threads of all the conspiracies, was able to weave them together into a gigantic scheme for the destruction of France and the world. Chapter 9. The Bavarian Illuminati the question of the system to which I shall henceforth refer simply as Illuminism is of such immense importance to an understanding of the modern revolutionary movement that, although I have already described it in detail in World Revolution, it is necessary to devote a further chapter to it here in order to answer the objections made against my former account of the order, and also to show its connection with earlier secret societies. Now, the main contentions of those writers who, either consciously or unconsciously, attempt to mislead the public on the true nature and real existence of Illuminism are, firstly, that the case against Illuminism rests solely on the works of Robeson and of Beruel and later Catholic authorities, secondly, that all these writers misinterpreted or misquoted the Illuminati, who should be judged only by their own works, 
Thirdly, that in reality, the Illuminati was perfectly innocuous and even praiseworthy. Fourthly, that they are of no importance since they ceased to exist in 1786. In the present chapter, I propose therefore to answer all these contentions in turn, and at the same time to make further examination into the origins of the order. Origins of the Illuminati That Weishaupt was not the originator of the system he named Illuminism will be already apparent to every reader of the present work. It has needed, in fact, all the foregoing chapters to trace the source of Weishaupt's doctrines throughout the history of the world. From these it will be evident that men aiming at the overthrow of the existing social order, and of all accepted religion, had existed from the earliest times, and that in the Cainites and the Carpocratians, the Manichaeans, the Bettinis, the Fatimites, and the Carmathites, many of Weishaupt's ideas had already been foreshadowed. To the Manichaeans, in fact, the word Illuminati may be traced. Gloriantur Manichaea, Sedeselo Illuminatus. It is in the sect of Abdullah, Ibn Maymun, that we must seek the model of for Weishaupt's system of organization. Thus, De Sessi has described in the following words the manner of enlisting proselytes by the Ismailis. They proceeded to the admission and initiation of new proselytes, only by degrees and with great reserve, for, as the sect had been at the same time a political object and ambitions, its interest was above all to have a great number of partisans in all places and in all classes of society. It was necessary, therefore, to suit themselves to the character, the temperament, and the prejudices of the greater number. What one revealed to some would have revolted others, and alienated forever spirits less bold and consciences more easily alarmed. This passage exactly describes the methods laid down by Weishaupt for insinuating brothers. The necessity of proceeding with caution in the enlisting of adapts, of not revealing to the novice doctrines that might be likely to revolt him, of speaking sometimes in one way, sometimes in another, so that one's real purpose should remain impenetrable. To members of the inferior grades. How did these Oriental methods penetrate to the Bavarian professor? According to certain writers through the Jesuits, the fact that Weishaupt had been brought up by this order had provided the enemies of the Jesuits with the argument that they were the secret inspirers of the Illuminati. Mr. Gould, indeed, had attributed most of the errors of the latter to this source. Weishaupt, he writes, incurred the implacable enmity of the Jesuits, to whose intrigues he was incessantly exposed. In reality, precisely the opposite was the case, for, as we shall see, it was Weishaupt who perpetually intrigued against the Jesuits. That Weishaupt did, however, draw to a certain extent on Jesuit methods of training is recognized even by Baruel, himself a Jesuit, who, quoting Mirabeau, says that Weishaupt admired above all those laws, that regime of the Jesuits, which under one head made men dispersed over the universe, tends towards the same goal. He felt that one could imitate their methods whilst holding views diametrically opposed. And again, on the evidence of Mirabeau, De Luchette and Von Nigge, Barewell says elsewhere, It is here that Weishaupt appears specially to have wished to assimilate the regime of the sect to that of the religious orders, and above all, that of the Jesuits, by the total abandonment of their own will and judgment, which he demands of his adepts. But Barewell goes on to show the enormous difference that is to be found between religious obedience and illuminist obedience. In every religious order, men know that the voice of their conscience and of their God is even more to be obeyed than that of their superiors. There is not a single one who, in the event that his superiors should order him to do things contrary to the duties of a Christian or a good man, would not see an exception to be made to the obedience which he has sworn. This exception is often expressed and always clearly announced in all religious institutions. It is above all formal and positively repeated many times in that of the Jesuits. They are ordered to obey their superiors, but it is in the event that they see no sin in obeying. Indeed, implicit obedience and the total number of one's own will and judgment forms the foundation of all military discipline. Theirs not to reason why, theirs not to make reply, is everywhere recognized as the duty of soldiers. 
the Jesuits being, in a sense, a military order, acknowledging a general at their head, are bound by the same obligation. Weishaupt's system was something totally different, for whilst all soldiers and all Jesuits, when obeying their superiors, are well aware of the goals towards which they are tending. Weishaupt's followers were enlisted by the most subtle methods of deception, and led on towards a goal entirely unknown to them. It is this that, as we shall see later, constitutes the whole difference between honest and dishonest secret societies. The fact is that the accusation of Jesuit intrigue behind secret societies has emanated principally from the secret societies themselves, and would appear to have been a device adopted by them to cover their own tracks. No good evidence has ever been brought forward in support of their contention. The Jesuits, unlike the Templars and the Illuminati, were simply suppressed in 1773 without the formality of a trial, and were therefore never given the opportunity to answer the charges brought against them, nor, as in the case of these orders, were their secret statutes, if any such existed, brought to light. The only document ever produced in proof of these accusations was the Monita Secreta, long since shown to be a forgery. At any rate, the correspondence of the Illuminati provides their best exoneration. The Marquis de Luchette, who was no friend of the Jesuits, shows the absurdity of confounding their aims with those of either the Freemasons or the Illuminati, and describes all three as animated by wholly different purposes. In all these questions, it is necessary to seek a motive. I have no personal interest in defending the Jesuits, but I ask, what motive could the Jesuits have in forming or supporting a conspiracy directed against all thrones and altars? It has been answered me that the Jesuits at this period care nothing for thrones and altars, but only for temporal power. Yet, even accepting this unwarrantable hypothesis, how was this power to be exercised except through thrones and altars? Was it not through princes and the church that the Jesuits had been able to bring their influence to bear on affairs of state? In an irreligious republic, as events afterwards proved, the power of the whole clergy was bound to be destroyed. The truth is, then, that far from abetting the Illuminati, the Jesuits were their most formidable opponents. The only body of men sufficiently learned, astute, and well-organized to outfit the schemes of Weishaupt. In suppressing the Jesuits, it is possible that the old regime removed the only barrier capable of resisting the tide of revolution. Weishaupt, indeed, as we know, detested the Jesuits and took from them only certain methods of discipline, of ensuring obedience, or of acquiring influence over the minds of his disciples. His aims were entirely different. Where, then, did Weishaupt find his immediate inspiration? Is it here that Barouel and Le Coutil de Cantelot provide a clue not to be discovered in other sources? In 1771, they relate a certain Jutland merchant named Colmer, who had spent many years in Egypt, returned to Europe in search of converts to a secret doctrine founded on Manichaeism that he had learnt in the East. On his way to France, he stopped at Malta, where he met Cagliostro and nearly brought about an insurrection amongst the people. Colmer was therefore driven out of the island by the Knights of Malta, and betook himself to Avignon and Lyon. Here he made a few disciples amongst the Illumines, and in the same year went on to Germany, where he encountered Weishop and initiated him into all the mysteries of his secret doctrine. According to Barrowell, Weishop then spent five years thinking out this system, which he founded under the name of the Illuminati on May 1, 1776 and assumed the illuminated name of Spartacus. Colmer remains the most mysterious of all the mystery men of his day. At first sight, one is inclined to wonder whether he may not have been another of the Kabbalistic Jews acting as the secret inspires of the magicians who appeared in the limelight. The name Colmer might easily have been a corruption of the well-known Jewish name Calmer. Le Coutil de Cantelo, however, suggests that Colmer was identical with Altalas, described by Figuier as the universal genius, almost divine, of whom Cagliostro had spoken to us with so much respect and admiration. This Altotas was not an imaginary personage. The Inquisition of Rome has collected many proofs of his existence without having been able to discover when it began or ended. For Altotas disappears, or rather vanishes like a meteor, 
which according to the poetic fancy of romancers, would authorize us in declaring him immortal. It is curious to notice that modern occultists, whilst attributing so much importance to Saint Germain and the legend of his immortality, make no mention of Altotas, who appears to have been a great deal more remarkable. But again, we must remember, it is the unvarying rule of secret societies that the real authors never show themselves. If, then, Colmer was the same person as Altotas, he would appear not to have been a Jew or a Kabbalist, but an initiate of some Near Eastern secret society, possibly an Ismali. Likutil de Cantelo describes Altotas as an Armenian and says that his system was derived from those of Egypt, Syria, and Persia. This would accord with Beruel's statement that Colmer came from Egypt and that his ideas were founded on Manichaeism. It would be necessary to set these statements aside as only the theories of Beruel or Likutil, were it not that the writings of the Illuminati betray the influence of some sect akin to Manichaeism. Thus, Spartacus writes to Cato that he is thinking of warming up the old system of the Gibbers and Parsis, and it will be remembered that the Gebers were one of the sects in which Dozi relates that Abdullah, Ibn Maymun, found his true supporters. Later, Weishaupt goes on to explain that the allegory in which the mysteries and higher grades must be clothed is fire worship and the whole philosophy of Zoroaster or of the old Parsis, who nowadays only remain in India. Therefore, in the further degrees, the order is called fire worship. The fire order, or the Persian order, that is something magnificent beyond all expectation. At the same time, the Persian calendar was adopted by the Illuminati. It is evident that this pretense of Zoroastrianism was as pure humbug as Weishaupt's later pretense of Christianity. Of the true doctrines of Zoroaster, he shows no conception. Nor does he insist further on the point. But the above passage would certainly lend color to the theory that his system was partly founded on Manichaeism, that is to say, on perverted Zoroastrianism, imparted to him by a man from the East, and that the methods of the Batinis and Fatimites may have been communicated to him through the same channel. Hence the extraordinary resemblance between his plan of organization and that of Abdullah ibn Maymun, which consisted in political intriguing rather than in esoteric speculation. Thus, in Weishaupt's system, the phraseology of Judaism, the Kabbalistic legends of Freemasonry, the mystical imaginings of the Martinists, play at first no part at all. For all forms of theosophy, occultism, spiritualism, and magic, Weishaupt expresses nothing but contempt, and the Rose Qua Masons are bracketed with the Jesuits by the Illuminati as enemies. It is necessary to outwit at every turn. Consequently, no degree of Rose Croix finds a place in Weishaupt's system. As in all the other Masonic orders of the day, which drew their influence from Eastern or Kabbalistic sources. It is true that mysteries play a great part in the phraseology of the order. Greater and lesser mysteries borrowed from ancient Egypt, whilst the higher initiates are decorated with such titles as Epopte and Hierophant. Taken from the Eleusinian Mysteries. Yet, Weishaupt's own theories appear to bear no relation, whatever, to these ancient cults. On the contrary, the more we penetrate into his system, the more apparent it becomes that all the formulas he employs which derive from any religious source, whether Persian, Egyptian, or Christian, merely serve to disguise a purely material purpose, a plan for destroying the existing order of society. Thus, all that was really ancient in Illuminism was the destructive spirit that, that animated it, and also the method of organization it had imported from the East. Illuminism, therefore, marks an entirely new departure in the history of European secret societies. Weishaupt himself indicates this as one of the great secrets of the order. Above all, he writes to Cato, Elias Zwack, Guard the origin and the novelty of the circle with a dot in the middle, in the most careful way. The greatest mystery, he says again, must be that the thing is new. The fewer who know this, the better. Not one of the Etstaders knows this, but would live or die for it, the thing that is as old as Methuselah. This pretense of having discovered some fund of ancient wisdom is the invariable ruse of the secret society adepts. 
The one thing never admitted is the identity of the individuals from whom one is receiving direction. Weishaupt himself declares that he got it out of all the books by means of arduous and unremitting labor. What it cost me to read, study, think, write, cross out, and rewrite, he complains to Marius and Cato. Thus, according to Weishaupt, the whole system is the work of his own unaided genius, and the supreme direction remains in his hands alone. Again and again, he insists on this point in his correspondence. If this were indeed the case, Weishaupt, in view of the efficiency achieved by the order, must have been a genius of the first water. And it is difficult to understand why so remarkable a man should not have distinguished himself on other lines, but have remained almost unknown to posterity. It would therefore appear possible that Weishaupt, although undoubtedly a man of immense organizing capacity and endowed with extraordinary subtlety, was not in reality the sole author of Illuminism, but one of a group which recognized his talents and the value of his untiring activity placed the direction in his hands. Let us examine this hypothesis in the light of a document which was unknown to me when I wrote my former account of the Illuminati. Barrowell has pointed out that the great error of Robeson was to describe Illuminism as arising out of Freemasonry. Since Weishaupt did not become a Freemason until after he had founded his order, it is true that Weishaupt was not officially received into Freemasonry until 1777 when he was initiated into the first degree at the Lodge Theodore de Bon Concil at Munich. From this time, we find him continually occupied in trying to discover more about the secrets of Freemasonry, whilst himself claiming superior knowledge. But at the same time, it is by no means certain that an inner circle of the Lodge Theodore may not have been first in the field and wise up all the while an unconscious agent. A very curious light is thrown on this question by the memoirs of Mirabeau. Now, in the French Revolution and again in the World Revolution, I quoted the generally received opinion that Mirabeau, who was already a Freemason, was received into the Order of the Illuminati during his visits to Berlin in 1786. To this, Mr. Waite replied, All that is said about Mirabeau, his visit to Berlin, and his plot to illuminize French Freemasonry may be disposed of in one sentence. There is no evidence to show that Mirabeau ever became a Mason. The province of Beruel was to color everything. Mr. Waite's statement may also be disposed of in one sentence. It is pure invention. The province of Mr. Waite is to deny everything inconvenient to him. The evidence that Mirabeau was a Freemason does not rest on Beruel alone. Mr. Barthau, in his life of Mirabeau, refers to it as a matter of common knowledge and relates that a paper was found at Mirabeau's house describing a new order to be grafted on Freemasonry. This document will be found in its entirety in the memoirs of Mirabeau, where it is stated that Mirabeau had early entered an association of Freemasonry. This affiliation had accredited him to a Dutch lodge, and it seems that either spontaneously or in response to a request, he thought of proposing an organization of which we possessed the plan, written not by his hand, but by the hand of a copyist whom Mirabeau had attached to himself. This work appears to have been that of Mirabeau. All his opinions, his principles, and his style will be found here. The same work goes on to print the document in full, which is headed, Memoir Concerning an Intimate Association to be Established in the Order of Freemasonry, so as to bring it back to its true principles and to make it really tend to the good of humanity. Drawn up by the F... M. I. Blank, at present named Arsacillus in 1776. As this memoir is too long to reproduce it full here, M. Barthau's resume will serve to give an idea of its contents. He, Mirabeau, was a Freemason from his youth. There was found amongst his papers, written by the hand of a copyist, an international organization of Freemasonry, which no doubt he dictated in Amsterdam. This project contains on the solidarity of men, on the benefits of instruction, and on the correction of the system of governments and of legislations, views very superior to those of the Essay on Despotism, 1772. The mind of Mirabeau had ripened. The duties he traces out for the brothers of the higher grade constitute even a whole plan of reforms which resemble very much in certain parts the work accomplished later by the Constituent Assembly. 
suppression of servitudes on the land and the rights of main mort, abolition of the corvees, of working guilds and of matrices, freedoms of companies, of customs and excise duties, the diminution of taxation, liberty of religious opinions and of the press, the disappearance of special jurisdiction. In order to organize, to develop and arrive at this end, Mirabeau invokes the example of the Jesuits. We have quite contrary views, he says, that of enlightening men, of making them free and happy. But we must, and we can do this by the same means. And who should prevent us from doing for good what the Jesuits have done for evil? Now, in this memoir, Mirabeau makes no mention of Weishaupt, but in his Histoire de la Monarchique Prussienne, he gives a eulogistic account of the Bavarian Illuminati, referring to Weishaupt by name and showing the order to have risen out of Freemasonry. It will be seen that this account corresponds point by point with the memoir he had himself made out in 1776, that is to say, in the very year that Illuminism was founded. The Lodge Theodore de Bon Conseil at Munich, where there were a few men with brains and hearts, was tired of being tossed about by the vain promises and quarrels of masonry. The heads resolved to graft onto their branch another secret association to which they gave the name of the Order of the Illumines. They modeled it on the Society of Jesus, whilst proposing to themselves views diametrically opposed. Mirabeau then goes on to say that the great object of the order was the amelioration of the present system of government and legislation, that one of its fundamental rules was to admit no prince whatever his virtues, that it proposed to abolish the slavery of the peasants, the servitude of men to the soil, the rights of main mort, and all the customs and privileges which abase humanity the corvees under the condition of an equitable equivalent, all the corporations, all the matrices, all the burdens imposed on industry and commerce by customs, excise duties, and taxes, to procure a universal toleration for all religious opinions, to take away all the arms of superstition, to favor the liberty of the press, etc. From all this, we see then that Mirabeau did not become an Illuminatus in 1786, as I had supposed before this document was known to me but had been in the order from the beginning, apparently as one of its founders, first under the illuminated name of Arcesilus, and later under that of Leonidas. The memoir found at his house was thus no other than the program of the Illuminati evolved by him, in collaboration with an inner ring of Freemasons belonging to the Lodge Theodore. The correspondence of the Illuminati, in fact, contains several references to an inner ring under the name of the secret chapter of the Lodge of St. Theodore, which, after his initiation into masonry, Weishaupt indicates the necessity of bringing entirely under the control of Illuminism. It is probable that Weishaupt was in touch with the secret chapter before his formal admission to the Lodge. Whether then the ideas of Illuminism arose in this secret chapter of the Lodge, Theodore, independently of Weishaupt, or whether they were imparted by Weishaupt to the Lodge, Theodore, after the directions had been given him by Colmer, it is impossible to know. But in either case, there would be some justification for Robeson's assertion that Illuminism arose out of Freemasonry, or rather that it took birth amongst a group of Freemasons whose aims were not those of the Order in general. What were those aims? A plan of social and political reform, which, as M. Barthow points out, much resembled the work accomplished later by the Constituent Assembly in France. This admission is of great importance. In other words, the program carried out by the Constituent Assembly in 1789 had been largely formulated in a lodge of German Freemasons who founded the nucleus of the Illuminati in 1776. And yet we are told that Illuminism had no influence on the French Revolution. It will be objected that the reforms here indicated were wholly admirable. True, the abolition of the corvée, of the main mort, and of servitudes were measures that met with the approval of all right-minded men, including the King of France himself. But what of the abolition of the working guilds and all the corporations, that is to say, the trade unions of the period, which was carried out by the infamous Loi Chapelier in 1791, a decree that is now generally recognized as one of the strangest anomalies of the revolution? 
Again, to whose interest was it to do away with the customs and excise duties of France, to establish the absolute and unfettered liberty of the press and religious opinions? The benefits these measures might be expected to confer on the French people were certainly problematical. But there could be no doubt of their utility to men who, like Frederick the Great, wished to ruin France and to break the Franco-Austrian alliance by the unrestricted circulation of libels against Marie Antoinette, who, like Mirabeau, hoped to bring about a revolution, or who, like Voltaire, wished to remove all obstacles to spread the anti-Christian propaganda. It is therefore by no means impossible that Weishaupt was at first the agent of more experienced conspirators whose purely political aims were disguised under a plan of social reform, and who saw in the Bavarian professor a clever organizer to be employed in carrying out their designs. Whether this was so or not, the fact remains that from the time Weishaupt assumed control of the order, the plan of social reform described by Mirabeau vanishes entirely, for not a word do we find in the writings of the Illuminati about any pretended scheme for ameliorating the lot of the people and Illuminism becomes simply a scheme of anarchic philosophy. The French historian Henry Martin has thus admirably summed up the system elaborated by Spartacus. Weishaupt had made into an absolute theory the misanthropic gibes of Rousseau and the invention of property and society, and without taking into account the statement so distinctly formulated by Rousseau on the impossibility of suppressing property and society once they had been established. He proposed as the end of Illuminism the abolition of property, social authority, of nationality, and the return of the human race to the happy state in which it formed only a single family without artificial needs, without useless sciences, every father being priest and magistrate, priest of we know not what religion, for in spite of their frequent invocations of the God of nature, many indications lead us to conclude that Weishaupt had, like Diderot and de Holbach, no other god than nature herself. From his doctrine would naturally follow the German ultra-Hegelianism and the system of anarchy recently developed in France, of which the physiognomy suggests a foreign origin. This summary of the aims of the Illuminati, which absolutely corroborates the view of Beruel and Robeson, is confirmed in detail by the socialist free thinker of the 19th century, Louis Blanc who in his remarkable chapter on the revolutionaire's mystique refers to Weishaupt as one of the profoundest conspirators who have ever existed. George Sand also, socialist and in time of the Freemasons, wrote of the European conspiracy of Illuminism and the immense influence exercised by the secret societies of mystic Germany. To say, then, that Beruel and Robeson were alone in proclaiming the danger of Illuminism is simply a deliberate perversion of the truth, and it is difficult to understand why English Freemasons should have allowed themselves to be mizzled on this question. Thus, the Masonic Cyclopedia observes that the Illuminati were, as a rule, men of the strictest morality and humanity, and the ideas they sought to instill were those which have found universal acceptance in our own times. Preston, in his Illustrations of Masonry, also does his best to gloss over the faults of the order, and even the historian of Freemasonry devotes to its founder this astounding apology. After describing Weishaupt as the victim of Jesuit intrigue, Mr. Gould goes on to say, he conceived the idea of combating his foes with their own weapons and forming a society of young men, enthusiastic in the cause of humanity, who should gradually be trained to work as one man to one end destruction of evil and the enhancement of good in this world. Unfortunately, he had unconsciously imbibed that most pernicious doctrine that the end justifies the means, and this whole plan reveals the effects of this youthful teaching. The man himself was without guile, ignorant of men, knowing them only by books, a learned professor and enthusiast who took the wrong course in all innocence, and the faults of his head have been heavily visited upon his memory, in spite of the rare qualities of his heart. One can only conclude that these extraordinary exonerations of an order bitterly hostile to the true aims of masonry proceed from ignorance of the real nature of Illuminism. In order to judge of this, it is only necessary to consult the writings of the Illuminati themselves, which are contained in the following works. 
All these consist in the correspondence and papers of the order which were seized by the Bavarian government at the houses of two of the members, Zwack and Bassus, and published by the order of the elector. The authenticity of these documents has never been denied even by the Illuminati themselves. Weishaupt, in his published defense, endeavored only to explain away the most incriminating passages. The publishers, moreover, were careful to state at the beginning of the first volume, those who might have any doubts on the authenticity of this collection may present themselves at the secret archives here, where on request the original documents will be laid before them. This precaution rendered all dispute impossible. Setting Beruel and Robeson entirely aside, we shall now see from the evidence of their own writings how far the Illuminati can be regarded as a praiseworthy and cruelly maligned order. Let us begin with their attitude towards Freemasonry. Illuminism and Freemasonry From the moment of Weishaupt's admission into Freemasonry, his whole conduct was a violation of the Masonic Code. Instead of proceeding after the recognized manner by successive stages of initiation, he set himself to find out further secrets by underhand methods and then to turn them to the advantage of his own system. Thus, about a year after his initiation, he writes to Cato, Elias Zwack, I have succeeded in obtaining a profound glimpse into the secret of the Freemasons. I know their whole aim and shall impart it all at the right time in one of the highest degrees. Cato is then deputed to make further discoveries through an Italian Freemason, the Abbey Marotti, which he records triumphantly in his diary, interview with the Abbey Marotti on the question of masonry, when he explained to me the whole secret, which is founded on old religion and church history, and imparted to me all the higher degrees up to the Scottish, informed Spartacus of this. Spartacus, however, unimpressed by this communication, replied dryly, Whether you know the aim of masonry, I doubt. I have myself included an insight into the structure in my plan, but reserved it for the later degrees. Weishaupt then decides that all illuminated aeropagites shall take the first degrees of Freemasonry, but further, that we shall have a Masonic lodge of our own, that we shall regard this as our nursery garden, that to some of these Masons we shall not at once reveal that we have something more than the Masons have, that at every opportunity we shall cover ourselves with this Masonry. All those who are not suited to the work shall remain in the Masonic lodge and advance in that without knowing anything of the further system. We shall find this plan of an inner secret circle concealed within Freemasonry persisting up to our own day. Weishaupt, however, admits himself puzzled with regard to the past of Masonry and urges Porcius to find out more on this question from the Abbey Marathi. See whether through him you can discover the real history, origin, and the first founders of Masonry, for on this alone I am still undecided. But it is in Philo, the Baron von Nigge, a Freemason and member of the Strict Observance, in which he was known as the Equus Assigno, that Weishaupt finds his most efficient investigator. Thus Philo writes to Spartacus, I have now found in Castle the best man, on whom I cannot congratulate ourselves enough. He is Mauveillon, a grand master of the Royal York Lodges. So with him we have the whole lodge in our hands. He also has got from there all their miserable degrees. No wonder that Weishaupt thereupon exclaims joyfully, Philo does more than we all expected, and he is the man who alone will carry it all through. Weishaupt then occupies himself in trying to get a constitution from London, evidently without success, and also in wresting the Lodge Theodore in Munich from the control of Berlin in order to substitute his own domination so that the whole secret chapter will be subjected to our circle with a dot in the middle, leave everything to it, and await further degrees from it alone. In all this, Weishaupt shows himself not only an intriguer, but a charlatan, inventing mysteries and degrees to impose on the credulity of his followers. The mysteries, or so-called secret truths, are finest of all, he writes to Filippo Strozzi, and give me much trouble. So whilst heartily despising Freemasonry, Theosophy, Rosicrucianism, and mysticism of every kind, his association with Philo leads him to perceive the utility of all these as a bait, and he allows Philo to draw plans for a degree of Scottish knight. But the result is pitiable, 
Philo's composition, a semi-theosophical discourse and explanation of hieroglyphics, is characterized by Weishaupt as gibberish. Philo, he says again, is full of such follies which betray his small mind. On the Illuminatus Major follows the miserable degree of Scottish knight entirely of his composition, and on the degree of priest an equally miserable degree of regent. But I have already composed four more degrees compared to the worst of which the priest's degree will be child's play, but I shall tell no one about it till I see how the thing goes. The perfidity of the Illuminati with regard to the Freemasons is therefore apparent. Even Monnier, who set out to refute Beruel on the strength of the information supplied to him by the Illuminatus Bode, admits their duplicity in this respect. Weishaupt, says Monnier, made the acquaintance of a Hanoverian, the Baron von Nigy, a famous intriguer long practiced in the charlatanism of lodges of Freemasons. On his advice, new degrees were added to the old ones, and it was resolved to profit by Freemasonry whilst profoundly despising it. They decided that the degrees of Entered Apprentice, Fellow Craft, Master Mason, and Scotch Knight should be added to those of the Illuminati, and that they should boast of possessing exclusively the real secrets of the Freemasons, and affirm that Illuminism was the real primitive Freemasonry. The papers of the Order, seized in Bavaria and published, Mounier says again, show that the Illuminati employed the forms of Freemasonry, but that they considered it in itself apart from their own degrees as a puerile absurdity, and that they detested the Rose Croix. Mounier, as a good disciple of Bode, takes much the same view and pities the naivete of the Freemasons, who, like so many children, spent a great part of their time in lodges playing at chapel. Why in the face of all this should any British Masons take up the cudgels for the Illuminati and vilify Robeson and Beruel for exposing them? The American Mackey, as a consistent Freemason, shows scant sympathy for this traitor in the Masonic camp. Weishaupt, he writes, was a radical in politics and an infidel in religion, and he organized this association no more for the purpose of aggrandizing himself than of overturning Christianity and the institutions of society. And in a footnote, he adds that Robeson's proof of a conspiracy contain a very excellent exposition of the nature of this pseudo-Masonic institution. The truth is that Weishaupt was one of the greatest enemies of British Freemasonry who ever lived, and genuine Freemasons will do themselves no good by defending him or his abominable system. Let us now see how far apart from their role in Masonry the Illuminati can be regarded as noble idealists striving for the welfare of the human race. Idealism of the Illuminati The line of defense adopted by the apologists of the Illuminati is always to quote the admirable principles professed by the Order, the beautiful ideas that run through their writings, and to show what excellent people were to be found amongst them. Of course, on their face value, the Illuminati appear wholly admirable. Of course, there is nothing easier than to find innumerable passages in their writings breathing a spirit of the loftiest aspiration. And of course, many excellent men figured amongst the patrons of the order. All this is the mere stock in trade of the secret society leader as the fraudulent company promoter, to whom the first essentials are a glowing prospectus and a long list of highly respectable patrons who know nothing whatever about the inner workings of the concern. These methods, pursued as early as the ninth century by Abdullah ibn Maimun, enter largely into the policy of Frederick the Great, Voltaire and his brothers in philosophy, or in Freemasonry. The resemblances between Weishaupt's correspondence and that of Voltaire and of Frederick the Great are certainly very striking. All at moments profess respect for Christianity whilst working to destroy it. Thus, just as Voltaire in one letter to D'Alembert expresses his horror at the publication of an anti-Christian pamphlet, Le Testament de Jeanne, Meslier, and in another, urges him to have it circulated in thousands all over France, so Weishaupt is careful in general to exhibit the face of a benign philosopher and even of a Christian evangelist. It is only at moments that he drops the mask and reveals the grinning satyr behind it. 
Accordingly, in the published statutes of the Illuminati, no hint of subversive intentions will be found. Indeed, the obligation expressly states that nothing against the state, religion, or morals is undertaken. Yet, what is Weishaupt's real political theory? No other than that of modern anarchy, that man should govern himself and rulers should be gradually done away with. But he is careful to deprecate all ideas of violent revolution. The process is to be accomplished by the most peaceful methods. Let us see how gently he leads up to the final conclusion. The first stage in life of the whole human race is savagery, rough nature, in which the family is the only society, and hunger and thirst are easily satisfied, in which man enjoys the two most excellent goods, equality and liberty, to their fullest extent. In these circumstances, health was his usual condition. Happy men who were not yet enlightened enough to lose their peace of mind and to be conscious of the unhappy mainsprings and causes of our misery, love of power, envy, illness, and all the results of imagination. The manner in which man fell from his primitive state of felicity is then described. As families increased, means of subsistence began to lack. The nomadic life ceased. Property was instituted. Men established themselves firmly, and through agriculture families drew near each other. Thereby language developed, and through living together, men began to measure themselves against each other, etc. But here was the cause of the downfall of freedom. Equality vanished. Man felt new unknown needs. Thus, men became dependent like minors under the guardianship of kings. The human must attain its majority and become self-governing. Why should it be impossible that the human race should attain to its highest perfection, the capacity to guide itself? Why should anyone be eternally led who understands how to lead himself? Further, men must learn not only to be independent of kings, but of each other. Who has need of another depends on him and has resigned his rights. So to need little is the first step to freedom. Therefore, savages and the most highly enlightened are perhaps only free men. The art of more and more limiting one's needs is at the same time the art of attaining freedom. Weishaupt then goes on to show how the further evil of patriotism arose. With the origin of nations and peoples, the world ceased to be a great family, a single kingdom. The great tie of nature was torn. Nationalism took the place of human love. Now it became a virtue to magnify one's fatherland at the expense of whoever was not enclosed within its limits. Now, as a means to this narrow end, it was allowed to despise and outwit foreigners, or indeed even to insult them. This was the virtue called patriotism. And so by narrowing down affection to one's fellow citizens, the members of one's family, and even to oneself, there arose out of patriotism, localism, the family spirit, and finally egoism. Diminish patriotism, then men will learn to know each other again as such. Their dependence on each other will be lost. The bond of union will widen out. It will be seen that the whole of Weishaupt's theory was, in reality, a new rendering of the ancient secret tradition relating to the fall of man and to the loss of his primitive felicity. But whilst the ancient religions taught the hope of the Redeemer, who should restore man to his former state, Weishaupt looks to man alone for his restoration. Men, he observes, no longer loved men, but only such and such men. The word was quite lost. Thus, in Weishaupt's Masonic system, the lost word is man, and its recovery is interpreted by the idea that man should find himself again. Further on, Weishaupt goes on to show how the redemption of the human race is to be brought about. These means are secret schools of wisdom. They were from all time the archives of nature and of human rights. Through them will man be saved from his fall. Princes and nations will disappear without violence from the earth. The human race will become one family and the world the abode of reasonable men. Morality alone will bring about this change imperceptibly. Every father of a family will be, as formerly, Abraham and the patriarchs, the priest and unfettered lord of his family. And reason will be the only code of man. This is one of our greatest secrets. But whilst completely eliminating any idea of divine power outside man and framing his system on purely political lines, Weishaupt is careful not to shock the susceptibilities of his followers by any open repudiation of Christian doctrines. On the contrary, he invokes Christ at every turn and sometimes even in the language so apparently earnest and even beautiful that one is almost tempted to believe in his sincerity. Thus he writes, 
This our great and unforgettable master, Jesus of Nazareth, appeared at a time in the world when it was sunk in depravity. The first followers of his teaching are not wise men, but simple, chosen from the lowest class of the people, so as to show that his teaching should be possible and comprehensible to all classes and conditions of men. He carries out this teaching by means of the most blameless life in conformity with it, and seals and confirms this with his blood and death. These laws which he shows as the way to salvation are only two, love of God and love of one's neighbor. More he asks of no one. So far, no Lutheran pastor could have expressed himself better, but one must study Weishaupt's writings as a whole to apprehend the true measure of his belief in Christ's teaching. Now, as we have already seen, the first idea was to make fire worship the religion of Illuminism. The profession of Christianity, therefore, appears to have been an afterthought. Evidently, Weishaupt discovered, as others have done, that Christianity lends itself more readily to subversive ideas than any other religion. And in the passages which follow, we find him adopting the old ruse of representing Christ as a communist and as a secret society adept. Thus, he goes on to explain that if Jesus preaches contempt of riches, he wishes to teach us the reasonable use of them and prepare for the community of goods introduced by him. And in which, Weishaupt adds later, he lived with his disciples, but this secret doctrine is only to be apprehended by initiates. No one has so cleverly concealed the high meaning of his teaching, and no one finally has so surely and easily directed men on the path of freedom as our great master, Jesus of Nazareth. The secret meaning and natural consequence of his teaching he hid completely, for Jesus had a secret doctrine, as we see in more than one place of the scriptures. Weishaupt thus contrives to give a purely political interpretation to Christ's teaching. The secret preserved through the discipline of Marcani, and the aim appearing through all his words and deeds, is to give back to men their original liberty and equality. Now one can understand how far Jesus was the Redeemer and Savior of the world. The mission of Christ was therefore by means of reason to make men capable of freedom. When at last reason becomes the religion of man, so will the problem be solved. Weishaupt goes on to show that Freemasonry can be interpreted in the same manner. The secret doctrine, concealed in the teaching of Christ, was handed down by initiates who hid themselves and their doctrine under the cover of Freemasonry. And in a long explanation of Masonic hieroglyphics, he indicates the analogies between the Hiramic legend and the story of Christ. I say then, Hiram is Christ. And after giving one of his reasons for this assertion, adds, Here, then, is much ground gained, although I myself cannot help laughing at this explanation. Weishaupt then proceeds to give further interpretations of his own devising to the Masonic ritual, including an imaginary translation of certain words supposed to be derived from Hebrew, and ends up by saying, One will be able to show several more resemblances between Hiram and the life and death of Christ, or drag them in by the hair. So much for Weishaupt's respect for the grand legend of Freemasonry. In this manner, Weishaupt demonstrates that Freemasonry is hidden Christianity, at least my explanations of the hieroglyphics fits this perfectly, and in the way in which I explain Christianity, no one needs be ashamed to be a Christian, for I leave the name and substitute for it reason. But this is, of course, only the secret of what Weishaupt calls real Freemasonry, in contradistinction to the official kind, which he regards as totally unimportant.